In the next few videos, I want to introduce you to Julia DB, the database structure inside of Julia. You might have been using data frames before, but you have an alternative here in Julia DB. Here we have the web website, it is juliadb.org, and you can read a little bit about this uh, new data structure inside of Julia. As it says here on the website, batteries included, you can really import CSV files, create your own data, work with that data, very easily join databases, uh, any th many of the things that you would really expect of, of a database structure. So I've created a new Julia notebook here. It's a Jupyter notebook and you see I'm using Julia 0.6.2. I'm going to click on title. Let's call this Julia DB and rename and it is now saved. Uh, noting that I am saving this notebook in the very same folder as which I have my CSV files and in later videos we're going to get to that. First of all, let's create, change this first cell into just markdown. It's very easy to do escape M enter or return and now suddenly it's a markdown cell. I'm going to use markdown one hashtag or pound sign for uh, H1 HTML type heading and let's just type Julia DB. And I'm going to hold down shift and enter, shift return, depending on whether you're on a, a, a PC or Linux machine or on a Mac. Now let's import some packages that we are going to use in this video series. I'm going to say using. And of course, the first one is Julia DB. Now I'm trusting uh, the fact that uh, the three packages that I'm going to use that you have installed them with a pkg.add inside of just a REPL inside of Julia. So I'm assuming that you have added these packages. So it's Julia DB distributions. And the last one we're going to use is online stats. So if you haven't added these, please go into your REPL and do pkg.add. Don't do it inside of a notebook. I'm going to hold down shift and enter or shift and return. And there we go. All three of my packages have been imported, ready to go. Now the first function inside of Julia DB that I want to show you is the table function. We can create tables as you would expect in a normal database. I'm going to hit escape M enter or return again. Now it is a markdown cell. Let's do a size two heading and I'm just going to say the table and I'm going to just put this little, it's on the top left hand side of my keyboard, a little apostrophe there. And I'm going to say the table, open and close parentheses, hit that little apostrophe again, the table function. And when I hit shift enter, shift return, you can see by doing that inside of your markdown, it looks like code that you've actually written. So if you do these markdown cells, you can make it appear like code if you use those, those little uh, marks. So the table function. There's a few ways in which you can create a table. I'm just going to do it manually before eventually we just import a CSV file. So let's make some computer variables to hold the list objects. I'm going to call my first one ID and I'm just going to use the collect function. Collect function, open close parentheses. And what I want to do is collect values 1 through 10. So that's just going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in a list. Semicolon to suppress the output to the screen. And I'm going to do an age and let's just round these off. And, and the way to do that, I'm going to use the round function. Do I really need to? Because I'm going to use uh, integers. So I've got to put the dot. That means every single element in a list, uh, that function is applied to each of them. Let's make them integers, eight, uh, eight bit integers at least. And I want a random set of normal values and I'm going to do 50 comma 20. So that's a normal distribution with a mean of 50, a standard deviation of 20. I want that taken at random from a normal distribution and I want 10, 10 of those please. Again, I'll hit the semicolon to suppress output to the screen. So what have I done here with this round dot function? So the rand normal 50 comma 20, the mean of 50 and the standard deviation of 20, that's going to give me a set of real values, 10 of them as I specified here. But I want to round them, those off to 8-bit integers. And um, so I'm going to specify the integer 8 here as my type. 
and the round dot, as I said, the dot notation means I'm going to round them off uh, each one of the elements. So I've got to put that dot there. Shift enter, shift return, and I've got my two, I have my two uh, lists there. Let's just make sure perhaps what their length are, just to show you that indeed they are. You know, there are 10 of them. So let's look at ID, the length of ID. Let's look at the length of age, my age variable there. And I see 10 and 10, 10 in each. Let me just show you what the type, the data type of these are. So I'm going to say type, um, uh, type of, and we're going to look at ID and comma. Let's do type of age. Let's have a look at that. We see, as we expect with the collect function, it's a six, the, uh, a 64 bit integers and an array, one dimensional, and an array of 8 bit integers for the age variable. Now, here comes the magic. I'm going to create a table. Let's call our table table underscore one. So, our first table. And I'm going to use the table function. Table function, open close parentheses. Now, the first, first uh, method of doing this is just to list just to create uh, arguments. So this is just arguments of all these lists that I want uh, to add to my table. So I'm going to do ID and age. And then I'm going to use the names keyword, the names keyword argument and names. And that goes inside of square brackets. And we're going to use symbol notation. And that will give us column names, column headers. So I'm going to use symbol notation, which means a colon ID, comma, and colon age. Oh, let's do that age. And there we go. We've created table one. And look at this. It says a table with 10 rows and two columns. I have as age, the 10 integers I ha have uh, there and uh, the idea at least in the age, the 10 random integers that I have. And we've created these column headers called ID and age. Those are the names that I passed with the names keyword argument here. And we'll just see these list of arguments to start off with. Those would just be these random lists that I'm importing, or at least those random values that I'm importing. So that would be one way to create an easy way to create a table. Now let's just extract one of the rows. And the indexing works exactly as you would expect in Julia. Julia DB was created with Julia. So there's, there's going to be nothing, uh, nothing uh, different there. So let's say we take subject number three. I'm going to call that subject underscore three. And with that, we're just going to use table one. Table one. Uh, we've spelled table in a very weird way there. Let's let's correct that. That looks just a bit awkward. Let's do that. Table one. I'm going to recreate table one. There we go. So that when we have table one here, at least it doesn't look too bad. Table one. And we are just going to use the square brackets for ind indexing. And now I have subject three and we can see the subject three had two variables ID and age and the ID was three and the age was 39 in my instance, at least. This means I can extract if uh, extract some information. So I could say subject three dot and with a dot notation, I can refer to one of the column headers. So just look at the age. So subject three dot age, and it'll give me back 39. So imagine I had multiple, multiple columns. It's easy to get back the value of any one specific subject in that table or row, at least in, in that table. As far as indexing is concerned, I can very easily just say table one. Let's do let's do three, two, five. And remember, those are going to be the rows. So I see row three, four and five inclusive of three and five. So uh, what if we don't want three to five, but we just want three specific rows back. So let's do table one, table underscore one and a list of the rows that I want back. So I've got to use another set of square brackets and I want rows three, five and eight. And now I see I'm going to see ID 3, 5 and 8 there because that was row 3, 5 and 8. I'm just going to copy and paste from my second screen here, table 2 that I've created. Let's have a look at that. Table 2. And table 2 was generated slightly differently in a number of ways. So instead of creating the lists first, I'm just creating them 
one after the other as arguments separated by commas. So collect 1 to 10 again, so there'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10. The second is a list of characters here, which is just Roman numerals. Strings then, if you want, inside of quotation marks, so you see them there. Then I'm going to take again, I'm going to take 10 random variables from a normal distribution with a mean of 16 standard deviation of 4. And I'm doing round dot again because I want to round each of these. And this time I'm specifying that I want it to have one decimal place. Second set of normal distribution uh, data point values with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 3. And for my names argument here, I'm going to list the column headers uh, in symbol notation as ID, group, HB, and WCC. And this time I'm introducing something new, a primary key. And I'm just identifying a single primary key. Because remember, I can create tables. And if I have normalization, there could be another key with another, another table with another set of variables, but with the same ID. So later on, when we join these, we can join them uh, or do searches according to the primary key across multiple tables. And that's what we want. So there we go. We have table. 2 here. We see the ID 1 through 10. We see uh, Roman numerals there for group. HB, we see, see, note that there's just one decimal place and one decimal place. So we see uh, columns uh, 3 and 4, there's HB and WCC. So that's a nice table. Let me show you another way just to create a table. So the first and the second was basically the same, but instead of you know, just importing already created list, I can create the list inside of that. But the second example at least showed you how to, to specify one of the columns as a primary key, and you can specify more than one. So here we have, let's create table three, and again a table. And I'm going to use the columns function, the columns function in this instance. And with a columns function, I'm just going to use the names of the columns, and that is not symbol notation. So I'm going to say ID equals the ID list that we created before. Let's create a second one called CRP. And the CRP, I'm going to do the round function again. So I've got to do the dot notation because I want it to be rounded. Each one of these I want it rounded. And I'm going to round to 16 bit integers, 16 bit integers, and I want a random values from a normal distribution from a normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20. And I want 10 of these. I'm going to move along because I also want to specify a primary key. And this time I have to use the ID symbol. And there we go, a new table. And I've used, this time I've used the columns function as, as a, one of the arguments for the table function. And when I do these, I use, I, I use the name of the column, not in symbol notation, just purely the names that you want the column to be specified and then equal to the list that you want it to be outside of the columns function. That's where the closing um, parentheses are. Outside of that, I'd specify a primary key. So in short, that's some ways to create tables inside of JuliaDB. In the next video, we're going to start looking at proper ways of selecting some of the rows inside of our table. In this video on Julia DB, I want to show you how to make certain selections. So we are in our next cell here. We see that it is green on the side. I'm going to hit escape. It turns blue, as you can see there. M to change it into markdown and enter or return just to bring it back into editing mode. It's green, so I can type in there. I'm going to make two pound signs and write selections. Shift enter, shift return, and we have a beautiful heading there. So let's just remind ourselves of what is in table two. We created these tables, table underscore two, shift enter. We see that it is a table with 10 rows and four columns. We see ID here in bold face. That was our primary key, one through 10. We see group, which contains a categorical variable. And we note that the sample space seems to be these Roman numerals one, two, and three. We see HB and WCC, and those are two floating point or numerical uh, data, uh, data points. 
Now, let's just imagine that we want to create a new table, a subtable, and we only want to include cases, so those would be the rows, in which the group has a value of Roman numeral 1. How would we go about that? Well, let's create a name, first of all, a computer variable that can hold our new table object. I'm going to call it group underscore 1, a Roman numeral 1, because uh, that's just descriptive. It will help us all remember or when you give this file to someone else, this notebook to someone else. It's quite obvious what we try to achieve here. And what we're going to use is the filter function. Filter, open close parentheses, and the filter uh, function is going to take two arguments. The first argument is the recipe by which we want to filter. And the second argument is the object on which we want that filtering to take place. So the second part is actually quite easy. Let's do that. And that's just going to be on table 2. Table 2 is, is, is the object on which we want the filtering to be done. But now we've got to uh, use a way in Julia of actually building that recipe, doing that filtering. And what we're going to use is called an anonymous function. Let's use uh, just a placeholder, P, it's, it's just a placeholder, you can uh, choose uh, any letter that you want. I'm going to say P.group, or let's just say P. P is, is going to be uh, part of our anonymous functions, and we're going to do this minus and greater than sign. Minus and greater than sign, and we're going to say P.group, P.group equals equals 1. So this is an anonymous function. It takes this placeholder P, which is going to refer to our table 2. It's going to look down the group column, and it's only going to, it's going to evaluate true or false. And when it evaluates true, it is going to put that inside of our new table object. So that is an anonymous function. Let's run that. And indeed, we see we have a new table with four rows. And we see 1, 2, 3, 4. There were indeed four instances where the group value was this Roman numeral 1. And we see there with the four columns, so we still have all the columns there, but we've created a new table. Let's just have a look. Type of, let's, let's do group 1, group 1, let's do that. And we see it's an index tables, next tables, and all the information about this subtable that we've created. Now, Let's just try that again, and let's create two other groups. We'll create group two, and again, it'll be filter very easily. We'll do uh, the same kind of anonymous function. You can use p again. It, uh, it doesn't matter. And you're going to say p.group equals equals two in this time, and remember the object on which we want this filtering to take place, and we have group two once again. And just for completion's sake, let's very quickly do three. And that is going to be filter. And again, we're going to use our anonymous function, p.group. And we have one, two, three. And the object on which we want this to take place, table two. And we have group three. So that will be quite easy to do just for these categorical variables. But what about a numerical variable? Let's create a a new computer variable to hold our, our sub table object. I'm going to call it high WCC. And I'm going to use the filter function again very easily, again with my anonymous function. So I'm going to say p uh, such that let's say p.wcc is greater than 12. Again, including the object on which I want this filtering to take place. And now if we look down the WCC, we'll see that all the values here are greater than 12. So there you go, selections. It's very easy to make subtables just based on these recipes that you can create through anonymous functions and the filter function. In this video, I want to show you how to do reductions. Now, you might not uh, use that word very often when you deal with uh, tables or you deal with the data analysis, but reductions. Let me show you what this is, this is all about. I'm going to hit escape in this cell. It'll turn blue. I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut M to change it into a markdown cell. Enter or return just to get it back to green. Two of those little pound signs, hash signs. Let's do reductions. 
shift enter shift return let's go let's just remind ourselves of what table two was all about table two that's better and we remembered the primary key id group hp wcc and what if i wanted to know what the sum total of all the values say for instance in this last column was wcc i want to know if i were to add all of these it might be easy if there were just a few but if there were thousands and thousands of rows that'd be a bit difficult so let's use the reduce function reduce open close parentheses the first argument is what we want to do i want to add all of these and remember these operators such as plus they are actually functions inside of julia they're really first class citizens so i can just use the plus sign there it just says add all of the values and i'm going to reference table 2 as the object in which i want all of this to occur and then i'm going to use the select keyword argument select and what i want to select is this wcc column and i'm using the symbol notation in other words colon wcc for that column name shift and enter shift return and it adds up for me all the values there inside of uh, this wcc column it's going to just add all of them and give me the result there that's uh, that's uh, quite easy to do uh, let's do something uh, slightly more useful what if i wanted to look down that column and imagine again it's hundreds and hundreds of rows thousands of rows i want to know what the minimum and what the maximum value is reduce once again so this time i want two things to happen so i'm going to put them for this reduce function inside of its own set of parentheses and i'm just going to use the min and max functions there once again i'm going to say look at table two for me please table two and select select equals symbol notation wcc shift enter shift return and it really neatly finds it for me it says the minimum value was 8.8 .8 and the maximum value was 16.6 .6. now let's ramp this up a bit and make this really useful remember we imported online stats the online stats package now that has nothing to do with being online it's just online stats we'll have a look at it a bit later so i'm going to say reduce and what i want here uh, and again i'm going to put those inside of its own set of parentheses i want the mean and that is a function so i'm just going to use the open and close parentheses there and i want the variance open and close parentheses and once again i want this to be on the object in table two the computer variable table two and i'm going to select once again the white cell count wcc shift enter shift return and now the online stats package kicks in gives me this very nice output here and i haven't done anything specifically so it's giving me equal weights to each of these elements inside of my list so and it also says number of observations 10 there were indeed 10 observations in each of in, in the wcc column so i see a mean of 12.76 and i see a variance of 7.08 remember that's the square of the standard deviation so very easy just to get out a bit of information by using the reduce function in this video i want to show you how to do groupings and we're going to use the group reduce function in the previous video we reduced some of the columns and that reduction allowed us to look at the minimum and maximum value along a column to express the mean or variance of that to sum all of the values so a lot of statistical tests we can do on a column but what if we want to group first according to some other variable and then do a reduction so i'm going to hit escape m enter or return and two pound signs and i'm going to type in grouping because this is going to be uh, all about grouping so we're going to use this group reduce let's type that in group reduce and it's a function 
And we, what we want, for instance, let's look at table two again. We know what table two is all about. And what if we want to calculate the mean of the HB column? And if we go down that HB column, we don't want the mean of the whole column. We want the mean calculated separately for each of the unique values found in the group. Now remember group had Roman numerals 1, 2, and 3 as the sample space of that categorical variable. So if I want all the 1s together and their HB mean, all the 2s together and their HB mean, and all the 3s together and their HB mean. So let's try and do that. Again, uh, we have loaded the online stats, so I can just use mean. I'm going to say, please do this on table 2. So let's select table 2. I want the group. I want the want this to be categorized by the group column and the select again that is what I want this mean to be calculated on and let's make that the HB column and there we go we see in the group column we found values 1 2 and 3 and we'll separately do the HB, the mean of the HB of each of these. So the mean in group 1 was 14, and mean in group 2 was 10, and mean in group 3 was 13. So you can do that individually. Let's try that one more time, and let's just look at the variance for these. So it's group reduced once again. I want the variance, variance. Remember, after that comes the object, which is table 2. And then comes the column by which we want to group. I'm using symbol notation, hence the colon. And then what I want this variance to be calculated on uh, exactly, and that is HB. And there we again, we see 1, 2, and 3, and the variance for each of these. Very easy to do. Now, I need not stick to the, to the variance and mean. I can use any of the inbuilt Julia functions. And for that, though, I'm not going to use the group reduce uh, uh, I'm going to use the group by now have a look at this so not only is the group uh, reduced but group by and what I want to do here is just list a bunch of functions inside of inside of Julia so I'm going to say the mean I'm going to say the median for instance I'm going to say the standard deviation which is this STD var for the variance and let's do the the quartiles that's going to be the minimum, the first, the second quartile. Remember, the second quartile is the median, third quartile, and the maximum. So all of them, we can uh, get to all of them by using the quantile function. Quantile, as you can see there. Then once again, I want this to be done on the table 2 object. I want it all to be done by whatever groups, or whatever unique values are found in the group. And what I want all of this to be calculated on is the HB. It'll take a second or two, and there we go. Look at all that beautiful descriptive statistics of our table in one go. We see the group had unique elements 1, 2, and 3, the Roman numerals that made up the sample space of the group variable. And we see for HB, we have a mean, a median, a standard deviation, its square, which is the variance, and there's the minimum, first quartile, median. You see 13.7 there, and 13.7 there, that's the same, that's the median third quartile and maximum value there. A single line of code gives me all of the descriptive statistics grouped by one of the categorical variables. And that is really, really useful to do if you get data into a table very quickly for you. To, very quickly, uh, you can come up with the descriptive statistics. Really, really powerful stuff. Now that we've seen how to do simple descriptive statistics, how easy it is just to, to do some grouping, I want to show you how to join different tables. We've just been working with a single table, but what if we want to join them? So in our new cell, escape M, enter or return, two pound signs. There we go. Two pound signs, and I'm going to say joining. So we're going to join two tables together. First of all, let's create two tables to join, and just to make it very, uh, very illustrative. Let's create two tables. I'm going to call the one left table and the other one right table, as I say, just, just for, for, for clear demonstration purposes. So my left table is going to be a table. I've already done all my importing, so I'm just carrying on. 
I'm going to have uh, the ID column that uh, that we created, that computer variable that, that uh, contained the list object that we created, ID and age, and the names are going to be, I'm going to use symbol notation, ID, and let's do age. There we go. And I'm just going to set a primary key. I've got to set my primary key, and my primary key is going to be the ID column. And let's have a look at what this left table would look like. There we go. We see the 10 rows. The ID was 1 through 10, and the, we see the ages there that were created, and we see ID there is in bold, the, the column name, the variable name, and that is our primary key. So let's create the right table. And the right table, let's just go through a few things. I'm going to use table, table function. Let's make uh, use the collect function, this time from 1 to 15. And the second one, let's round off. So it's round dot each of the element. I want it to be rounded to 16-bit integers. And what I want rounded is, what I want rounded here is random values from a normal distribution with a mean of 100, standard deviation of 20, and I want 15, 15 of these. And then I want the names to be, I want the names to be ID. Let's make that ID, and let's make that one CRP. And primary key, the primary key, very important, that has to be ID. There we go, we see ID 1 through 15, and we see these integers taken from a normal distribution. So let's have a look what happens when I join these. I'm going to use the join function, and I'm going to say left table, which is my first argument, left table, and then right table. Let's see what happens, table. And there we go. We note that what was in the left table, which was just 1 through 10, is the only ones included in this, in doing this, uh, this way around, stating left first and then right. Let's just contrast that to joining up the right table and the left table. Right table and left table. And now what's going to happen, we see again the 1 through 10, and we see just CRP is listed before age, but it's the same, uh, same subjects in each of these two that are combined. So the default is just that it would look for rows which it is com uh, which are comparable by the primary key, which is ID, and in which values exist in both of these tables. So in 11 through 15, there were no there were no uh, values in the in the in the column up here. If we look at this, it just had age from one to ten. So there's no age. There's no 11 through 15 with ages in in the left table. So they will not be included there. It's only where you have values for both. When you have values for both. Now let's have a look if we do what is called a left join, which is actually what has happened. So if we do join and we say left table, join, we say left table, and we say right table, and we specify now how the join should happen. So we're going to say how equals a left join. And we use symbol notation there, and we see exactly the same thing. So it looked at the left table, and it would only draw things in into this combination based on what is inside of the left table. Now have a look if we what if we do an outer join. So I'm going to say join again, join, and we are going to have left table, left table, and we're going to have right table, and now the how is going to equal outer. An outer join means it's going to do combine both of these, even if no values exist on either side. So if we look at 11 through 15, there were no age values for those. 
So it's just going to put in an NA and not a number, an NA value, missing value in these, and that would be an outer join. So there's one more join I want to show you, and that is the anti. So I'm going to say join again. We're just going to join. But look at this. I'm going to say right table first. So right table comes first, then left table. And then I'm going to say how equals, and I remember my colon, anti. And now what's going to happen, it's going to take whatever was not there. So it takes the right table first, whatever you list first. It then looks at the left table and see whatever is not combined. What I cannot combine, I'll put those together. If I put left table first and then right table, there'd be nothing. It would be an empty set. There would be no rows whatsoever, only my two columns and no rows. So play around with these with the joins and move left and right around and clearly see what happens when you when you do play around when you do move them and you do use different joins until you become used to how to join these tables. And that is what makes Julia DB so powerful to join different tables based on your primary keys. So in this video, I want to show you just how to load a CSV file. So I'm going to say escape m enter return. Let's say loading dot CSV file. And right at the beginning, just two pound signs, make it a heading two. loading a CSV file. Now, very important that the notebook that I'm using here and the CSV file, the comma, comma separated values, spreadsheet files, they are in the same folder. If they were not, I would have to refer to the whole address of that file on my hard drive. So I'm going to say DB, that is going to be my computer variable that is going to hold this table. And I'm going to use the load table, load table function, load table. And in, in inverted commas, in quotation mark, marks, I'm going to say data.csv. Uh, that is the name of my CSV file. Let's have a look at it. And there you see it's a table with 200 rows and nine columns. Again, just as before, this is now a table object. And let's just go for some dis uh, descriptive statistics. Let's go for that on the HR column. And we're going to group by the histo column. Let's try that. So I'm going to say group by. And let's group by. Let's make a, a list here. I'm going to say the mean, the median, the standard deviation, the variance. And let's go for the quantiles. Quantile. There we go. And what object do I want? The DB object the computer variable i want it to be grouped by the histo column whatever the unique values are in that categorical variable and i my selection is what i want all of these descriptive statistics to be done on is in the hr column there we go we see in histo it found two entries a zero and a one and we see for hr in zero and for hr in one we see all these descriptive statistics beautifully, beautifully done. Let's try one of the filter commands. Remember how that works? Filter function. So I'm going to filter and let's create our anonymous function. Again, just using P, you can use whatever you want, P. And I want that to be in the histo column. And I want to say when that equals zero. So again, it's a Boolean question. It's going to return all the true values. And please look in the DB object. And if we filter and if we look down, if we do look down the histo column, we'll see that it's all just the zeros. It will only select the zeros that are in there. So that is how you import a CSV file. Keep it to a CSV file. If you're working in a spreadsheet, save it as a, uh, a DOS a disk operating system a CSV file. And you can just import it with a load table. It'll do uh, automatically look for column headers in the first row that you have. And then it is just a table object and you can work on it as we have done before.
So in this video, I want to show you a little bit about gradient descent. We're going to use a very simple model called linear regression. So we're just going to have this single feature variable, and we're going to predict a, a continuous numerical variable. And gradient descent is really it's at the heart of all um, our, our supervised learning, at least deep learning models. So we're living in this era of the functional approach to AI, where we can write a function that we're trying to minimize. And that function is all about the difference between what our model predicts and what the actual value is. If we can express that difference between the prediction and the actual value um, in, a, in a function, uh, as with functions, we can get the minimum of that function. Think of y equals x squared. We all know that right down at the bottom where x equals zero, that's where the function is going to be at a minimum. And that's exactly how we learn. We're going to have these parameters, the unknowns, the variables, and we're going to have them in multidimensional space, and we're just trying to minimize that. And that is what gradient descent is all about. And think about standing somewhere in a valley and you're looking down, you want to get right down to the bottom of the valley, you can't just walk straight down, you've got to zigzag your way a little bit down. And that's exactly what it is if you think about it. If we have a multi, if we have a, a, a multi-valued function, a multi-variable function, of course that's going to be in hyperspace. We can't uh, imagine that, we can only imagine three-dimensional space, but imagine that multi-dimensional space, we are just going to zigzag our way down to the minimum. And at that minimum, for each of the values, for each of our variable values, our unknowns, our parameters, we're going to have values for which um, we have the minimum of this penalty, this cost function, the difference between the actual and the predicted value. And that is really at the heart of it. And if we do linear regression, of course, we can write a very simple uh, uh, gradient descent. So I'm going to show you how to do that in Julia. But I'm also going to put some pen to the screen on my tablet, and I'm just going to show you uh, the basics of the algebra and the and the uh, calculus behind the partial derivatives. I'm not going to teach you about um, how to do partial derivatives or do matrix vector uh, multiplication. I'm going to assume that you know how to do that. If not, put something down in the comment and I'll make a, a video because it's, very, it's, it's just a couple of simple things that you need to know about linear algebra and about um, uh, matrix multiplication, matrix vector multiplication. And it should all make sense. So I'm trusting that you do know that. If not, let, let me know in a comment. But I'm going to assume that you do, and I'm just going to show you how we go from the code to what's actually happening behind the scenes, um, and from what's happening behind the scenes back to the code. So they just understand it's not just a code, a function, or two functions that we write, and you don't understand where they come from. I want you to know really where it comes from. And that's going to make the code so much easier to understand, that makes gradient descent so much easier to understand. And uh, that will just help you along as you start developing um, your knowledge of deep learning, because that's what we're going to do in supervised learning. We're going to do, we are just going to do gradient descent. So let me open up a Jupyter notebook, and we're going to use Julia just to, uh, to make life uh, easy for ourselves. Let's have a look. I've opened a Jupyter notebook here using iJulia, and then just the notebook function inside of the REPL and we have our Julia kernel running here inside of Jupyter inside of a Jupyter notebook. You see I'm running Julia 1.4.0 up in the top right corner and uh, let's see what the libraries are that we're going to use. So I'm using GLM, that's Generalized Linear Models, Statistics, Data Frames, Random and Plots and I'm using the Plotly backend. So make sure that you've installed all of this uh, through the REPL. So just a few short notes then. What is linear regression? Well, it's a type of modeling. It's all about continuous numerical variables. And we're going to have a feature set of variables. We call them feature variables or independent variables. And then we're going to have a target variable or a dependent variable. And then for each sample, so that would be a row in a spreadsheet, we're going to use the values in that row for that one specific sample, and it's got to predict as close as possible to the value that's in the target variable, or the dependent variable then. And if we have as many as is possible samples, we can run through all of them, and we can use those feature variables to predict each and every one of the target variables. So... It's a continuous numerical variable that we're trying to predict, and that makes it a regression problem. And our, we're going to keep our independent variables, our feature variables, we're also going to keep them continuous numerical. Uh, 
And as much as in this first instance, all we're going to do is have a single feature variable. And we're going to try and predict the target variable. So I'm using random.seed here in my first, as you can see here, in my first code cell. And I'm setting that to 1. And if you set it to 1, we're going to get the same random values selected. And I'm going to have this computer variable that I'm going to call uppercase X. And that's going to be a random value. Um, it's going to be 16, but a floating point, and I want 50 of them. So 50 random values between 0 and 1. And then for the target variable, I'm going to call that under uh, lowercase y. Um, I'm just going to add a bit of random noise uh, to a constant multiple of each of these. So I'm taking x, so that's now going to be each of those 50 values, dot multiply with 10. And that means each of them gets multiplied by 10. And then each of them, to each of them, I'm going to add a bit of random values. So on this side, I've got 50 values, so I better add 50 on this side. Strictly speaking, I didn't have to have the dot there because I'm just, it's just a scalar times an array, and that means each of them are going to be multiplied by that. But what I need to do is dot plus. That's very important because I've got another 50 values there. Uh, so that's going to be an array of 50 values, but this time it's from a normal distribution, so rand n 50 and multiply that by 2, just to get it a bit bigger. And so that's just adding a bit of random noise to the 10 times uh, the x value there. So let's run that. And now I've got some uh, values that will be my feature value in x, my feature variable in x, and my target variable in y. In case uh, that didn't make too much sense, let's have a look at visualizing the data. That always helps. I'm going to use the plot function. And I'm going to plot my array of feature variables, my array there of my target variable, and the series type is going to be scatter, so I might as well just have used the scatter function there. And I'm adding a title, and I'm adding some labels. So remember, the first time you run this, it's going to take a while. And there we go. We see we have our values between 0 and 1 for the x-axis down the bottom, and then for the y-axis, that's going to be 10 times... The value and then we're going to add just a bit of uh, random noise to that so it's not all on a straight line but you can certainly see that there is uh, some trend to this as we go up on my independent variable so does the dependent variable value go up and in any one of these and I hover over them we can see the black at the bottom for the dependent variable inside uh, the independent variable inside of x I have 0 0.58 and that gives me given that I get a dependent variable or y value of 9.27113 and you can hover over each of those we see in black what the independent or x uh, value was, uh, variable value was and then in blue at the top we're going to see what the y, the dependent variable value was. So what a model would like to do is draw a straight line from, I suppose as we can see there is this correlation and it's a positive correlation. So some line, a straight line that makes it a linear model that given any x value, I can go up to that line and that will give me what a predicted value would be, a predicted dependent variable. So you can see right here from school, you remember the equation for a straight line, that's y equals mx plus c, where m is the slope and c is the y-intercept. So if x is 0, this mx term becomes 0 and then y will just be the intercept, so y equals mx plus c. Now, we're not going to use the M and the C. We're just going to use different symbols just to confuse things because that's the way it works. For C, we're going to use this beta sub 0. And for M, we're going to use beta sub 1. So that we have this Y equals beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1X. And that's still going to be a straight line. But you can well imagine we need to know a slope and an intercept for our straight line. That would be the unknowns. How would we know what would be the best model. So what I'm going to do here is just a random guess. I'm going to make, I'm going to make beta 0, I'm going to set that equal to 0. So when x is 0, when my input variable is 0, my output variable is going to be 0. My y-intercept is going to be 0, and I'm going to make my beta sub 1, my slope, 10. Now I chose that because that's how we designed it up here when we started, so my guess wasn't going to be too bad. 
So that's what I'm trying to plot here. So I'm using plot with the bang there, the exclamation mark, which means it's going to plot on top of a plot that's already in memory. And I'm going to use just uh, some values that I want to collect from 0 to uh, 1 in uh, steps of 0.01 so that we can get this sort of straight line going. And if we were to plot this, there we go, there's my model. Now you can understand that I have this red line as my model. And my model is y equals 0 plus 10x. So beta zero, beta sub 0 is 0 and beta sub 1 is, is 10. And that gives me this line, which means given any input value here on the x-axis, if you go up where it meets the red line, say there, there, if I just hover just right, I get a little red one. The model is going to be 3.8. So for 0.38, of course it's 3.8 because it's just 10 times. But that means if I get new data, I've got a nice model now, if I get new data, uh, you just give me the input variable and I can predict the target variable for you. It's not going to be terribly accurate because here and amongst the real data that we have, we see close to here, it's 0.59 is, is 5.9, but a real value would actually be 6.67. So it makes a little mistake. And if I draw vertical lines between the each of these data points down or up to the red line, those are going to be errors, the errors that we make. And uh, we can well imagine what would be the best possible line that we can draw here. So I need the best possible beta sub zero. And you can see mine is the zero here. When x is zero, the y-intercept is also zero. And, what could, and for beta sub one, what could be the best possible ones so that I make the least amount of errors and you can see now the error is that between which the red line predicts for that x value and what the actual value was so we're trying to minimize this and that's what machine learning or deep learning is all about it's we've gone in artificial intelligence through various ages and we're now at the functional age of artificial intelligence where we create a function and that function we call a, a cost function. And we're trying to minimize that cost function. And we're very fortunate that we can do it. And I'll show you just exactly how that works, why we are so fortunate, why this functional age of AI is working so well. But just to remind you here, yeah, right at the bottom, you see I have a y hat here because y was my vector of target variable values. And, but that's going to be slightly different from the ones that my model predict. So I'm going to call that y hat. That's a very common thing to do. And y hat is going to be beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 times x. And x is going to be either a matrix, or in this instance it's still a vector because I only have one feature variable. If I multiply beta sub 1 with that, beta sub 1 is 10. And it can just be a scalar, but if I wanted to add a vector to that, I've got a bit of a problem with beta sub zero, and we'll see how we fix that. So beta sub zero must actually be a vector of zeros of the same length as x, but we'll see how to deal with that. So just below that, you see y hat sub i. So for any, any y hat I can predict, that's any of the samples in my spreadsheet, say for instance, I just take that xi, that same in that same row, I take its x value and I multiply it by 10 and I add 0 and that's going to give me a predicted value. So let's see how, it, how well it does. So for x sub 1, if I execute x1 uh, in square brackets, so we're just using indexing, the first of my 50 values was a 16-bit float and it was 0.166. And let's see what the actual value was. The actual value was 2.616. That was the actual value. Now and then to get the predicted, remember it's just 10 times that x sub 1, that x, that first x value, and that gives me 1.699, and that's quite a bit different from the actual 2.61. So I made a bit of an error, and you see the error symbol there, just epsilon, and what we, the term that we usually use is the residual. Uh, specifically in linear algebra, we talk about the residual, but in deep learning, we'll just say that that's, that's the error. So the error is just going to be um, my uh, actual value minus the predicted value, or you could do it the other way around as well, and it doesn't really matter because in the end we're going to square those differences. 
But you see, to get the real Y sub I, you have to add that specific error term, the residual, in each and one of the cases. So uh, let's do all 50 of them. So I'm going to store that in a computer variable called Y underscore pred, 10 times X, so it's a scalar times. That's why I don't have to put dot multiply as I did before. You can just say scalar times that vector, and that's going to broadcast it to every value in the vector. And my residuals is then going to be the actual ones minus the predicted ones. So let's just run that. So that's stored now. And that difference, y minus uh, y pred, so the difference between each one of those, so it's a vector minus a vector, so it's going to be element y subtraction. And uh, those are, that's now going to be a vector that res reads. Is it going to be a vector of all my residuals? So let's have a look at what they look like, and that's, this is going to be actually quite important when we talk about um, using parametric tests, etc. But at the moment you can see I have this kind of normal distribution uh, to my residuals. Uh, a better way to do that is rather let's just do uh, a scatter plot. Let me show you what that looks like. And what we have to remember is that there's the zero line right down the middle, all the dots that fall on that zero line or close to the zero line means there's very little residual. So very, it was very close, the prediction and the actual value was very close to each other. And uh, some were quite far away. And if our model is the best possible, then these residuals will be as close to the zero line as is possible. So you've got to imagine that there's a line between everyone straight down to the zero line or from this bottom one straight up to the zero line. Those are all my residuals. That brings us to this idea of a loss function. So somehow I've got to quantify how bad my predictions were. And to do that, we have a loss function. And we have the same thing in deep learning, that there is some difference between my vector of predictions and my vector of, of actual values. And because this is the functional age of AI, I can create a function to, to um, express the difference between those two vectors. And in linear algebra, one of the common ones that we're going to use is the mean squared error, MSE. And that just means I square the dif all those differences, all those residuals. So yeah, you see I've done it this way around, so it's predicted minus actual. So we take the first sample, the first row in our spreadsheet that contains the data, or in this instance our two, our two vectors. But anyway, I subtract them from each other and then square. So it doesn't really matter in which order I subtract them, I square them. And then I add all of those and I divide by how many they are. And that gives me a mean. A mean is you just add everything and divide by how many there are. And that's the mean squared error. The name says it all. And that little symbol there means from 1 to m. m is the number of cases I have, the number of subjects, my sample size. And in our instance, that's 50. But let's just be clear as to how we got to this y hat. So if we were to expand this little summation uh, um, expression here on the right hand side remember this is what it really is every single one of these y hat sub i's is beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub 1 minus y sub 1 squared that is how I get each and every one of these uh, the beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub 1 and then minus the y sub i on that side, so there's my first example, there's my second sample, there's a third sample, there's that, and I'm going to go on until M, and in our instance, M is 50, and I divide by. So remember, that is what happens behind the scenes, not, not this little shorty thing. That's what happens behind the scenes, is every one of that Y hat is quite a long, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a thing. So let's just have a look at the first three predicted values. Remember we had that, 1699, 693, and what the actual values were, and then what the feature, what the feature variable values were. So there we have them. So let's just see how we did all of those. So it's 1.699, that's the um, actual va the uh, predicted value, minus 2.617, that was the actual value. I square that, and I square all of those. And so it's, it's the predicted minus the actual square. Predicted minus the actual, but each of these predictions, remember, had to be calculated first. So 
there we go I've written it all out again for you to show you it's 0 plus 10 times that minus that squared so it's all of those now the 0 is something we just guessed at the moment and the 10 is something we just guessed but we don't know this to start off with specifically if we have 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 plus feature variables we're going to have a lot of these unknowns because everyone will have that x sub 1 there there'll be more of them and each of them will have to have its own beta in front of it so we're going to uh, run into problems um, we weren't just able to look at it in, as we did there in two dimensions with a single feature variable and just guess sort of where that line should be but let's create a function in Julia. It's function and then the function keyword and then I'm going to give it the name MSE. It's going to take y underscore hat and y and it's just the sum of y hat minus y dot squared, the dot, the dot power I should say. The dot power there means each one of the elements in the vector because y hat is a vector, y is a vector. It's going to broadcast, so it's element wise minus element wise, but each one of those elements I want squared, so it's dot square, and in the end I divide by how many there are, so that's just a, a code representation of my mean squared error there. So let's look at the mean squared error for my model at the moment, and we see it's 3.97. So that is the sort of the average error, the average residual that we have at the moment, and it's squared. So because uh, we, uh, we just square all of those, we don't take the square root of it. So it's mean squared error. So that's the average of the square. Now, that was just my guess. In, I'm going to move away a little bit to normal statistics now. Uh, moving away from what we're trying to achieve here is just the, for you to understand gradient descent and how to code that in Julia. Let's just go back to statistics just a little bit. The worst case model is the one where we just have mean. Now, it's not the worst case. You can draw very bad lines, which is even worse, but we're always going to compare against the base model. And in statistics, and the base model just uses the mean as your prediction. So I'm taking all my target variables here, and I'm just calculating the mean. That's 4.7. And all I'm going to do now is repeat that 50 times so that I have a vector of 50 values. They're all going to look exactly the same and let's look at what the mean squared error is if all my predictions are just the mean of my target variable. And we see that's quite high. The mean squared error now of this mean model is 12.28. That's quite a bit higher. So that means the average of the square of my residuals is quite a bit more. And we can actually compare a model that we have created uh, to the baseline model. And there is that comparison. So I'm just writing out the word comparison there. You take the mean squared error of your base model. This is the one that just uses the mean for all its predictions. It doesn't have a beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 times x. Is this the mean? And um, you subtract from that the model's uh, MSE and you divide by the base. And that gives you a comparison between your model and the base. How much better is it? And uh, that comparison, as you can see here, we usually we call that R square or the coefficient of determination. And if we multiply by 100, of course, we get that as a percentage. And we can say that uh, um, our model predicts so much of the variance in our in our variable. So we see that 67. So we can say we can say that our model with a beta sub zero of zero and beta sub one of 10 explains 67.7 percent of the variance in the target variable. And that's just how we express those. That's just normal statistics. That is how we would uh, um, evaluate our model. And we wanted, of course, to explain 100% of the variance, but that would be an R squared value of 1. That's the highest it can go. And, of course, 0 is the lowest that it can go. That's a very bad, your model's then very bad. It's just the same exactly as the base model then. So there we go. That's just a little bit of statistics. Back to this idea of gradient descent, this functional age of AI. And remember I said we can express how bad we are with a function. Now let's create a, a very easy function to work with. And there we go, f of x equals x squared minus 10 times the sine of 2x plus 12. And you can see that green thing there. Now just imagine for one second that this is our cost function. Now we know it's not our real cost function because we already have two unknowns in our cost function. Remember when we expanded it uh, up here, 
We have beta sub zeros and beta sub ones in there. Those are the unknowns in my function. X sub one, that's given. I know for every sample what the X value is and the independent value is and what the Y value is. So don't get your X's and Y's confused with what we did in school algebra. The unknowns are beta sub zero and beta sub one or the Y equals MX plus C, M and the C. Those are the unknowns that I'm looking for. So imagine I don't have two of them, the M and the C. I'm only looking for one of them. And I'm, uh, um, I'm just looking for one of them. So I'm going to rewrite something in school algebra. So either the beta sub zero or the beta sub one, one of them. And imagine that my loss function looked like this. The, co uh, the, the whole loss looked like this, which means I can plot it here just as a single variable graph. And there you see the green one. And what we're trying to achieve, remember here, is we want to minimize this function. Now, just to look at it, it's very easy. We see here m is right at the bottom. That's the minimum. So whatever the value that I read off of here from the bottom, which will be either beta sub 0 or beta sub 1, whatever the case is, that will gen genuinely just be the value for that variable that will give me the lowest cost function. I should just go back and very quickly say what is the difference between loss and cost function. People use them interchangeably. Uh, this will be the loss. That y hat minus y squared, that's the loss. The difference, the squared difference between the predicted value and the actual value. But if I sum over all of them and divide it, that's my total cost. That's all the losses, all the individual losses combined. So that's the difference between a loss. A loss is where it's just an, a, a function that just looks at one sample. And if I combine all the samples together, all the losses together, that's the cost, the cost function. So right here we are with a cost function. And it's very easy to find that minimum. Of course, now just looking at it like this, I can just look at the picture and tell you it's down here by M. That is where, because on the y-axis I have cost now, and on the x-axis I have different values, possible values for my beta sub zero or beta sub one, my unknown. And... Uh, I can just look that it's there, but in reality, of course, it's not that easy. So how do we get to this point if it wasn't that easy, if we didn't have this nice graph to look at? Because we've got other problems here. We've got other local minima, which an I there, K, O, those are local minima, but the global minimum is at M. So how do we get there if we can't see this graph? Uh, well, what we do is we just start anywhere randomly, and I've started in this instance here by B. I can start anywhere, but I'm starting at B, and I'm going to use the derivative. Now, you've got to know a bit of linear algebra here, of course, as I mentioned, and you've got to know a bit of, of differentiation, of calculus. So I've just started here at B blindly, but I can imagine I'm, this is a valley, and I'm just trying to walk to the bottom of the valley. How do I get to the bottom of this valley? Well, if I stand there, I'm obviously on a slope, and I know I want to get to the bottom of this valley, so just go down the slope. As easy as that. And slope, I mean, in real life, think you're walking down in a valley. A slope is a slope. You want to walk downhill to get to the bottom. You don't walk uphill to get to the bottom. Um, well, sometimes you have to because you can see here from O, I'll have to go up to N to get down to M. But let's just imagine you just, you just want to walk downhill now. And fortunately, in calculus, we can also use the slope, which is the first derivative. So if I know what the first derivative is there at B, it slants downhill. And I can use that fact to get to a better value. So if I go from B straight down here, it'll be four point something. But I know I want to get to this one here, the zero point, say 0 0.7, somewhere there. And if this slope here, this line, if you remember from school, from calculus, that's a positive slope, so that's a positive value. That's a positive m value, or a beta sub 1 value. Uh, if I use that somehow to change this, iteratively change where I am at the moment, at the moment I'm here by about 4.1, to change that to something that's more negative. Now my slope is a positive at the moment, so if I take x to get it to a smaller value of x, I've got to subtract something from that. So let me just subtract from that the slope that, it, that I have there. And that's what we get to down here. So my x sub new is to start where my x sub old was and subtract from that df dx, that's the first derivative, 
of my cost function there with respect to x, just subtract that from that. And because that df dx at the moment where we stood here at b is positive, I'm going to have x old and I'm going to subtract from this a positive value, which means my x new is going to be slightly smaller. So I'm going to get going in the right direction. If I was way over on the other side, say up here on the far left-hand side to the left of i here, my slope would have been negative. But a negative times a negative is a positive. So using that slope, if this slope was a negative here, so a negative times a negative is positive. So if I was way out here on the negative x axis, I would have moved towards the right. So the slope is always going to help me go in the right direction. But we do add this little step size there. We don't want to move, we don't want to take a giant leap. I mean, imagine you are a big giant and you're uh, much bigger than you are now and you're just walking in this valley. You can take a huge step, but you may make it so big that you walk straight over to the other side of the valley. That's not what you want because every time you step now, you're just going to jump back and forth, back and forth. And that's a very bad thing with gradient descent. So we add this little step size. We call it the learning rate. And we usually make it quite small, maybe start at 0 0.03, so that we take itty bitty little steps because what we want to do is not overshoot the minimum. So we just always multiply that, but I think you can clearly see how we can use the first derivative, the slope, to guide us always into the right direction. Now you can see the two problems here. One we've discussed, you're going to end up in this local minimum, not the global minimum, and that is a problem in gradient descent and deep learning. And there's all sorts of extra things we can do, regular, regularization, etc., to help us out with that. In practice, though, it's not the worst thing in as much as we don't want a perfect model. We never want our model to, to memorize our training data. We want it to generalize to unseen data. So it's not as big a problem as you might imagine, but still um, some models can be severely affected by ending continuously ending up in a local minima instead of a global minima. Just for now, remember, it's not the worst thing. And that's all we do, but now you're going to tell me, well, we don't just have one we don't just have one unknown, we have two unknowns in this instance, a beta sub zero and a beta sub one, which we have to find the best value of in our cost function. So here we have very simple x squared plus y squared. That's what I did to create this little bowl here. And it's now in three dimensional space because I have two variables, not just one anymore. But fortunately we have partial derivatives. I hope you can remember what partial derivatives are. So here we go with partial derivatives. And you can see that if I keep one of my two variables constant, and that represents either this pink or the green one, if I keep one of them constant, it cuts through my shape. And you can see here this black line that comes down and becomes dotted on this side. That's where this green is intersecting my cost function. And there I just have a nice parabola again. Or this red one is intersecting here in the front. And that's just a parabola. So I can look at them individually and just step in the right direction for each one of them. And if I combine those steps, I am really going downhill towards the bottom of my cost function. And no matter if I'm in a hyperspace with many, many more feature variables, that means I'm going to have many, many more unknowns. I can find each of them by just one step at a time, keeping all the other ones constant and just taking the partial derivative, in other words, of the one that I'm interested in. And so I'll just go through all of them individually and just update all of them again because this x new here, that just represents either beta sub 0 or beta sub 1 and if I had more, beta sub 2, beta sub 3, whatever. I just update all of them individually by keeping everything else constant and that's what we do with the partial derivative and partial derivatives are very easy if you have multivariable function because all the other things are just constant and taking the derivative of a constant is very easy. So no problem there. Uh, we can just scale things up as, as large as we want them. And if we continuously walk down the slope, that is how we're going to find our minimum. Now comes the bit of linear algebra. You've got to understand a bit of linear algebra. Now what I'm going to do, remember I said we had a bit of a problem with beta sub zero because we want to add two vectors to each other and beta sub zero is just a single value. Ours was very easy, it was zero at the moment but I've actually got to have a whole vector of them because I can only add two vectors to each other or subtract them from each other. And that was my loss function um, resulting in my cost function if the two vectors are equal size. So my y pred and my y actual have got to be exactly the same size because I have to have element y subtraction. 
so that's very easy. We just write in the beginning add a whole new column of ones, constant of one, because beta sub zero times one is still going to be beta sub zero. But now I have a scalar beta sub zero that I'm multiplying by a vector of all ones that gives me a vector of that length. Very neat. So I'm changing my x, which was a vector of 50 elements, into a matrix of m times 2. m was 55, so this will be a 50 times 2 matrix. 50 rows and 2 columns. I still have x sub 1, x sub 2, all the way down. It's still all my feature variable values, but I've added a column of 1. And then I'm going to make another column vector, and that vector is going to hold my two unknowns, beta sub 0 and beta sub 1, and I'm going to call that theta, which is a vector, you see the underlying there. And then my prediction becomes a matrix times a vector. And if you know anything about, uh, about linear algebra, you, you know that in this order, the column number there has got to equal the row number there. Otherwise, you can't do matrix vector multiplication. And the result is going to be take the rows from that one and the columns from that one. So we're going to end up with a m times 1 or 50 times 1 vector and that's exactly what we want so y hat is this going to be the matrix x which is a 50 times 2 matrix for us times a 2 by 1 column vector and that gives us a 50 times 1 column vector and that's exactly what we want we want those 50 predictions so if we wrote our feature variables as a matrix adding the ones right in the front and we add and we write our unknowns as a column vector and we do matrix vector multiplication, we're going to get exactly what we want, beta sub 0 times 1 plus beta sub 1 times x sub 1. Next one, beta sub 0 times 1 plus beta sub 1 times x sub 2. That's what matrix vector multiplication does, and that gives us, now times 1, we can just drop it, so it says beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1, x sub 1, beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1, x sub 2, etc., all the way to down to 50. That is how we get our predictions, so that will make for very easy to write code because it's very easy to do vector a matrix vector multiplication in code and then also my loss function here remember which I'm going to write my loss function here and it's going to be another vector and it takes theta as an input which is a m which results which is going to be an m times one and that's this y hat minus y a 50 element vector minus a 50 element vector and that's still going to result in a fifth, uh, m, m times 1 or 50 times 1 vector. So that's beta sub 0, beta sub 1, minus y sub 1. And then the second one, and the third one. So that makes it very easy to create these things. So my prediction is this is going to be x times theta. And my loss is this going to be that x times theta, which is y hat, minus y. Very easy. So let's look then at this mean squared error thing here. Now, we, we don't use mean squared error. Um, we actually use half mean squared error. So we add this half term. Remember, it was everything divided by m. I sum over all of those and just um, divide by m. But we actually divide by, uh, multiply all of that by a half. Now, that doesn't make a difference to finding a minimum because all I'm doing, I'm just scaling my cost function by a half. I'm just scaling it by scalar. Um, it's not going to change anything as this, I'm still trying to find the minimum of this thing, this cost function. But putting the 2 there makes for much easier partial derivatives, and you'll see that later. So if I write it out, I'm going to have this idea of this L, which was my loss. I'm going to take its transpose times itself. Now if I do the dot product between a vector transpose and a vector, what am I doing? I'm squaring each because I'm just multiplying each term by itself. And take a piece of paper and convince yourself of that. If you take a vector, column vector, and you take its transpose, which now makes it a row vector, and a row vector times a column vector, if that's the same vector, that is just element-wise squaring of each one and adding all those squares. That's what a dot product does. It's element times element plus element times element plus element times element, and that's such a neat way to do the different squared. And if we were to write it out, remember this is what it would look like. It's 1 over 2m, so that's beta sub 1 plus beta sub 1, x sub 1, minus y sub 1, all squared. And then the second example, the second sample, the th all the way down to the 50th or the last one. 
that is what we have at the moment. If we just did this transpose, as I said here, and just all these matrix multiplications and subtractions, vector subtractions that I've talked about there, and then this transpose times itself there. That's what I end up with. And now let's square all of these, and you see I end up with something like this, this whole long term. Beta sub 0 squared plus beta sub 0, beta sub 1, x sub 1, minus beta sub 0, y sub 1, plus beta sub 0, beta sub 1, x sub 1, plus beta sub 1 squared. Just convince yourself. Just square all of those things. That's what we end up with. And we still have the 1 over m, but we do it by a half, so 1 over 2m. And that eventually gives us a cost function. If you just look at all these 1s and 2s and 3s as subscripts, I can write that all as a summation, and there is my summation. And now it becomes very easy to take partial derivatives. Remember, this whole long thing now is my multidimensional cost function, and I'm trying to minimize that. So here I have my cost function, and I take the partial derivative of that with respect to beta sub 0, and I take my partial derivative of beta sub 1 with respect to beta sub 1. And you can see I've done it for you there. There's the one, there's the other one. Pause and see if you can do it yourself. If you can't do it just from the summation notation here, which is actually very easy if you think about it. Um, if you take this one here and just take from that the partial derivative with respect to beta sub zero, you're going to get that. And you see if I bring the twos out, that 2 would cancel, and that's why we put that 2 there, because now we have this very neat, a very neat update. And remember, this is the, the derivative that I'm going to use, the slope that I'm, that's going to help me walk in the right direction. We do the same for beta sub 1, and now we just have this beautiful thing where we have the column, old column vector, the beta sub 0, beta sub 1, uh, yeah, I should say, right there, and I subtract from that element-wise my little learning rate times 1 over m times these partial derivatives. And I'm going to do that with respect to beta sub 0 and beta sub 1. So this is going to be a column vector equals a column vector minus another column vector. And they're each 2 by 1s. And that's it. As simple as that. And then in code, if we go back all the way, that is what it looks like. All the steps up till now, that is exactly what we have. So we're going to have this loss, which is going to be x times theta minus y. And the cost function is then the 1 over 2m. And to get all that element-wise things, it's the loss transpose. That little apostrophe is transpose times the loss. And to update, I take my old beta sub 0 and beta sub 1. So there, that beta sub 1. I subtract from that alpha over m times this x transpose times the predicted minus y. That's going to be the cost function. And we're going to move away from the notebook here. I'm going to do it pen and, with pen and paper. Well, actually, I do have a screen that is a tablet, and I'm going to write on that in, uh, instead of pen and paper and recording the pen and paper. And I'm going to convince you that this line of code is nothing than using all of these. I'm going to convince you that those are the same. So what I want to convince you of is that uh, this piece of code that we saw in the notebook, so I take theta, which is just going to be this two-column vector. There we have it. Beta 0 and beta 1, our unknowns, equals theta. Now remember, in the world of computer languages, we evaluate the right-hand side, and then we assign it to the left-hand side. So theta equals theta, so we're going to start with the old theta that we have, minus. We have alpha, our step size, or learning rate, divided by m, the sample size. Multiply that by the transpose of x, and once we've done that, that is multiplied by the difference between the prediction and the y, and you know what that pred and y and x and alpha and m and theta are from the code. And I want to show you that that's exactly the same as what, what we did here. So what we have is just a bunch of column vectors. So we're saying that this old, where we stand at the moment, column vector, minus, and we have here a constant, that's this alpha divided by m, 
And if we multiply that by a column vector, it's just like broadcasting, it's going to multiply, uh, it's going to scalar multiplication with a vector, so it's just going to multiply each of the two. And on the top, we have the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta 1, and the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta 2, uh, beta sub 1, I should say. So um, I have two two by one column vec vectors, I subtract one from the other one, and what we're doing here, in essence, remember, it's one line by one line. So what we've got here is beta zero equals beta zero. So whatever beta zero is at the moment, and we're going to subtract from that alpha over m times the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta zero, and then separately from that we do beta sub one, that equals beta sub one minus alpha divided by m, partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta sub 1. So those are two separate equations. It's a linear system, and hence we can write it as these column vectors. And I want to convince you that this is nothing other than this, that that is what we are writing. So let's start off by let's looking at, let's go back to blue, let's do the pred first. So we see pred there. And remember, we said that that was equal to x times, in our code, times theta. So that was just x times theta. Let's just have a look at the dimensionality of this. Remember, this was a m times 2 matrix. It was a m times 2 matrix. And this is going to be theta, which is just going to be a 2 by 1 column vector. So that was a column vector. And if we multiplied those two out, what was it going to look like here? Remember, the x was just 1, 1, 1, all the way to 1 at the end. And this was going to be x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, all the way down to x sub m. That was our matrix. And we're going to multiply that by this column vector, b1, b sub 0, b sub 1. And what does that multiplication give us? Well, we've got a matrix times a vector. And so we can do that multiplication because look at this, that 2 equals that 2. And what we're going to get out of it is a m by 1 column vector. That's exactly what we want. So let's just do that. So what we're going to have here in the end is that very simple thing in as much as we just multiply those out. So that's going to be beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub 1 and beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1, x sub 2. And remember, there should be a beta sub 0 multiplied by 1 every time, but we, anything multiplied by 1 is this 1. And at the end, we're going to have beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1, x sub m. And from that, we subtract y. So again, that's element wise. So this is going to be minus y sub 1, minus y sub 2, all the way down to minus y sub m. And this is a column vector, a m times 1 matrix, or column vector. So that makes it like, really easy to do. Now let's see what is happening on this side. Alpha divided by m times the transpose of x. So what does the transpose of x look like? Well, the transpose of x, here we have matrix x, so x transpose, well, that's just going to be the columns and the uh, uh, rows uh, swap around. So this is going to be 1, 1, 1, all the way to 1. And this is going to be x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, all the way to x sub m. So this now becomes uh, only uh, two rows and m long. And we're going to multiply that out by, we're going to multiply that out by, this alpha over m. So all we need on this side is just alpha over m that we're going to multiply this with. And if we do that, we have alpha over m, alpha over m, alpha over m, all the way to the end, alpha over m. And here we're going to have alpha over m x sub 1, alpha over m x sub 2, alpha over m x sub 3, all the way to alpha over m, x sub m, and there is our still 2, two by m matrix. Now, what we have here, we have to multiply that 
by what we have here. So these two have to be multiplied by each other. There we go. They have to be multiplied by each other. So this is a 2 by m, 2 by m, this is a m by 1. Where are we going to end up with? Well, let's keep it in pink. We're going to end up with a 2 by 1. And that's exactly what we have, because this here is 2 by 1. That is our beta 1, beta, z, uh, beta sub 0, beta sub 1 column vector. So if we multiply these two out with each other, that's just going to be uh, um, quite a long stretch of things that we have to do. So let's have a look at it. So it's going to be each one of these x sub m's, and we're going to multiply that with each of these. So what we're going to end up with here is an alpha over m, and then we're going to have beta sub 0 plus, let's just it automatically makes that little, here we go, beta sub uh, 0 plus beta sub 1, x sub 1 minus y sub 1, and that's the x sub m for those. And we have to carry on, we have to carry on with this, plus alpha over m, and then in the end we're going to have x sub 2 minus y sub 2 after all of this, and it just carries on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And then for number 2 here, for number 2, we're going to have the alpha over m, and we're also going to have the x sub m, and then the beta 0, beta 1, x sub 1 minus y sub 1 plus alpha over m, x sub 2, and then beta sub 0. Let's go on on this side. Let me just make some space so I don't do, do that again. <laughs> Plus beta sub 1, uh, x sub uh, 2, minus y sub 2. Plus alpha over m, x sub 3. Oops, that is not an x. x sub 3, and we just carry on like that to the end. But what we're left with here in the end is a 2 by 1 is exactly a 2 by 1 matrix. Most importantly, we can just shorten this. We have beta sub 0 and a beta sub 1 uh, on this side, and that is going to equal beta sub 0, beta sub 1, minus what we have here, these two. And if we shorten that, this is going to be basically an alpha over m, because that's just a constant multiple with broadcasting. Here we're going to have the sum from i equals 1 to m, because we've got m samples, and that's going to be a beta sub 0 plus a beta sub 1 x sub i minus y sub i. That's what we have every time. It's just the 1 and the 1, and then the 2 and the 2. That's the only thing that changes. And for beta sub 1, we're going to have the sum of i equals 1 to m, and all we're going to have here is an x sub i, and here we're still going to have the beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub i minus y sub i. And that is still a 2 by 1 uh, column vector there. So we have a 2 by 1 column vector, a 2 by 1 column vector, and just this constant multiple of a 2 by 1 column vector. And everything works out. We can subtract two 2 by 1 column vectors from each other. Now, let's go about it from the other way. Remember, we had the mean squared error actually the half mean squared error. So let's have a look at that. That's going to, going to be 1 over 2m, remember? And then it's the sum of i equals 1 to m, and we're going to have y hat minus y, those two vectors subtracted from each other. So that's just the i there and the i there, and we square them. That's exactly what we want. And we remember, of course, let's go back to orange, this is 1 over 2m, and we have still the sum of i equals 1 to m. And how did we get, get y hat? Well, we got y hat. All we did was we said x. And remember, that was a m by 2. And then we multiplied by theta, which is a 2 by 1. So we end up with a m by 1, which is exactly what we want. And then we subtract from that just y. That that vector, and of course, we just have to square each of those. So we just have to square each of those. And remember that we are going through each of those i's. And for this multiplication here, that is going to give us an m by 1. So it's just 1 by 1 of them, square them, and then sum, sum them. So let's have a look if this works, because if we go y hat 
and we do sub i, remember that is going to be beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub i. That's exactly what we have there. And if we look at the whole y hat as a vector, that's going to be beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub 1, remember? And then beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub 2, all the way down to beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub m. So that's our whole column vector, so for all of them. And what did we do then? Well, we had this loss, this idea of a loss function, and that was just y hat minus y, if we can think about that as two, as two column vectors. And all that is, is just all of these minus beta sub 1, x sub 1, minus y sub 1, and beta sub 0, beta sub 1, x sub 2 minus y sub 2, all the way down to beta sub 0 minus beta sub 1, x sub m minus y sub m. And that's still an m by one column. And that was our loss, remember. But we didn't want that. We want each of those squared. So what, did, what do we do? Well, we said take the loss, as it stands now, take its transpose and multiply it by uh, the loss again. So the transpose of this was going to be this whole long thing, beta sub 0 minus beta sub 1, x sub 1 minus y uh, sub 1, comma, and then beta sub 0 minus beta sub 1, x sub 2 minus y sub 2, comma, all the way. So now this is going to be a 1 times m, and then multiply it by this, m times 1. Beta sub 1, x sub 1, minus y sub 1, beta sub 0, minus beta sub 1, x sub 2, minus y sub 2, all the way down to beta sub 0, minus beta sub 1, x sub m, minus y sub m. There we go, and that is a m by 1. And what are we going to end up with? Well, we're going to end up with a 1 by 1, and that's exactly what we want. That is our uh, part of our mean squared error. We just have to divide by 1 over 2m. But how this works is it's the square. That one is exactly the same as that one. And this one is exactly the same as that second one. So we're just squaring each of those and adding all of them up. And that's exactly, that is exactly what we want. Because in the end we have this idea of the loss squared. So let's do that exactly. Let's make this loss squared and just see what it, sort of what it looks like. So it's this squared, because there's this one multiplied by that one and this one by that one. So let's just see what it starts to look like. It's going to be beta sub 0 multiplied out with me. So that's beta sub 0 times beta sub 0. That's beta sub 0 squared plus beta sub 0, beta sub 1, x sub 1 minus beta sub 0, y sub 1. So I've multiplied all of those out. And then for the next one, so that's going to be beta sub 0, beta sub 1, x sub 1 plus beta sub 1 squared, x sub 1 squared minus beta sub 1, x sub 1, y sub 1 minus beta sub 0, y sub 1 minus beta sub 1, x sub 1, y sub 1 plus y sub 1 squared. So it's all those three terms multiplied throughout by all those three terms. So in other words, beta sub 0 minus beta sub 1, x sub 1 minus y sub 1. We multiplied that by itself. Beta sub 0 minus beta sub 1, x sub 1 minus y sub 1. If you multiply all that out, that's what you're going to get. And it just obviously carries on because now we do the second term and the third term and the fourth term, etc., etc., etc. So in the end, if we have the mean squared error, that was going to be 1 over 2m, and we're going to sum from i equals 1 to m, all of them. And if we just group these terms together, if we just group some of these terms, and just remember that we're going from 1 to 2 to 3 all the way to m, we can just bring them all together in a summation. So there's going to be beta sub 0 squared plus beta sub 0, beta sub 1, x sub i, minus, we're going to have beta sub 0, y sub i is the c, and we have beta sub 0, beta sub 1, x sub i. Let's just do all of those, and we can see here we're going to group all of them in the end. 
and we have a beta let's just give ourselves some more space beta sub 1 squared we're going to have an x sub i squared minus beta sub 1 x sub i y sub i and we're going to have another let's just give ourselves more space you need a lot of space for this uh, beta sub 0 and y sub i we've got that one minus we've got beta sub 1 we've got x sub i y sub i so that we'll have two of them in the end and then all the way in the end we have y sub i squared so let's clean those up because we can certainly uh, group some of those terms so we're still going to have here 1 over 2m we're going to have the sum from i equals 1 to m and if we grouped all of them if we grouped all of them together we're going to have this beta sub 0 squared we're going to have 2 times beta sub 0 beta sub 1 x sub i we're going to have minus 2 times beta sub 0 y sub i and we're going to have beta squared beta sub 1 squared we're going to have uh, no, that's not right beta sub 1 squared x sub i squared minus 2 times beta sub 1 x sub i y sub i and plus y sub i squared there's all neatly cleaned up so all we've done um, there's one term there's another term so there's two of them etc so we just start cleaning them up so that's our mean squared error that is in the end that's our cost function of two unknowns and for all i equals one two three up till m and that's our cost function and all we have to do is take the partial derivative of each of these separately so let's do that let's take the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta sub 0 well that's 1 over 2m the summation for this kind of uh, derivation or derivative stays exactly the same and we're treating beta sub 1 our other known as a constant so this is going to be 2 times beta sub 0 that's the first derivative of that what remains from this one is going to be plus 2 times beta sub 1 x sub i because there's a 1 power there, we bring it to the front, this becomes 0, so that goes away. Here we have minus 2 times y sub i. That's all we have there. And now remember, look at all this, that's why we put the half term there, because now I can take this, these 2s, I can take all of them away, and they're all gone. And there's my partial derivative, very simply, partial derivative with respect to beta sub uh, to beta sub uh, 0. Let's do the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta sub 1. And if we do that, that's 1 over 2m. We have sum over i equals 1 to m. And we're going to have 2 times, so that's a constant. So derivative of a constant is 0 because we're only doing it with respect to beta sub 1. So there we're going to have 2 times uh, beta sub 0 x sub i. As simple as that and what remains for us right here at the end that's a constant and um, there we have another term so that's going to be plus 2 times beta sub 1 x sub i squared and right at the end here we're going to have minus 2 times beta sub 1 x sub i y sub i again i can get rid of the twos and that's why we did the half this makes it all nice and neat and, and the other thing that I can also do, you see they all have a common factor. So I can say that the cost with respect to beta 1 is going to be 1 over m. And we sum from i equals 1 to m. And we have x sub i there. And that's beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 x sub i minus uh, beta sub 1 y i. Of course, you see the little mistake that come, came in there. There we have 2 times beta sub 1. And if I take the derivative of that, of course, there should be nothing left there. There we go. That looks much better. And if we go all the way back up, that's exactly what we have here. That's exactly what we have here. Nothing other than that. So with our code and with doing it by hand, shouldn't do that, with our code and doing it by hand, we get to exactly the same thing. We get to exactly the same thing. In other words, we really have, let me write neatly, beta sub 0, beta sub 1. That's going to be beta sub 0, beta sub 1. And we subtract from that alpha over m times 
this idea of the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta sub zero and the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to beta sub one. That's exactly what we're doing. It's a linear system in two equations, and we see that's exactly the same thing that comes from this line of code that we have right up here. That is exactly that line of code which gives us exactly this thing. And that is what we want to do with gradient descent. So let's get back to the code. So now that you're convinced that they're the same, let's have a look at what it would look like. Function is cost function. It takes x, y, and theta. My m is just the size of x, um, the first of the tuple, because it's going to be row, comma, column. The loss is this x times theta. That gives me my y pred minus y, which makes my cost function exactly what I showed you right up there. There's a simple line like that. So if we run that, I have a cost function, and now I've got to do gradient descent. So I'm going to call my function here linear rich gradient underscore d. You can see, you can give it a name. It takes x, y, and alpha, and then a fit intercept is true, and the number of iterations, we're going to do 5,000. So length is still going to be my number of cases is going to be m, that's the length of y, and if fit intercept, which we are going to set to true, I'm just adding a constant of ones, and I'm going to add 50 of them at the moment of ones, and I'm just horizontally concatenating that, the constants, so all the ones to the x, and that's how I just get uh, all of those. If not, it's just going to use x. So you'll see that quite commonly, but in our instance, we want those ones, otherwise things are not going to work out for us. So n is the number of columns, so that's going to be size of x, the second one, row comma columns. At the moment for us, it's going to be 2. And then I'm, I've got to have random guesses. I've got to start beta sub 0 and beta sub 1 somewhere. And uh, I'm just going to start it with two zeros. So it's two zeros on top of each other, a column vector of two zeros. And then I'm going to have just this little placeholder, of 50,000 cost values, because each time I'm going to have a cost value of the 5,000 times that I'm going to run over this. Remember, every time I'm going to get better and better and better values for beta sub 0 and beta sub 1, because my gradient descent is going to walk towards having the minimum cost function. I'm just um, creating a vector there with all zeros. And then for iter, is this my keyword there, or my variable name there, just to run through this range of 1 to 1,000, uh, 5,000, I said. The pred, remember, is x times theta, and then I'm going to start overwriting each one of those 50 empty or zero values by the cost function, given what my best theta is at the moment, and we're starting at 0, 0, and then we're going to update it so that we have new beta sub 0, beta sub 1, and then I run through all of that again. The next time, my pred is going to be slightly better, and my cost value is going to be slightly lower. I'm going to run through this 5,000 times, and in the end, I want the stuple returned of my vector of unknowns, beta sub 0, beta sub 1, and then the 50, or the 5,000, I should say, values of my cost, what the cost function was, and hopefully that is going to come down. So let's run that. Let's run that here. We're going to run that uh, 5,000 times. And because I'm returning a tuple, I'm just going to split them up so that I have them separately. So here, that what I want here for cost values is just the second one, the J there. And my time step is uh, going to be 5,000 of them as well because I just want to plot this. I want to show you, see how quickly that was? Let's plot that. You're going to plot that. And there we go. My cost started quite high. And every step that we took, my cost came down, down, down. Until here by 5,000, my cost was very low at 1.92. That's a beautiful iteration. I see I didn't make use of this time step there. I could put the time step there, but I just used use that range there, 1 to 5,000. So I needn't have put that. But I want my 5,000 cost values, and you can see how it comes down. Let's see what my theta values look, look like. That was going to be the first of the tuple that got returned there, theta. Let's store that in a computer variable called PAR or M, short for parameters. And we see a beta sub zero of negative 0 
and a beta sub 1 value of 9.43. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, let's just uh, plot that. And you see there's my model. Very close to the one I guessed at before, but this would now be after 5,000 iterations. It's really getting close to the minima for those two unknowns. So we've used gradient descent to get to this model. Now let's just use the GLM to see another way to do this. Now I'm not going to run through the explanation of that because this was about gradient descent and how to code it inside of Julia. But let's just use ordinary least squares. So I'm not going to explain what ordinary least squares are. I've got a YouTube video on how to get to that. But this would be another way to get to the best values of theta. And that just takes x transpose times x, the inverse of that, times x transpose times y. Um, or if you break that up, and that's the video that I really explained this, how to get beta sub 0 and beta sub 1, but this is going to be only for a single feature, only for a single uh, feature variable. And you can see there how to do beta sub 0 and beta sub 1. So I'm going to use, we've imported the GLM function. Well, first of all, I should say we've got to write this as a data frame. So I'm going to have two columns in my data frame, feature and target. And feature is going to be all the x values, and target is going to be all the y values. And then I'm going to use the LM function in GLM. That just stands for linear model. And we're going to use uh, at formula. Um, and then we're going to say target dependent on feature in the data frame DF. So that's just um, the syntax of that. And I'm going to store it in a computer variable called OLS because this is ordinary least squares. We, it's going to make use of this equation. The ordinary least squares for beta sub 1 and beta sub 0. And then uh, let's just have a look at that. If we use this beta sub 0 and beta sub 1 equation there, well, so my OLS is still running because uh, it's, it's, it's got a low GLM. Um, and there we go. It finds there's our estimates. Our intercept is minus 0 0.15. And my feature, my uh, x variable, my for beta sub 1, its value is going to be 9.64. So those would be the best values. We can see a p-value for that, and we can see the low and upper bounds, 95% confidence intervals there. But let's use uh, this, these two equations there. I've written them out in code. You can definitely have a look at that. And then for beta sub 0, I get negative 0.12 and 9.59. 9 uh, so very close to uh, the optimized code that is used in inside of uh, generalized linear models here. Yeah, it's slightly optimized from here, but you can see it's very, very close. So I can just look at uh, of the best model. We can just store all of those, look at its MSE, and use that MSE to subtract from that. And that was the R squared, remember, compared to the base model. We use the R2 function here. And uh, let's just see 0.686, it's exactly the same. Um, so the GLM uses exactly the same uh, function as we did before. Remember the comparison function that we did compared to the base model. So this is back to normal statistics. We can say the best fit model explains 68.6% .6 of the variance in our, in, our, in, in our model. So that is it, gradient descent. I hope you now understand how to go from the concept of it to the code and why the code is so easy, but also understand gradient descent itself. That in AI today, uh, talking specifically about deep learning, that we can write a function. And that function is a representation of how far away are we from the best possible prediction. And that we can iterate over this and make the unknowns, the parameters as we call them, better and better and better until we get somewhere where uh, given those values, given those unknowns, given those parameter values, that we can predict an outcome quite accurately. And that is, would be exactly the same for regression problems and classification problems. Classification problems uh, in supervised learning, remember um, that we have a categorical variable as our target variable. Here we have regression, we have a numerical variable as our target variable. Uh, try this yourself, play around with Julia, uh, create some or, or at least bring in some, some of your own um, data and see if you can run a, a linear regression as a model.
There are some wonderful packages in the Julia ecosystem to work with statistics. There's also a statistics package built right into Julia. So when you install Julia the first time, this package will be there. You've got to import it to be able to use it though. And it just it contains the box standard uh, statistical test that we use all the time. So I'm talking about the two-point estimates, mean and median, and the uh, measures of dispersion. In other words, your variance, your standard deviation, and the quantiles. Very easy to use these functions, functions that we use all the time, and they're right there for you after importing the package. I'm going to open a notebook and we'll explore these functions. I've opened our Julia notebook and we can see here statistics standard library in Julia. By the way, if you just want to see how these colors were done, that's just a uh, uh, use of some HTML. So that's the button I'm setting there. And if you give it a class, this would be a danger button. And that gives it its color. You can use uh, CSS to overwrite that. That's just how I get these buttons. And anyway, let's get to the standard library. I'm going to use three packages here. We're going to import them. CSV, that is a package that you have to install yourself. Uh, the same would go for data frames. And uh, the CSV are from the name would suggest that it is a package which we use to import CSV files. And then data frames is the famous package uh, for working with the data. So those you've got to install yourself. You can use the REPL, hit the right uh, square bracket, and use just the add function to add these uh, to your Julia installation statistics, though it comes with your Julia installation. And what you can see is that I'm using the import function instead of the normal using. So what import's going to do for me here is the fact that I have to reference the package uh, to get to the functions uh, that are in there. That's going to be the practical use of it here. And the reason why I'm doing it is so that you can see where these functions actually come from. Because once you use using, obviously you just have access to all the functions that are in there. Uh, and uh, you can't always remember where these functions come from. And while you're using learning to use Julia, I like to know where these functions come from. So let's import our data file. Now this data file, data.csv, it lives inside of the same folder on my internal drive as this notebook. So I don't you have to use the whole path, uh, C, colon, uh, backslash, etc. Uh, for Windows and, and then different for, for Mac and, and Linux. Because they live in the same folder, I can just reference the file directly. So let's run that. It'll take a minute or so. Oh, a minute or so, I should say. A couple of seconds or so, and it will import that file. We're going to use the first function here. The first argument is df, and then how many rows we want from that data frame uh, to be printed to the screen. And we just do that so that we can see um, if the import worked the way that we thought it would as far as our data frame is concerned. So it's omitting, uh, it's only printing f f one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns here. It's omitting the other five because it does show the, the 12 columns. And I asked for five rows, and we can see the five rows there. At the top, we can see the column headers. So in the spreadsheet file itself, that will be the first uh, first row uh, to contain the column names. That's name, age, vocation, smoke, with, it seems zero and ones, heart rate, SPP, systolic blood pressure, and cholesterol before. And we can see how the data frames package uh, how, how it, what it thought these values represented as far as data types are concerned. So it interpreted the names. Now this is just uh, mock data. It doesn't refer to anyone uh, in real life. So that was a string. It saw the age as 64-bit integers. The vocation as a string. It saw smoke, which zero was coded for uh, patients or, or, or participants who were not smoking, one for smoking and two for smoke before, something like that. But it sees them as integers. And of course, these are just numerical values that we are using to represent a categorical variable. Heart rate, you see 64-bit integers, 64-bit integers, and then 64-bit floats. So we can use the names function and pass to the data frame to that if we're interested to look at all of the statistical variables, the column headers in our data frame. If you really need to work uh, with this properly and you want to change the type, so we can see here uh, uh, the smoke, for instance, that's 64-bit uh, as a 64-bit integer. For now, we'll leave it as that. 
but let's change let's change the vocation and there's also a group column that you can see there and remember we referred to the again refer to these using symbol notation symbol notation has the colon in front of that so we're going to say data frames dot categorical with the exclamation mark which is the bang and that means change it in place so it's going to overwrite what is there so the changes that we make are, that we make are in place so categorical so change the following so in df then i'm going to list the columns that i want to change and if we do that those columns are now uh, they are now categorical and they won't be strings anymore if i just want to reference a single column i can use the dot notation here and i can just say df.h and if we look at the type of df.h we see that we're going to get back a csv dot column data type and it's going to have an index column and it's going to have the actual age value so we see it's going to have two 64 bit integer columns there if you're used to working with python in pandas uh, if you reference df.age for instance in the same way as we do here you get back a panda series and a panda series is a just a column which is an index starting from zero when you and julia we start counting from one and the second column is going to be those actual values so let's just look at uh, the size i can use the size function in julia and it's df and then because it's indexing we use square brackets there and the exclamation mark here just that's a shorthand for give me all the values and then i'm using symbol notation i can also just put age inside of double quotation marks and i'm going to get the size just of that and we see there are uh, 200 values as we expected uh, right at the top here i think we did do size df and it gave me 200 rows and 12 columns yes we did so uh, if we don't want to work it, work with it as a csv column data type we can always convert it with the convert function in julia and the first argument is what i want to convert it to i want to convert it to an array what do i want to convert to array well the csv column type so if we convert that i now have an array of 64 bit integers and they're just in a single column so it is a column vector and we see the dimension there of it being one so that is it for just for our data let's get into the statistics package we're going to look at two things it's really divided into the two point estimates and then the measures of dispersion so remember point estimates and statistics that is just a single value that must be representative of all the values as human beings we are bad at looking at rows and rows of data rows and rows of numbers uh, it doesn't make much sense to us we need to summarize it we need a single value to be representative of the whole and of course the mean is uh, the most common one and here yeah, we have the mean function inside inside of the statistics library and this just calculates the arithmetical you can see arithmetical mean there and there we see the equation here in equation one we put a bar on top to signify this is the sample uh, the mean for the sample that we just add all of them up and we divide by how many there are in case you're interested in how to get this green background and then the mathematical notation there that's just LaTeX so I'm using the div in HTML class is set to uh, alert alert success that gives the success is what gives it the green color and uh, the role is alert and then I just have to close my div tag there and then inside of a set of double uh, dollar signs is where I put my LaTeX code and you can see the LaTeX there which a Jupyter notebook can interpret properly and give us that mathematical representation anyway let's get to the mean function so it is part of statistics now remember I said we are importing these packages and not using the packages so I have to say statistics dot mean if you just said using statistics of course you could just say mean you can still say statistics dot mean but I like to do this, as I say, to remind us where these functions come from. So this mean function is not part of Julia. It is part of the package. So this function comes from this package. So statistics.mean, and I'm going to pass to it this CSV column data type, df.age. It will correctly interpret the fact that I'm not, I don't care about the index numbers. I care about the actual numbers, and it gives me the mean. Because the mean is such a simple uh, arithmetical operation, we can just write this in Julia using the sum and the length function. If I pass this df column uh, uh, con uh, collection 
And if I pass that to the sum function, it is going to sum all of those elements, and I divide by the length of how many there are, and I'm going to obviously get exactly the same result back. Now the mean function is uh, useful in as much as I can do some form of transformation on the values in my collection uh, before I take the mean. And in this instance I'm doing a log transform. So we're taking the log of each of the values separately in that collection before we take the mean. And what I'm taking the mean of, of course, is df.age. So that's going to be the mean of the log transformed values. So transforming all those to log first and, and then taking the mean. We can also use the mean to work on multidimensional arrays. So here, in this uh, inside of square brackets, so I have a list object here, which is actually going to give me back uh, a two-dimensional array. Uh, we see a two by three array, two rows, three columns. And you see it's just the space in between to jump to the next row. I use the semicolon. And now we can see it's a, 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 an array along a second dimension as well. So not only a down a single column, but now I've got multiple columns. And we can see a 1, 2, 3. So we can work out for a multidimensional array like this. We can work out the mean along the columns. So I can get the mean of 1, 2, and 3, and the mean of 4, 5, and 6. Or I could get the mean of 1 and 4. 2 and 5, 3 and 6. And I do that by just stipulating an argument here for the DIMS, a value for the DIMS argument. So statistics.mean, I'm passing my multidimensional array here, but I'm saying DIMS equals 1. So if we do it along that first dimension, it's going to be for each of the columns. So the mean of 1 and 4 is 2.5, and the mean of 2 and 5 is 3.5, and the mean of 3 and 6 is 4.5. But if I say dims equals 2, I'm going to get it uh, the other way around. So the mean of 1, 2, and 3 is 2, and the mean of 4, 5, and 6 is 5. Of course, we can also use the convert function if you run into problems um, that you only, from whatever data type you have, remember you can always convert. So here we're going to use the convert function. I'm going to convert to an array, and what do I want to convert to array? I'm using df, the data frame, and I'm using square bracket notation, so indexing. And I'm saying give me all the rows. And then as a list, I pass two columns, cholesterol before and cholesterol after. Think about it. It's going to give me back a multidimensional array. We're going to have 200 rows across two columns. And that means I can set the dims. And if I set the dims to 1, remember that's going to give me the, the mean for every column specifically. So I know for cholesterol before, the mean was 6.0125. And for cholesterol after, the mean was 5.7575. So that's one way, if we're working with data and we're passing a multidimensional array, we can do, you're going to use the mean function to calculate that column-wise, and that will give me the mean of each of these two variables. Of course, remember, you can always use the skip missing. If you have an, a collection, here yeah, I have a collection, which is a, a list, an array, 1, comma, missing, comma, 3, if I say skip missing, pass that, pass this collection here to the skip missing function as an argument, it's going to then ignore the missing and then calculate the mean. Otherwise, you will get a result of missing back because mean doesn't know what that value is. It cannot calculate the, uh, the mean. Median, of course, we sort all our values in ascending or descending order. And if it's an odd number of values that we have is going to take the middle one that divides our data set into two halves and if we have an even number it's going to take the middle two and just take the average and um, that really comes from this middle function so if i use statistics.middle what is the middle between one and five well it's three because i have one and two and four and five on either side so i have two on either side of three but if i have an even number it's going to take those middle two which is uh, 2 and 3, and, it's, and it averages them out to 2.5. Just to remind ourselves of the length of that, there we had 200 of those, so that means we have an even number. So I'm going to call statistics.median on the, on the df.h, and it's 54, uh, which means we're going to have 100 values less than 54 and 100 more than 54. But remember, 54 uh, is going to be there were probably two values that were 54 uh, right in the smack bang in the middle, and their average was, of course, 54. We can always use skip missing, remember, the same as we did with uh, with a mean. 
So that's mean and median. Let's look at measures of dispersion. Standard deviation is the one most commonly used. Of course, that is just uh, we first work out the variance and then we take the square root of the variance. And f uh, the STD function does the standard deviation for us. By default, it's going to do the standard deviation of the sample. So that's small s. And you can see the sample size, which is n, we subtract 1 from it. So we just sum over the squared differences between each value and the mean. And we sum over all of those and divide by 1 minus our sample size. Take the square root of that and that gives us the standard deviation. So STD function there. And we see a standard deviation of 12.5. Because this is such an easy equation, we can just do it uh, with Julia functions. So square root outside. We're taking the square root of the sum divided by the length, as you can see. And the sum is df dot age dot minus. So remember that gives us element-wise sub subtraction. So it's going to take each of the values in the age and subtract from each of those the mean of df age. And in the end, dot is power. So each of those differences now is going to square. And I'm going to divide all of that by the length after summing over all of those, and I'm going to get exactly the same results, 12.5. So remember in Julia, to do element-wise operations, we use the dot in front of our arithmetical operation. I can also specify a different mean. I don't have to go with the mean given by the actual data set. I can say work out for me the standard deviation given a different mean. And you can see that follows after semicolon, so it is a named argument. I can put named arguments in any order, but before that semicolon, I have these sequential arguments. They have to go in the same order. So for standard deviation, we're only passing one of them, and that's the actual collection of values. So I can work out what the standard deviation would be with respect to the mean of 10. If I want the population standard deviation, that sigma there, I can use the argument corrected equals false, and corrected is also a named argument, so that goes after a semicolon, not a normal comma. So take, give me the standard deviation of the age column, um, but calculated as if this is a population and not a sample, and the only difference being here in the, down here in the uh, denominator where we don't subtract 1. So if we do that, we are going to get 12.52, and of course we can just quickly do that just with uh, normal Julia functions. Variance, as I said, is what we actually do, uh, in as much as we're not taking the square root. So here's the sample of variance, so it's s squared as opposed to the population, which is sigma squared, and from a population we subtract each value from, uh, we subtract the mean from each value, and here it's the population mean, so sigma there. The VAR, VAR, is just a function for that. And if I say correct, my corrected equals false named argument, it's going to be for population, so slightly different. I can also just specify a mean as we did with a standard deviation, so work out for a different mean. Lastly, uh, in the statistics library, we have the quantiles. Now, the most famous ones probably are the quartiles, whereas the median divided my data set, my ordered data set from minimum value to maximum or maximum to minimum value. It's just going to median divided in halves. The quartiles divided into quarters. So the first quartile is going to have a quarter of the values less than it and three quarters more than it. The second quartile is exactly the same as the median, half below, half above. Third quartile is three quarters less than and one quarter more than. Um, we express these as a fraction though. So the first quartile would be 0.25 25% of the values, a quarter of the values, 0.25 below. So I'm going to use statistics.quantile. I pass my collection to it, df.age, and 0.5, that's the exact same thing as the median. In fact, if we use median there, we see it's exactly the same thing. I can pass a list of values. Here we have a collection of all the quantiles that I want. So quantile is the group term. And we can take any fraction from 0 to 100. So I'm asking for the 0th there. And that, that another term for that would be percentile. The 0th percentile up to the 100th percentile. That would be, 1 would be the maximum value. And 0 would be the minimum value. And then all the quartiles in between. So if I run that, 
I'm going to get all those values. And we see 54 again there in the middle, and 30 was the minimum, and 75 was the maximum. So that's it for the functions, the bug standard, very useful functions inside of the statistics library. I just wanted to mention, uh, just for completeness sake, remember the interquartile range. That is just the difference between the first and the third quartile. So I can just subtract the 0.25 value from the 0.75 value. That gives me the interquartile range. And that's something we can use in a box and whisker plot or uh, at least uh, uh, mathematically that we can uh, can estimate if there are any statistical outliers. And remember the difference between the interquartile range and the range. The range is this, the maximum minus the minimum. So that's that full difference. And we use the standard Julia functions, maximum and minimum. So the maximum of that collection minus the minimum of the same collection. And that gives me 45. Again, that's it for the statistics package. It's a very useful functions. You can, uh, after you familiar with, the with where these come from, just use using instead of import. So you don't have to type statistics dot all the time. But it is just something that I use in teaching Julia that we just want to remember exactly from what package these functions that we do import, where they come from. So a couple of years ago, I made a video on Julia for Medical Statistics, quite a successful video. I think it's got down about 12,000 views now. And because people are interested in that, now it's a couple of years down the line, short couple of years, and we at version 1.4, and I think that was still done in 0.4, so many things have changed. And Julia has really grown up. It is a phenomenal language for scientific computing, solves so many problems in such an easy way, and there's a big community now, and there's also a big package ecosystem. So it was time to redo this video. The video is still going to be about showcasing Julia, how to use Julia to do medical statistics. And what we're going to do this time around though, we're going to base it on a paper. So an open paper, I'll put the link down below. And uh, we're just going to use some of the summary statistics to simulate some new data. And that's the data that we're going to analyze. So I'll show you how that works, how to use distributions just to create and simulate your own data. Then we're going to go through summary statistics and, uh, and plotting. You've got to visualize your data. And I'm going to show you a, a plotting library called Gadfly, and it really produces beautiful plots. And then we're going to check for the assumptions uh, for the use of parametric tests and then do one or two uh, inferential tests. Lastly, just to, again to showcase the ease of the use of the language, what it can do, we're just going to hand code a chi-square test for independence. Now, as I mentioned, Julia has really grown up. A lot of people are using it. The community is just getting larger and larger. Currently, I'm working on a course, and as soon as that one's done, I'll uh, pop that link down below. So maybe by the time you watch this, uh, that link will be up. Uh, an introductory course and just teaching you how to do Julia from the ground up, whether you've programmed before, maybe a bit of R, maybe a bit of Python, or if you've never coded at all, just to show you how easy it is to learn a programming language. And if you're going to, to learn how to, how to use one, might as well be Julia. It really is going places. And if you can code in Julia, you can basically code in Python as well, and you can code in R. And there's really no use just to code in one language. You've got to know a couple of them. It really makes life uh, interesting and makes your work a lot more fun. Start with Julia though, why not? Now though, let's look at Julia using medical statistics. And so we start off with, with the Julia language website. It's julialang.org. Lots of information here. You can learn about Julia uh, all you like in the documentation. I am going to tell you that the documentation is on the technical side. So at least when you start, it is a little bit of a struggle. Of course, to download and install Julia, we can just click on the Downloads button. And we can see when I made this recording, the current stable release was 1.4.1. That's what we're going to use. And that was released on April the 14th. There's also a long-term support release if that's what you want to stick to. And you can see we have Windows, Mac OS, and all the Linux libraries. And then for some of them, 32-bit and 64-bit, you will know what to install. For Windows Go, for 64-bit, Mac OS, you're only going to get the 64-bit. And then with uh, with Linux, uh, uh, the 64-bit would just be the norm. Most computers and uh, operating systems are 64-bit these days. When you've installed Julia, though, that is only going to be available to you in the REPL. 
So that is your terminal, your command prompt, and so you can just line, write little lines of code that get executed. What you do need is a graphical user interface. And the best one to use at the moment is Atom. And there we go, atom.io. When you go on the Atom website, it will recognize, should recognize your operating system. It says that I'm on Windows here, and we can download and install that. If Julia was installed properly, once you've downloaded it, just accept all the defaults. It should be in your environment variables, uh, or in your path. And that means your computer knows where to find Julia when you want to start using it. And when you install Atom, uh, it should pick up uh, where Julia is if you install Julia inside of Atom. So Atom is a general purpose coding environment, an IDE. And you can code or use a lot of languages inside of Atom. Um, let me just open Atom for you there. There we go. That's Atom. And you can see right at the top there it says Juno. That means Julia was already installed to work inside of Atom. And I'll show you uh, how to go about that. Two ways how, uh, that you could go about that. The best way or the easiest way I should say is just to go to Julia Computing. So not julialang.org but juliacomputing.com. Commercial arm of Julia. You can find out all about what they have to offer. But what you want to do is go down here and look at Julia Pro. Let's click on read more. And there you can download Julia Pro free of charge. And you can see there they've got 1.0.5.2, the long-term release there, but also the current stable release, 1.4.1-1. And again, you can just download those. It might ask you to uh, register. It's all free of charge. And you can go ahead and download that. What that is going to do for you, it's going to install Atom, as we can see here. You're going to see Atom and Julia's already connected to it. If you do the Julia Lang separately and Atom separately, you can always come to the settings page and you'll see for me that was control comma or command comma and you'll see packages there. It'll list all the packages that were installed and you can see Julia client was already installed, Julia language uh, already installed. What you would have to search for is Uber, that's U-B-E-R, do you know? If you search for that package and install that, that's going to install everything for you. If everything worked well, you installed Julia properly, you installed Atom as we've done here, you should have Juno there when you restart. You can go down to settings and you can set all sorts of things as far as uh, the Julia uh, client specifically is concerned. You can see there's some Julia options, uh, the UI options, etc. Atom itself has built in themes as well, so you can go for a light theme or a dark theme. Let's close this all off. What I've got here on the left hand side is just a project pane. In other words, I went to file and add project folder because the files that I want to work in, they're all in a specific folder. And that also allows you to connect your code on your uh, on a GitHub repository and you can just continuously upload to GitHub. What you see here down at the bottom is a terminal and you can run the Julia as uh, in the form of a REPL right here. So if I click enter or return there, we can see Julia's launch there. And when you install just base Julia, just Julia without anything else, without an IDE, this is what you're going to see. And I can just write in, type uh, some code there, 2 plus 2, hit enter, and we're going to see 4. In the middle here is where we see the coding environment itself. And you see I've got a file open, julia for medical statistics.jl, and that's what we're going to work with. On the right-hand side, there's the workspace. It's going to show me my current workspace, the computer variables that I've created, and the objects... Um, that are assigned to them. You get full documentation here, so you can search the documentation. Of course, you can just go on the website as well, and we're gonna have inline plots. So what I like to do is I'm just gonna grab the REPL here, and I'm going to move it right up there next to workspace. So it makes that little blue mark there, drop it there. Now it's on the right-hand side for me. I can also just close down this side, and we've got a lot more space to work with because some of the lines of code uh, are quite, quite long. As with Python, we see that we can use the hashtag symbol or pound symbol uh, on the left-hand side of every line of code, and that means that whole line of code will just be ignored by Julia. 
it won't ignore that and inside of an IDE such as this you can just use these comments just to write um, some comments and when you download this file you can see the comments that I've made it'll tell you a little bit about Julia about its type system about multiple dispatch uh, why it's so fast why it is such a lovely language to use basically it comes down to it is as simple as Python but it runs along the sort of speeds that you can expect of other uh, compiled languages like C because that's exactly what Julia is it's a compiled language so when you enter some code it gets compiled for your uh, for your computer for your CPU in other words uh, the code is going to execute uh, very fast it's just in time uh, compiling so it goes to a, a low level virtual machine and that is going to compile the code for your system bringing you that speed one more thing that I want to say about Julia before we start, everything in Julia is a function. Functions, it's a functional language. In other words, you saw me type 2 plus 2 there, but what's happening behind the scene is there is a plus function in Julia. And you start by typing the function, and in this instance, it is this plus symbol. That is a function. It's the name of a function. And as with all functions, you pass it some arguments. Not all functions need arguments, but most functions would need arguments. They are separated by commas if they're positional arguments. We might talk a little, just a bit, keyword arguments, perhaps not in this video, but those would be uh, uh, follow a semicolon. Here I'm just passing two arguments to the plus function. It's two and two. The plus function knows what to do with it. Why? Well, it understands what 2 and 2 are. 2 and the other 2, those are both 64-bit integers, by default 64-bit, because this is a 64-bit operating system. So those are 64-bit uh, integers that I'm passing to this function through multiple dispatch. Uh, they are the plus function will know what to do with integers, and that will be something very different than doing just that. That's 2 dot or 2 dot o. That's a floating point value. It's going to call a different method for the plus function because it knows what to do with floating point values. Those are decimal point values, and that's different from integers. But Julia understands what to do, how to compile the code so that it executes as fast as possible, as, as optimized as possible for that function, that plus function, to execute. We don't have to tell Julia what type of... A variable we do have so if I say a equals 3 I don't have to instantiate that 3 that is I'm instantiating um, this object which is a, actually a, an array or a vector at least of, of a single value and that is assigned to the computer variable a so that's an instance of a 64-bit integer here that I'm passing to but I didn't have to tell I didn't have to specify the type of that three i didn't have to specify julia is going to infer that for me you can obviously do specify you can specify the type and that is going to lead to a better execution so all that being said that's not what you're here for let's have a look at what we can do in julia now we are going to use make use of third party packages most other languages have packages that you can installed to greatly expand uh, the functions uh, that are available to you and what you can do. And you see here, I've just typed a single line of code here, import data frames. Let me increase the size, just one more tick. There we go. That was just holding down control or command and using my, my mouse wheel and just to increase uh, the size there. So import data frames. Data frames is a package. That's the name of a package. And I'm using import there to import, but you can also see down here I'm importing getfly, but instead of import, I use using. So there's a difference between those two. There, there are a few differences. One of the main differences are that if I want to use some of the functions inside of data frames, I have to use the data frames, the, the namespace, the full namespace word there. So data frames dot, and then a function that lives inside of there. Using for most of them, you don't have to do that. You just use the function as is. If you're familiar with Python, that would be importing numpy as np and then using np.random, for instance. Whereas if you imported uh, from numpy import random, then you can just use random directly. The reason why I'm going to do this here is 
I want to show you, if I show you a function, I want you to know, you to know where it comes from. In many tutorials, all these packages are just, uh, it's just used with a using keyword. And then functions are used, but you're not really sure where they come from. So I'm going to restrict myself, myself to import here, which is not the norm. But just to show you, if I use a function from, for instance, from statsbase, that you know that that function comes from statsbase. So where did I get all of these extra packages from? Let's go back to the REPL. Just going to delete there. I'm going to hit the right square bracket. And that brings me into the package management system. And all I have to do is say add. And then I could say data frames. And if I hit enter now, the data frames package is going to be installed. That's a permanent installation unless I remove it. So it's always there. But the first time that you start up the IDE, so just to, so to get out of that package, I just had to hit backspace and I'm back. Before I forget, there's also the question mark that brings you into the help system. If I were to look for the function called sum, that's all. Look at that. I just get all that information. I could also go to the documentation, of course, and uh, type in sum, and I'm going to get this information as well. So the help system is always there for you back to these packages you install them there but you have to import them every time you start the ide or or start the julia kernel again you have to import or use the keyword using with these and then they're going to be pre-compiled and that takes some time so every time you import these packages it is going to take time there is no way to to rush this situation it's not like importing numpy as np and it's almost instantaneous this has to be compiled so you can see here at the bottom, pre-compiling data frames. And you see this little gear icon here. It is doing the pre-compiling. And you have to wait for that. If you want the speed, you've got to wait for the uh, language to compile. And there we go. It didn't take that long. Let's also import distributions. So the distribution package is going to give me access to a lot of discrete and continuous uh, distributions. Getfly is a package for plotting based on the grammar of graphics. If you've used ggplot2 before, it should not be too difficult for you to pick up a gadfly. So it renders very beautiful plots and certainly go to the gadfly website and have a look around. It is this phenomenal, the type of plots that you can create. And of course, we're going to create the plots in this tutorial. So let's do gadfly. It's going to take a little bit longer to pre-compile. It's a large package, and uh, it's, it's going to take a bit of time. I'll continue talking uh, about the hypothesis tests that's going to give us in, uh, access to a lot of statistical uh, tests for, for inference. So we're going to get our t-tests, f-tests, etc. that is going to be available for us. Um, not all uh, inferential statistic tests are available. Have a look at their website, for instance. As I mentioned in the introduction, we are going to hand code or hand write some code to uh, do a chi-square test for independence uh, at the end of this tutorial. StatsBase is also going to give me access to a bunch of statistical functions, uh, uh, and uh, which makes life very use uh, it's very makes life very easy. It's a very useful uh, package to have. So let's just go to back to hypothesis tests and you can see I'm doing for get fly and for hypothesis tests I'm using using but for stats base I'm using import. It's just that I want to show you where these uh, as I mentioned where these functions come from. So I'm going to do import by the way to execute these lines of code. I'm just at the at the end I can be any anywhere inside that line and I'm holding down shift and I'm hitting enter. Shift and enter or shift and return and that is going to going to complete that for me. Let's do statistics. Now, statistics and random, that they come with Julia. They're built into Julia, but if you want to use the functions inside of those two packages, you have to import them or use the using statement. CSV, of course, is a package that's going to help us read CSV files. If you work with spreadsheet software, such as uh, the ubiquitous Microsoft Excel, never save your files. If you're going to work with data, don't save your files as Excel spreadsheets. Save them as CSV files, comma separated value files. Makes it much easier to work uh, with those kind of files that have stripped away all the fancy things that have been added to the rendering of your cells inside of inside of 
Microsoft Excel or some other spreadsheet software. All you want is the actual data, not its representation as a percentage. If it was captured as a fraction, you want those values as a fraction. And then lastly, or second from last, we're going to use Query. That's a package to help us query language. And uh, that uh, is a very powerful, it's not uh, um, not only for the data frames package. I didn't mention the data frames package right in the beginning. That's going to allow us to work with the data that we've imported. But the query language on top of that is almost like a structured query language. It allows us to, to write queries to interrogate the data. And in the end, if we're going to do a chi-square test for independence, we've got to have some uh, contingency tables and the frequency tables or, or FREQ tables. It's going to allow us just to do those counts along contingency tables. So let's import that. So what I'm going to do here next is we're just going to make use of this journal article that you can see here. The link will be down below. You can read that link. The, the article itself used um, an organism in tablet form and randomized uh, some participants and had a look at the effect that would have on their cholesterol and specifically HDL cholesterol. They've got beautiful tables in that journal uh, paper. And we're just going to use the summary that they gave in those tables and just generate some data on our own. What, that's one of the beauties of a computer language. Of course, you can generate your own data. So this would not refer to real life data. This is data that we're going to simulate based on the summary statistics in those tables. So the first function that we're going to use, you see here, is random.seed. Open close parentheses because the seed is a function and I'm just passing uh, some integer that I decided on 12. You see the little exclamation mark there, that's the bang symbol. So random.seed bang. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the bang symbol a bit later. To seed the pseudorandom number generator means uh, all these random values that we are going to generate will be exactly the same if I run this code again. If you run this code, you're going to get exactly the same pseudo-random numbers as well. If we don't do that, of course, every time you run this, you're going to get different random numbers. So the first set of random numbers, let me just execute that. Shift enter, shift return. And now if I run these in order, of course, if I go back and rerun some of these, it'll be different numbers. But if I run these all in order, we should all get the same random values. So the first random function we're going to deal with is a built-in Julia function, rand. And it's going to take some arguments and return one or more random values. The first argument here is, it's, these are positional, so you've got to put them in order, is what to choose from. And this is a unit range, 30 colon 65. Because I don't put a default step size in the middle, so I could say 30 colon 2 colon 65 that's going to go up in steps of 2 if I don't put any step size it's just going to use 1 as a step size so from 30 to 65 that is a unit range it's going to select from those values how do I know that that's a unit range well let's go to the REPL here there is a type of function and if we were to say 30 to 65 It'll tell us what Julia sees that as. And it sees that as a unit range of 64-bit integers, just as we suspected. Back here to the comma, the next positional argument would be 46. I want 46 values back from this interval of 30 to 65. I want 46 values uh, back. The random is going to give us a uniform distribution with replacement. So if the age 35 was chosen once, it goes back into the pile and it can be chosen again. So just a uniform random distribution. Shift enter. And there we see we have a vector of 64-bit integers with 40, uh, 46 elements. If I twirl down on it, you can see a list of them there. 46. So in this paper, they had 46 participants. Uh, 23 in each arm, taking either the drug itself, which as I say were just some uh, organisms, or placebo. And we want uh, 46 of them, and we're just going to randomize from uniform random distribution, uh, uniform distribution, we're just going to take 46 uh, values. And we're storing that, assigning that, remember equal sign is an assignment operator, it assigns what is on the right side of it to whatever is on the left, and on the left 
we've generated a computer variable name, age, creating a space in our memory where this object on the right hand side is stored. I'm going to use snake case for my computer variable names. There you can see snake case. In other words, it's a word I came up with, computer variable, but the words have got these underscores in between them. Uh, it's commonly seen in Julia, although you can use, uh, I suppose, whatever convention you, you want, camel case, uh, it's really up to you. The next one I'm going to generate is gender, and here I'm going to use the sample function from the stats base package, and that's why I used importing, so I have to now write stats base dot sample. So my first argument is going to be an array, and it is an array because of the square brackets. An array is a list of elements, and the two elements I'm going to give it is female and male as strings, and in Julia, strings go inside of double quotation marks. You can also use single quotes, but that's only with a single letter, and then it's not a string. It's actually a character type, not a string type. So there we go. Now, in this paper, there was just a binary allocation of gender, so there was only female or male. Then, in the paper, 60% of participants were female and only 40% were male. So I'm going to add some weights to this random sampling. So statsbase.weights is my next function there, weights. And again, I'm passing an array of 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. Of course, that's got a sum to 1. And I want 46 of those. And it's a very expressive language because that's almost like an Eng English sentence that I've written there. Sample for me from this sample space containing two elements, female and male. Uh, sample with weights, so that 60% are female and 40% are male, um, or at every turn, that's that likelihood of being selected, there's a 60% uh, likelihood of choosing female and a 40% likelihood of choosing male, and I want 46 of them as well. So shift enter, shift return, and we see my vector here of strings this time, not 64 but integers, but strings, so let's tool that down, we say we see male, female, 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 male, and with only 46, of course, it's not going to be completely a 60-40 split. Um, 46 is a small number, but it's going to be in that order. Now, next up, I'm going to create the group, this computer variable called group, and now I'm going to use the repeat function. So for the repeat function, I'm going to pass again something to choose from, in other words, it's got to be an array, but this array only has one element, and I want it repeated 23 times. And you can guess at what's going to happen here. I'm going to have a vector of strings with 23 elements. And there we go, placebo, 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 placebo. So what I'm trying to simulate here is I'm just going to put the 46 patients or participants in uh, that took the placebo, and then I'm going to add 23 of them uh, that took the active ingredient. So how do I add to the end of an already existing vector or array? So you'll see it's called a vector here in Atom, but if you just ran it in the REPL here, it'll say array and not vector. But if we uh, just want to add to the end of that 23, another 23, I'm going to use the append bang function. So there's append, and now I'll tell you a little bit about the bang, because you get many functions with and without the bang. What the bang does, or what it does to this function, it makes the changes permanent. So I'm going to append to the end of these 23 placebo values, and I'm going to put that inside of the group computer variable, but the changes will be permanent. Sometimes you don't want those changes permanent, you only want them to happen with inside a for loop or inside of a function, but then you want the original back at the end without the permanent change. Yeah, I want a permanent change, append to the group variable, this repeater. So repeat active 23 times, and if I run this now, now suddenly my vector is 46 elements long. I've appended to the end of those placebos, those 23 placebos, I've added 23 actives. Great stuff. So let's uh, close these. There we go. The next one that we're going to go for is we're going to actually sample from a continuous distribution. So in the paper, they looked at a lot of variables. I'm not going to simulate all of them here, just a couple of them. 
So they looked at HDL cholesterol, a high-density lipoprotein. That's the good cholesterol before and after the intervention. So they told us in the paper what the, what the uh, mean and standard deviation was for uh, the sample values for those variables. Of course, we don't have access to them, but I'm just going to simulate them based on those parameters for the normal distribution. So I'm going to call my computer variable hdl underscore cholesterol underscore before. I'm going to use the rand function, but this time I'm going to not take a unit range. So I don't want this uniform distribution. I actually want the normal distribution with a mean of 1.24 and a standard deviation of 0.31. So that comes straight out the paper. So I'm saying use this distribution. So that's distributions dot normal. So if I said using distributions in the end, you, you could just have said normal. But because I said import distributions, we have to say distributions.normal. As I say, I'm doing this so that you can see where this normal function comes from. It doesn't just come from Julia or some other package. It comes from the distributions package. So it's all about just showing you about uh, 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 that fact. So distributions.normal from a mean, these are positional arguments. It's always going to be mean, comma, standard deviation. As I said, that comes from the paper, and I want 23 of those. So let's do that. And now we've got these 23 elements. And then I want to add another 23. So that was read from the table as far as the placebo group was concerned. Now I want to add from another distribution, according to the summary statistics in their table, uh, for the 23 participants who took the active ingredient. So what do I do? I'm going to append with a bang because I want that permanent. Append, append to HDL underscore cholesterol underscore before from this distribution with a mean of 1.24. And so that was exactly the same there. And 0.29 as far as the, as far as the standard deviation is concerned. So I'm going to add 23 values to that, which means I now have a 46 element vector of those values that we were interested in. So we've simulated that. So it's correct for all the two groups of participants. Then I'm going to do this a couple of more times. So I'm going to create an HDL cholesterol after. And again, I'm going to go th through the same thing, random from a normal distribution with a mean of 1.4, standard deviation of 0.35. And then I'm going to append to that some more. So you can have a look at that code. I'm going to run through it very quickly because it's just a repeat of what we've done before. So there's a wait before and a wait after. Diastolic blood pressure before, diastolic blood pressure uh, before, and diastolic blood pressure after. So I'm just going to run quickly through all of these. Just create them from the distribution as per the parameters in the table. So let me run through all of those. Done. So that would be one way to go about it. Let's just, just show you something else. And the reason why I'm doing that is just to show you how a for loop would work inside of Julia. So we have BMI underscore before, and I'm passing to that an empty array. And an empty array is just the two square brackets, open close square brackets, it's a vector. And now you see the type is any. The type here is any. Now I just want to stop there a little bit because I want to tell you just about the Julia type hierarchy. Everything is a type in Julia. So if I say what is the type? Of, so I'm typing in the REPL on the right hand side here. What is the type of just three? Well, it's a 64 bit integer. What is the type of three dot zero? So I'm just say three dot. Julia knows it's a zero. So if I enter that, we see it's a 64 bit float. And these are abstract types, and you can instantiate an abstract type. What that means is I can create a computer variable and I can assign three to it. That would be an instance of a 64-bit floating type. If I asked what the type of, and let's make uh, 3, comma 3, but I'm passing these inside of square brackets, so that is actually an array. And if we look at that, indeed, on this side it'll say array, on in the IDE it'll call it a vector, same thing. So it's an array of 64-bit integers, and it's a rank 1 tensor. In other words, it is, in mathematical speak, it is a real column vector. And um, again, the 64-bit integers for us here, or the array that we see here, that is a concrete type. I can create an instance of that type. 
but I can also look up the hierarchy. So let's see what the super type is. Super type is my function. What is the super type of array? Well, in this instance, it has a super type of a dense array. Let's go up and say, what is the super type of dense array? Well, that's an abstract array. Okay, let's go further up. Let's see what the super type then is of an abstract array. And that's any. So any is right at the top of right at the top of uh, this type hierarchy. And it's like a bran branch is going down on all sides. You get all sorts of types. So any will have many, 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 many types. But I can look at all the subtypes, for instance. What are the subtypes of, uh, let's make it number. So number is somewhere up a different uh, branch of the trees. So let's look at the subtypes of number. And we see it has two subtypes complex and real so complex is actually uh, an app, uh, a concrete type in other words i can create an instance of complex real on the other hand continues to branch out so i cannot make i can't instantiate real i've got to go all the way down to say integer or float 64 down that hierarchy tree and if you're interested in that google it it'll give you you'll quickly find this whole tree structure Anyway, back to our for loop, which is what I wanted to show you. So for i equals 1 to 46. Again, remember, that would be a unit range. So I just put in 1 to 46. And it's going to go from 1, 2, 3, loop through all those values because I didn't put a step size. So I could have said something like this. That would, uh, that would have jumped 1 to 3 to 5, etc. But if I don't put anything there, it'll be exactly the same as doing this. I'm just going to go from 1 to 46 and I'm doing steps of 1. So 1 to 46, do the following. When you're at the end of the line there and you hit return or enter, it's going to create this blank space for you. And uh, that uh, helps us here with seeing what the flow is going to be. A for loop is always ended with an end. So you've always got to have the end there. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to create two random numbers and the first one is going to be stored in placebo underscore bmi underscore before and the next one is going to be stored in active underscore bmi underscore before and what are these two values well both of them are the rand function both come from a normal distribution but you see there's slight difference in the mean and standard deviation from which those are going to be selected and i haven't said comma, I want five of them. No, 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 I just leave that blank because I just want a single one of them. So just give me one random value back from that distribution, store that in this placebo computer variable, give me a random value from this normal distribution, store that there. So I've got these two values now, while i is still one, and I'm going to use the push bang function. And I'm going to push to bmi underscore before. And there's bmi underscore before, it's empty at the moment. But now I'm going to push a single value to it. What am I going to pass to it? Well, that comes after the comma. And what I want to do is to assign based on what is inside of group. So let's have a look at group again. I'm just going to show you here on the right hand side. So there's group and you can see it's the 23 placebos and then 23 active. But I can index that. I can say what is group, what is in position number 4. Seeing that this is just a column vector. This is going to go from 1 to 46. Of course that was going to be placebo. So instead of giving it a number specifically what is inside number 4. I'm saying what is inside number i. Because every time we loop through this i was going to be 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, etc. Until 46. So it's going to iterate through all of them. And now it says... Is this equal equal to placebo? Double equal sign is a Boolean question. It's going to return a true or false. So is the one I'm looking at at the moment. So let's just look at what group one. We all know what group one is. It's going to say placebo. If this is placebo, then you see a little question mark. And then give me back the placebo value that was stored there. Else, after the colon, give me the active value back. And that means I can assign based on what is inside that group value. 
and what we see here is called a ternary operator let me do this for you here so we can say 2 is less than 5 and then question mark you've got to put these spaces so yes and it's not a comma but a colon no and those are strings you can put in anything you like of course it is if we now say 2 is greater than or equal to 5 and then yes yes and you've got to have those spaces there no of course we're going to get back no so it's just a very shortened version of an if else statement in case you were wondering so that's all we're doing here he's saying we read that value and then we're going to assign one of those two values based on what we see in the group value we're going to push that into this bmi so let's do that and now if we have bmi bmi before i'm going to get taken from the right distribution for all of those 46 values and then we're going to run through the same for loop there now i've just created a bunch of random values random variables there we've got our data point values now we're going to store them inside of a data frame so i told you about the data frames package that's an excellent package just to work with data so if you're going to import a csv file comma separated value files you're going to use csv.read and then it's going to be stored as a data frame if you're familiar with r that would be like r data frames or in python that would be like pandas so oh, I see an open there, open and close set of parentheses there. So these are all arguments that I'm passing to the data frame function. And what we can do there is give a, a name of our variable. So think about it in a spreadsheet file. It will be row number one, all the column headers. And look at them here. They are just passed as normal words without spaces in between or other illegal characters. But they're not strings. I'm not passing them in as strings. Just like that so i'm going to have id here i'm going to use the range function from one comma stop equals 46 so it's going to go from 1 to 46 that's another way to create this iterator age with an uppercase a that's going to be my variable name inside my statistical variable name inside my data frame i'm passing that the age computer variable and i go all along all these ones that we've created except here for cholesterol hdl cholesterol delta and to that i'm going to assign an operation i'm going to do on two of these variables that we have created we've created hdl underscore cholesterol underscore before and we've created hdl underscore cholesterol underscore after and i want this column to be the difference between those two hence the name i've chosen and all i'm going to do i'm going to do element wise subtraction Remember, this one has 46 elements in it. This one has 46 elements in it. And I want to do element-wise subtraction. In Julia, that means the minus sign. But we have to put this dot in front. So dot minus. And that indicates uh, in Julia that we want element-wise operation. So take those pairs of values, subtract them from each other. And then we see all the others. You see I've done a weight delta as well. So dot minus. So the difference between those two vectors element-wise. And you see for BMI, I didn't create a delta because I'm going to show you how to do that uh, just with code. So shift enter, shift return. And now we have a data frame. We can see a 46 by 15. So 46 subjects there across 15 variables. And there's not enough space. So it's going to emit some of them. But there's my data frame. And you can see it is like a spreadsheet file. There I have my column headers, row, ID, age, gender, group, HTL before, etc. But just below that, Julia tells us what the type is of these elements. So what is the type of this? Well, there's 64-bit integers here, another 64-bit integers, and then strings, strings, 64-bit floats. Now, sometimes you want to deal with these things not as, not as strings, but as categorical variables. And there's a data frames dot categorical bang function and if i pass it the data frame and then the column header and it's going to change that permanently because this is a bang from a string into a categorical type and what you have to notice here is this colon in front of group data frames allow us to use the group name the, the column names 
as symbols and that is a symbol once there is this colon in front that's a symbol and that is the notation that we're going to use when we want to refer to the columns inside of a data frame so remember that we've got to use the that symbol notation so i'm just changing the group and the gender i'm going to change them to if we have a look at them now you'll see gender is now a categorical type not a string type anymore and there are advantages to that Next up, I'm going to show you how we get access to only certain parts of the data. Because if you start analyzing data, you don't want to see all the data in the data frame. You want to narrow it down, looking at something specific. So I'm going to start off with by just looking at the ways to slice a data frame. So remember when we said group, when we had group, we just looked at the first value in there. And that was placebo. But indexing... I used index notation here and that's inside of square brackets that's exactly what we're going to do here but here with the data frames we have rows and columns it is a you can think about of it as a rank 2 tensor we have rows and columns not only values down a single column so we've got to refer to as you do with a spreadsheet file give the cells row and column address so here we're going to use a unit range, 1 to 3, so that's going to give me 1 and 2 and 3, so rows 1, rows 2, rows 3, comma. This here, if I just use the colon symbol, that shorthand for give me all of the columns. So rows 1, 2 and 3, all the columns please. So let's have a look at that. I get indeed 3 rows across all 15 of the columns. So only the first 3 rows there across all the columns. Now, let's just ask for a single column. So still rows 1, 2, and 3, but only of the age column, please. And look, again, I'm using symbol notation. So there we go. Unit, it's a vector of 64-bit integers, and there's only three elements in it because we've only asked for three elements. If I want to use more than one column, I've got to pass them as an array. So they're going to go inside of square brackets. And I want the group column and the age column still only rows one to three so let's do that now i have a three by two data frame object and i have the group and the age as i've asked for in that order and i see the first three rows for those what if i only want rows one and three not one two three so i've got to put that inside of square brackets because this becomes an array an array of rows only one row one only one row three comma an array of all the columns that I want and now I'm just going to get this two by two uh, data frame only rows one and rows three and only for those two columns now if I want to see uh, all of the remember I said up here we use colon as our shorthand for give me all just make a note of it's becoming more prevalent just to use the exclamation mark when you want to refer to all the rows. So the data frame object, give me all the rows and then just the age column. And I'm asking a Boolean question there. Would that be the same as using this notation? Am I going to get back exactly the same thing? And the answer is true. So I could use either of those two notations. Now we're going to pass a rule. We only want the data frame back, all the columns, but... So we're going to see all the columns, but go down the age column and only return those that have an age of more than 50. So how do we go about that? So I want to see the whole data frame with all my variables, but I only want to see it for participants who are older than 50 years of age. So this is what we're going to do. We have this very nice dot notation. So if I say df.age, let's do that here in the REPL, df.age. And now it's just going to give me back this 46 element array or a vector of these 46 values. So df.age, it's a shorthand. Otherwise, I could have written df uh, like we've done up here. And here I would say give me all the rows only of the age. Exactly the same thing. But shorthand, I can just refer to it as df.age. It's just going to give me back this array. And you can see there the return is not a data frame. It is an array that we get back. So go down each of them and see if they're greater than 50. So the dot greater than again, that means it's going to go element wise. So it goes down every one. Is it more than 50? False. It's not more than 50, this first one. That row is now not included. 
Next one, 35, it's not more than 50, it's not included. And let's go down now, and this would be the first row that gets included because this participant was older than 50. Comma, all the columns. So that's very nice notation, and you see we're down to 18 participants now. And if we go down the age column, they're all going to be older than 50. Simple as that. Now maybe I want to string more of these together. Now I only want participants that were older than 50 and they were in the placebo group. So how are we going to go about this? Again, it's my data frame. Rows, comma, columns. So there's my comma. I want all the columns there, but let's look at what rows I want. Well, I'm going to put these inside of parentheses. So I've got these two rules that I want. So I want df.age dot greater than, so element-wise, 50, dot end, and that's the symbol for and. So both of these have got to be true before we get a true back. So we just have normal logic here. So it is dot and, and we want the df.group to be dot equals equals placebo. So row by row, and all these things have to be true before we, uh, we get uh, that row included. Now we're down to 10. And they are all going to be over 50, and they're all going to be in the placebo group. So you can see how easy it is just to manipulate the data to get uh, something very specific back. That means I can also create new data frames, sub data frames from the full set. So I'm going to call mine placebo and intervention. And I want to split the participants up into two very separate data frames. Very easy to do. Call the data frame, address the rows by df.group dot equals equals placebo, comma, all the columns. So in this new data frame, it only has 23 participants in it, but they're all going to be in the placebo as far as the group is concerned. And I'm going to do the same. I'm going to call that one intervention. And of course, in the group, it's only going to be the active participants taking the active uh, intervention. I promised to show you that I had to do this with a data frames code, I should have said, uh, this difference between. So if you want to create a new column, I have to create it this way. So there's df, square bracket notation, and then by symbol name. So if we scroll back up, when I created this data frame, I did not use symbol notation here, but when I want to add a new column, I use symbol notation. So create this new column, and that is going to be the difference the element-wise difference between these two arrays. And the first array is df underscore bmi before, dot minus, to indicate that it's element-wise, df dot bmi after. So that is going to allow me to have this new column in my data frame. We see that I now have 16 columns. Now I want to show you a little bit about the query language. What I want to show you actually is just that it exists because it is phenomenal and it is vast. For you to start taking or selecting and changing, manipulating only a part of your data. So I'm going to show you just a couple of examples here, but that is many, many, many lectures worth of uh, things you can do. So I'm going to start with my data frame and then I have this pipe operator. So that will just be the up, down stroke on your keyboard or my keyboard that's above my enter. So I hit shift and the key above. It'll be different for your keyboard, I'm sure. And that says take data frame and pipe it into what comes next. And here I'm using, um, I suppose, the generic form of the query package. So I'm going to start a query and we're using a macro here. So in Julia, it makes use of macros like this. And what a macro would do, a macro actually generates code. So instead of us writing out the long code, the macros, we can create macros that actually generate code and then that code gets executed. So it's a very nice way to, to write the succinct, uh, just a sort of a function there, a macro that'll generate code and do something for us. But this is built, this at query macro is built into the query package. So I'm going to say, do, um, what, what query do I want to, want to have? So I'm going to create this variable called i. Now it's another thing we haven't spoken about, and that's local variables and global variables. Let's do that. Here, I've created a variable name, and I've assigned some object to it. This placebo exists in a global space in the global space. In other words, I can make use of it any time. It exists and its value exists everywhere. Inside of a for loop, as we did before, 
we created some computer variables, but those only will have a local scope. Outside of that for loop, they don't exist and I can't refer to them again. They're not permanent. They're not in the global scope. So here we have query i and then begin. And to every beginning, there's an end here. And then I'm going to use other macros. At where i dot age is greater than 50. So what's happening here? This pipe operator piped df into this query. And it was put into this query right there with an i. So I'm piping df into i. So when I say i.age, I'm actually saying df.age. It's just being piped into this i here. So where the age is greater than 50, then at select, and I'm passing these inside of a set of curly braces, i.hdl cholesterol before and i.hdl cholesterol after. So it's going to select only those two columns for only participants older than 40, and then end my begin, then my end, close my query parentheses there, and pipe that into something, and I want that to be piped into a data frame object. But because we only used import data frames, I've got to say data frame dot da data frames dot data frame. So if I run all of that, lo and behold, I get this back. Only those two columns that I asked for, so df.hdl cholesterol before and hdl cholesterol after, and it's only going to be for people who were older than 50. So this is just a quick look at what the query language can do for you. Now I could have done that much simpler before, but this complexity allows me to become very specific, and there are more macros than just these. Before I get to the next macro, I just want to show you this. Many times when we collect data, we try to protect patient confidentiality. And in a very simple example, what we might do as researchers beforehand, we're going to just subtract in our heads two. So for instance, this is the value two from everyone's age. So if someone was really 50, I'm going to capture 48 as the age. No one outside of the study knows that, so if someone got hold of that data, it's uh, just a little bit more difficult to, to bring that back to an actual human being. So that's a very simplified example. That won't really, it won't work in the real world. You'll, you'll have to be much more inventive than that. And there are ways to do this. But if I want to change something permanently, so df.age, I'm now saying assign that to df.age dot plus two. So that's going to add two to everyone's age. And if you capture data in that way, where you changed it before you analyze the data, of course, you want to change that back. So that would just be the way to do that. <clears throat> Here we are back uh, with the query uh, uh, package. So I'm going to pipe data frame into this at filter macro. And we've done this one before. I only want the ages back and whether on the placebo group this would be the way to do that we saw that before but this is the way to do it with query so pipe df into this and instead of i we have this underscore here so df is going to go in place of those underscore but i'm using at filter so i want ages greater than 50 and group equal to placebo note the differences though there's no at before that and i'm using the double ampersand and then so you've got to read the notation on the query package, and I'm piping that into a data frame. So what we're going to get back is this data frame of all the columns, but we're only going to have participants older than 50 again, and only in the placebo group. One more way just to use the query, I just wanted to show you that. I'm going to pipe df into the at group. So I want to group by df.group, because this df was piped into this placeholder and then the at map query and I want two column headers my first one is going to be called key and my second one is going to be called count and to the key I want the key function inside of query and you'll see uh, in just a little in a while what that means and then in the count column I want length length is a Julia function and that is going to just count how many things uh, there are so let's have a look at what happened here. So I've created a data frame because I piped this all into a data frame. 
and I have two columns. One is called key. That was my selection there. And one is called count there. Key, this key function, what it did to this, this placeholder, because this was all piped. So let's just look at this piping. DF was piped into the group by. So this now becomes df.group. df.group, that got piped into all of this. So this is now df.group. So it's key of df.group. And that's what pipe, we've got beautiful versions of that in our programming language for statistical analysis. Same sort of thing. You have, you build this pipeline of execution. So this df was piped into this placeholder. Now the whole lot was placed piped into this placeholder. So this becomes df.group. And the key of that is going to return for you the sample space elements. What are all the unique elements that were found in that column? So in the group, in the df.group column, there was only two sample space elements, placebo and active. And that's what it's going to give me back. But in the second one, I want to count how many times it occurred. So this is a way to count the occurrences of your sample space elements of a variable. And there we can see we had 23 with placebo and 23 with active exactly as we designed it. Great. Let's do some summary statistics. The describe function is very, very useful. So it comes from the stats base package. So if you just see describe there, you wouldn't know where it comes from, but I said import stats base. So I've got to say stats base dot describe. And what I want to describe is from the DF data frame. Take all the rows for me in the age column. Remember, there are different ways to write this. You could have just said df.age. Anyway, let's execute this. And the result is just a tick mark because it's executed here in the REPL. So it says there were 46 values. There were no missing values. The mean was 46.93. The minimum, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum value. They were all there and they were all 64-bit integers. So a nice descriptive statistics here of that column. There's also the summary stats, the summary stats function. It's going to do exactly the same, but it's going to return it for me here in the REPL, so I can tool down and see those results here. And then the statistics package, that is one of the built-in Julia packages. You don't have to install that. Remember how to install. Go here, right square bracket, type add space and add what you want to add and then imported with import or using. So statistics.median. So that's just going to give me back the same value as we had before the 48. There's the median there. It was 48 indeed, no problem. What One thing you won't see here is the standard deviation, but there's a statistics.std that gives you back the sample standard deviation. And if you read the uh, documentation there, you can also uh, ask for the population standard deviation. It has a mean and standard deviation, mean underscore and underscore std. That's a function inside of stats base. And that's going to give me back a tuple. A tuple is different from an array. Instead of square brackets, we, use, we see parentheses. And by the way, tuples are immutable. So you can't change their values as you can with arrays. But that's a story for a different day. We get back the mean and the standard deviation. Variance, of course, is just dot .var. Again, there is a, another argument that you can pass that gives you back the population variance. This would be the sample variance. There's a statistics.quantile function, and you can ask for what percentiles you actually want. I want the 25th and the 75th. That gives me the first and the third quartile values. And you can see for age, those are the ones we saw there, 40 and 55. In stats base, not inside of statistics, but inside of stats base, there's an IQR that is going to give us the interquartile range. But I can also do that with code. Let me just go to the front of this. I can say statistics.quantile the 75th minus statistics.quantile the 25th. And if I execute that, I'm also going to get back 15 because that's what the interquartile range is, the difference between the third and the first uh, quartile. Span, statspace.span, that's going to give you the full range, so the minimum and the maximum value. And remember, initially we chose it from 30 to 65, but we added two to each, uh, one of the participants' age. So now we see the youngest was 32, the oldest was 67. Now this is a bit of a convoluted one I want to show you here in the describe function. 
what if you don't want everything back? So I'm saying here df, all the rows, comma, only these columns. But this describe function can take back, uh, can take as arguments some things that we want to create. What do we want to create? Well, that comes after the next comma. Create a symbol for me. That's a column header with a name AVE. And attached to that, and we have to use this arrow notation, so that's equal greater than state space dot mean, another symbol, std, and attached to that state space dot std. So that becomes quite convoluted and uh, it uh, takes a, a while for you to, to get um, behind what is uh, exactly how to do that and remember how to do that. But that gave me the age and the cholesterol delta. And it gave me the average of each of those and the standard deviation for each of those. So that would be another way to go about this. And what you can start to see here, what's developing here, is the fact that there are just so many ways to do things in Julia. There's the unique function in Julia. And I'm telling it, go down the group column, all, all the ones, and just give me back what is unique. Well, we know it's going to be placebo and active. So we're going to get back just the sample space elements. I could do it with query language. Also, I could say pipe df into the add group by. So this is going to become df.group. Pipe that into this map at map macro. And all I want is a key. And pipe that into a data frame. And now I'm going to get exactly this, what I got back here with a unique. Instead of getting back just an array, I actually piped this into a data frame. So I'm going to get my sample space elements there. There's a statspace.countMap function. So not only is it going to give me back the unique values, but it's also going to count how many there are. And again, I see active and placebo, but I can also do this just with a query language. So I'm piping df into group by. So df.group, that gets piped into the map. The key, so df.group, the key of that. So that's the sample space elements, and the length is going to count all of them. And you know exactly what we're going to get here. This is we had before. We're going to get placebo and active and their counts. So, so many ways. Whatever pleases you, you choose uh, that way. Um, one more thing. Let's do the median. And we do only of people who are older than participants, older than 50 in the placebo group. And then I can use another set of ind indices here. And that is only give me back the median of the ages then. So what we've done here is the median of the age of participants in the placebo group that were older than 40, uh, the older than 50. So this is a different notation to do this first and then what you actually want. So hang on to that notation. It is sometimes uh, easier to use. Sometimes it's much easier just to use uh, some of these macros inside of the query language. We can construct our own functions, and that's one of the beautiful things of Julia. Construct your own function. So I see you've the function keyword there. Tell Julia I want to create a function. The name of my function, I decided on that, and it's going to take a single positional argument, x. And it's going to return for me the following. Statistics.mean of whatever I pass in, comma, statistics.std of whatever I pass in. End, we always have to have an end, and now I have a new function, mean and standard deviation. As you can see here, it is a new function. And now I'm going to pass an array to it, df.age, into that function. And so that takes the place of all the x's, so I'm getting back the mean and the standard deviation of that. So you can create your own functions too. Let's do this last one before we visualize data. I'm going to group by group. I'm going to map the key and then uh, create two column headers, average age and standard, uh, standard deviation age. And I'm going to perform those two on it. You can see what is going to be in that placeholder because DF is going to be piped into there. Then that makes a DF.group that gets piped into there, which is also piped into there and there. I think by now you get uh, get the meaning of how to write these pipelines. So I'm going to get placebo and active back, and that gives me the average age and the standard deviation of the age for those two groups. Very easy to start learning how to put these together. Now let's get back 
uh, let's get to one of the exciting parts. We've summarized our data and we've really summarized uh, it a lot. Uh, we've created a lot of other variables, so please play with them and see what results you can get. That's the only way to learn is to start playing with these. So getfly, there are other plotting libraries as well. I'm going to show you getfly here. I like the way the plots look. And it's very simple, specifically if you know how to use ggplot. So getfly.sit, default plot size. I'm just going to set it for argument's sake here to fit in here to 800 pixels by 600 pixels. So here's a very simple plot. Remember I said using getfly, so I needn't have said getfly.sit or getfly.plot. I can just use the plot function directly. Now getfly, well, I like getfly, it works very well with data frames. So my first argument is this data frame. It's the data frame we're passing. On the x-axis, I want the group variable. On the y-axis, I want the age. And what geometry do I want? Well, geom.boxplot. So I actually want uh, Julia here to create a box plot for me. There's a couple of guides. One of them is title. So guide.title. Give it a title as a string. And then you can also do a theme. So my theme here is going to be has have a default color, midnight blue. There's a bunch of these already built in. You can uh, Google that and see all the uh, theme colors that are built in. And I want to also just make 100 pixels in between my box plots. As simple as that. I'm going to hit shift and enter, shift and return. And I'm going to go make a cup of coffee. Because the first time you create a plot, there's a lot of stuff that have to happen behind the scenes. It has been recognized that this is a bit too long. And there's certainly a, a lot of work going on behind the scenes in trying to Im improve this time to first plot in Julia. It is a known problem. You do wait quite a long time before that first plot is created. So I'm going to go off and have some coffee. I don't know what you're going to have. I'll see you back in a minute or two. And there we go. It really wasn't a minute. In my case, it was about 10 seconds. It was slightly less than 10 seconds, so uh, it's not that bad. Anyway, that is from the time I stopped talking, by the way. And there we go. I see a beautiful box plot. I see my age on my y-axis. I see the two groups. It found placebo and active all on its own. And we see the title that we created up there, and we see these beautifully rendered midnight blue uh, box plots. Very nice indeed. You can assign that to a computer variable because you do get packages and you do get the draw function which can save this plot that you've assigned to P, save it to your hard drive as a PNG file, SVG file. Now you might have to import uh, some other libraries. I think with PNG you'll have to import Cairo, C-A-I-R-O, uppercase C package to export to PNG. Otherwise you can just export to SVG, scalable vector graphics. And those are very nice to use in other programs like um, Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator, etc. to add a lot more to your plots. So yeah, I'm going to use plot again. Pass the DF, I'm going to have on my x-axis the change in cholesterol, uh, color by the group. Now this color has nothing to do with color. The color argument here means split by, so group by. The group column, whatever the sample space elements you find there, give me a geom.density. So this is going to be a density plot of the changing cholesterol before and after the intervention split by the group variable. And then I've just added a title. So let's have a look at that. And there we see a beautiful density estimate of the placebo and the active group as far as the change in their cholesterol values were concerned. So if we look at the, uh, the these two the two distributions for our, our data values. So beautiful density plots there. You can also just ask for plots that are models. Look at this data frame. X axis is BMI before, Y axis is HDL cholesterol after. So this is going to be a scatter plot. And indeed, I'm calling geom.point. That gives me point markers. So this is a scatter plot of a, two continuous uh, random variables, BMI before and HDL cholesterol after. So I'm trying to predict HDL cholesterol after given an input of BMI before. And I want that done separately for each of my sample space elements in my group column. So color equals symbol group. gm.point. And then in the layer argument, I'm going to call the stat.smooth function inside of getfly. 
I want it to be a simple linear model and I want a 95% confidence interval around my model. And that's going to be a geom.line and the ribbon uh, is the confidence intervals uh, around that. Then outside of that I've got a title and a theme. And in my theme I'm passing a bit of transparency and I'm making the point size, the markers of the scatter plot quite, quite big with 10 pixels. Let's have a look at the output of this beautiful plot. It's going to take a second or two again because it's now also creating this linear model behind the scenes. So I'm not even using a package that does linear modeling. They exist too, GLM being a beautiful example of that. But just inside of this plotting package, GetFly, I can do this. And there I can see my two models, both for the placebo and the active group. I see my markers with a bit of transparency. And I see my two linear models uh, created with a confidence interval around those. That is absolutely fantastic. And those plots are, are really beautiful. Let's do some inferential statistics. Now with inferential statistics, we always start off by describing our data. Now we've already done that. And the one that I'm going to concentrate on here is just to see what's the a difference in HDL cholesterol before, uh, from the difference mean before and after, but between the two groups. So I've just, we've just got the subtraction of what the before minus after. That gives me one variable. And I've got that same variable split along one of my categorical variables, which is the group. So I'm just asking a question. Is there a statistically significant difference in the change in cholesterol? So my null hypothesis is that there is no difference between those two. And my alternate hypothesis is that there is a change between the two. So one can be higher than the other. And I'm using an alpha value of 0.05. So there's my hypothesis. So let's just describe the placebo group. Remember, we created these two sub data frames. Let's just go back to the REPL to see the results. I'm describing HDL cholesterol for my placebo data frame. So that's another way to go about it. You needn't use the query to uh, select these. Just create two sub data frames, one for each of your groups. And that's what we did in the beginning. So I have my placebo and my intervention group. And there we can see summary statistics. The mean of the difference was negative 0.1 for the uh, placebo group and negative 0.22 there for the, so there was a bigger decrease in the HDL cholesterol uh, in the time period before and after the intervention. We can also just ask for the following. So I'm asking for confidence intervals. So that comes from the hypothesis tests function uh, package. There's a conf int function and what i'm going to do is call the one sample t-test function also from hypothesis tests on each of my two each of my two data sets the hdl cholesterol delta for each of my two groups so i've got the mean and i can work out the standard deviation but here we have the 95 percent confidence interval around the means for both of these so very simple for us to use hypothesis tests just for confidence intervals I've already plotted these two distributions for you. So let's just have a look at our assumptions for the use of parametric tests. So in hypothesis tests, there is a p-value function. And what I want to do, uh, it does not have a Shapiro-Wilk test, but it has kolmogorov smirnov and I think a few others. So I'm just going to use KS test here. So exact one sample KS test. And I'm passing my cholesterol delta for the placebo group and against a normal distribution. So that's a KS test uh, against a normal distribution. So let's do that. It's going to give me back a p-value. So the null hypothesis, remember, is that it is from a population in which this variable is normally distributed. And let's do the same for my second group. Uh, and there we have a problem. We see that a p-value of, of less than a chosen alpha value of 0.05. So we're not really uh, there meeting the assumptions for the use of a parametric test. I can investigate that visually by QQ plot. So let's just have a look at this. I'm creating two plots, P1 and P2. And each of these are going to be a QQ plot. So on the x-axis, I have the values. And on the y-axis, we have the theoretical distribution there. So I'm calling distributions.normal. And it's all going to be changed by this stat.qq. So it knows what to do, what to do with the values for a QQ plot, and then geom dot point. So it's it's a scatter plot, and then a semicolon because I don't want any output to the screen. I'm going to do that same for the intervention group, 
And then we're going to call getfly.vstack. So I could also just say vstack because we, imp uh, we said using getfly. So vstack plot one and plot two. So make a vertical stack of those two plots. And then the plots, I can see a vertical stack of these two QQ plots. And you can see here for the second one, that's really off of uh, a straight line there for, for normal. So we're not really meeting the assumptions for the use of parametric tests. And although this data was, rem was taken from the normal distribution when we created this, we only took 23 points from each. So there's always the, the chance that we get random values that uh, are not going to show up to be from a normal distribution. So in that case, for uh, two groups, a non-parametric test will be the Mann-Whitney U test. And of course, there is a Mann-Whitney U test there. I'm just passing my two data sets, my placebos uh, change in cholesterol and my intervention change in cholesterol using the dot notation. So it's going to give me two arrays. That's what we like with the man with new test. And I want a p-value back from there. So let's have a look at the man with new test. Gives me a p-value of 0 0.7 there. So that is uh, above my, my alpha value of 0 0.5. So we, we can't reject the null hypothesis there. Just to show you that we also have an equal variance t-test. So if we did meet the assumptions for the use of a parametric test, there we see equal variance t-test as another function, and we can run that, but we're going to see uh, a p-value, and uh, that is also above 0.05. So no problems there. The last thing on today's list, I'm going to show you just how to do a chi-square test for independence. There is no such function in the hypothesis test data or any of the packages of yet, so we're going to do this by hand. So I hope you know the equation for working out a chi-square value. We're just going to sum over the square differences between the observed and an expected contingency table and then uh, divide that by the expected values and uh, that gives us our chi-square value and then we're just going to use a chi-square distribution uh, as far as the uh, degrees of freedom are concerned. So let's create a frequency table, uh, a contingency table of observed values and what we're going to use is the freq tables function uh, package dot freq table frequency table function there and what i want is the data frames and i want group against gender those are two categorical variables remember we changed them to categorical variables but i what i want back is not a data frame i want it to be converted to a straight up array so i'm going to use the convert function change to array the following thing for me this frequency table and i'm going to store that in in uh, gg underscore obs that's my my contingency table of observed values. And what we get back is this 2x2 two two array of my observed values. And that's what you want for your, uh, for your chi-square test for independence. And you can see it's 64-bit integers, but I have two dimensions now. In other words, there's rows and columns. This is a rank 2 tensor or a matrix. And that's exactly what we want. Now I want to know from this the row totals and the columns totals. So the this first column will have a total at the bottom here. 16 plus 14 is, um, is 30. And 9 and 7 is going to give me 16. But then I want across the two columns for each row as well. So I want both the row totals and the column totals. I'm going to use the sum function. I pass my matrix, but I say long dimension 1. So let's see what that gives us back. That's going to give us back the 30 and the 16. So that's adding 16 and 14 and adding 7 and 9. But if I say dims equals 2, it's going to give me across the uh, 23 and 23. So 16 and 7 is 23, and 14 and 9 is 23. So I have the row so totals and the column totals. I need those. And I need the sum total as well. And remember, there were 46 participants, so no problem there. Now, I just want to know the size. There's another function we haven't seen before. What is the size of this array? And that's going to give me back a tuple of how many rows, comma, how many columns. And if I had a higher rank tensor, I would have more elements there. But it's a two by two array that we're passing to that. So now I'm just going to instantiate an empty array of similar shape. So a two by two array, and they're all just going to have zero values in it. So I want the number of rows. What's this gg dim its first value 2 and gg underscore dim its second value there. So if I had more than two sample space elements in each of those, group and gender, it was just male and female and active and placebo group. So there was always going to be a 2 by 2 contingency table. But if I had more, 
um, and these were different 3 comma 4 for instance um, I would just still reference these two by now I could have just put by hand 2 comma 2 but I want to show you where that comes from this gives me this array of all zeros I'm just instantiating that because I want to overwrite each of these values and I'm going to overwrite that with a double for loop so I'm saying for i equals 1 to gg underscore dim 1 so that means 2 so for i equals 1 to 2 and then for j equals 1 to 2 as well because I want to I want to iterate through all these four values row 1 column 1 row 1 column 2 row 2 column 1 row 2 uh, column 2 I want to overwrite all of those and remember how do I get that first one well that is this row total multiplied by this column total here divided by the sum total and that's what we're doing there so I'm overwriting at the moment i is 1 and j is 1 so I'm overwriting gg uh, ex, uh, expected which is just this four zeros so I'm now in position 1 what do I do well I take that columns total 1 times the row total 1 divided by the total 46 and that gives me that first value now I'm going to iterate over the inner for loop so j becomes 2 so that's the second column so we now at that one there I'm still in the first row so now we're looking at this value up here divided by the total and that's going to give me that value now we're through this j loop so we jump out to the for loop and i goes from 1 to 2 now it's 2 and now we're going to go again it's back to column 1 row 2 and then column 2 row 2 so that's with a double for loop I'm going to iterate through all those values and if we look at the table now we see our expected table and that's what we would expect given our values versus our observed values and we want to know is there a difference how do we do that remember it is observed minus expected but I do that element wise so it's dot minus dot square all of those differences individually so dot and to the power 2 that's to the power 2 and then each of those I divide by the expected the the respected expected value and in the end I sum over all of those and that's how I get chi square and look at the beauty of Julia you see the chi symbol there well we can actually use Unicode so I can say backslash alpha and hit tab and it gives me an alpha symbol or backslash beta so it is like LaTeX so I hit tab and I get the beta symbol and I can assign that to and that that's a variable name so chi2 there that's a variable name look at that backslash colon smile so you can uh, put all of these uh, little icons you can also use for uh, computer variable names uh, it's just a little whimsy that exists there inside of Julia and anyways that's my chi squared value and there we go it's 0.38 is that uh, is that significant so is there dependence between those two well I'm going to use from the distributions package this time the PDF probability density function I'm going to use a chi squared distribution with a degrees of freedom of 1 remember that is the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1 so it's 2 minus 1 is 1 times 1 is 1 so it's a single degree of freedom and I pass the x square value to that and that's going to give me a p value and no behold it is more than an alpha value of 0 0.05 so there's no dependence between those um, people did not land up in one of the two groups that was totally independent of the gender that they were so we have a chi square test there uh, done by hand very easy very quick very simple to do are, are for loops slow no they're not slow so you needn't vectorize your code to get speed in Julia because remember this is going to be compiled before it gets executed and when a for loop is compiled it's very quick so no problems there whatsoever so that was a brief introduction just to Julia by way of showcasing some medical statistics some this uh, simple medical statistics this has been an update from the video that I uploaded in 2015 that still used Julia 0.4 and there were certainly lots of breaking changes when we got to Julia 1. Julia is now mature, we had version 1.4 and it really just is a pleasure to use right inside here of Atom. Now you needn't use it inside of Atom, you can also uh, use it inside of Visual Studio Code that is becoming uh, more prevalent and of course 
iJulia comes with Julia Computing, but you can also install iJulia. Let me just show you here. So I would go uh, on this side and say add iJulia, uh, execute that, and then we can just say using iJulia. And once we say that, we can just call the notebook as a function, notebook open close parentheses, and that's going to open a Jupyter notebook for us. So iJulia is going to install uh, uh, all its dependencies. Uh, well, I should actually just put that in uppercase. That's the correct one, iJulia, the I in the JR uppercase. And you can use Julia Notebooks. So you can code right here inside of uh, Atom. You can code inside of Visual Studio Code. Or you can code right inside of Jupyter Notebooks, whatever your preference is. So Atom comes with Jupyter Computing. Uh, I should say Julia Computing. When you install Julia Computing, you're going to get this as your standard, your default IDE. And it really is a lovely IDE to code in. I hope you enjoyed that video. Like, subscribe, and comment. If something wasn't clear, let me know. I can uh, perhaps spend some more time and explain that. Otherwise, spread the word. It is really easy language to use, beautiful, a lot of speed. Of course, with the size of data sets that we commonly work with in uh, inferential statistics when it comes to medicine, we don't really need that speed, but it's just such a lovely language to to use and learn uh, that uh, I don't see uh, any reason why you shouldn't spend uh, a couple of days and weeks to get yourself familiar with this, with this uh, lovely language. If you know, you know that I'm a junkie when it comes to data visualization. It's really lovely for me just to see that uh, those plots and it just brings out the knowledge that's hidden away in that data. Now in Julia, we spoil because we have many packages. Uh, when it comes to data visualization, Gadfly comes to mind, which produces wonderful plots. Plots itself, it has many backends that, that, uh, that we can use. But today I want to introduce you to Vega Lite. It's really one of my favorite uh, data visualization packages. I'm going to open a notebook and interact, and I'm going to show you just how easy it is to create beautiful plots in Vega Lite. Here we are in our interact notebook, learn a data visualization using Vega Lite. So really plotting is one of the most useful ways uh, that I find of summarizing data. I just love uh, that visualization. It really, it really brings out that first bit of information uh, from your data. And as I've written here, the adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, that really comes to mind. So Vega Lite is a graphics, uh, graphics grammar based on JavaScript object notation, notation, JSON. And many of you will be familiar with JSON. This is a programming language agnostic format for in interchanging data. And as such, then Vega Lite itself, uh, it uses a subset of JavaScript and it allows for rich interactive plotting and Vega Lite itself, of course, that's a subset of Vega. And Vega is a declarative language that generates visualizations for the web. And you see there it can use Canvas or SVG, Scalable Graphics Format. So Vega Lite then, the Vega Lite.jl package, that's the Julia representation of the Vega Lite grammar. It really is ideal for visualizing tabular data. So we've got to have this our data in tidy format. Tidy format or long form. That means all your variables are across the tables in your flat file and each row is a subject in your, in your data. So as long as your data is in, in tidy form or long form, it really is going to, uh, to work well. So the vegalite.gel package um, can work with many data structures. So we're going to start off by just using Julia arrays, the type of uh, Julia collection but it works really well with uh, data frames objects. And we're going to import the data frames package, for instance, uh, uh, after we've generated some data. Uh, you can also use it with the CSV package, for instance. Remember, if we import a spreadsheet file, a CSV file, using the csv.jl package, it's going to generate a data frame object for us anyway. Remember, there's also the vega datasets.jl package, and that creates, uh, or at least is, is a Julia representation against, uh, again of the Vega Lite data set. So with the Vega Lite itself, there is a data set. So you can play around with some of the data sets uh, that you just import with the Vega data set 
.jl package. But we're going to simulate our own data because this is Julia. So what I'm going to use do here is just import the packages that I'm going to use. So you see, I'm going to use Vega Lite. Uh, I am going to import Vega datasets because I'm going to show you just the first plot, just to give you an idea of what the Vega uh, Lite plots look like. But thereafter, we'll we'll do our own data. So let's run that cell uh, with Interact. It's the same as with a Jupyter notebook. I'm just going to hold down Shift and hit Return here on my Mac, and that's going to uh, execute that code. Of course, it's got to pre-compile now and uh, it'll take a second or two to run. Now, this .jl file of mine, it lives inside of its own Julia environment. I do have a video on creating Julia environments, and it's very important to create different environments for all your projects. Don't just import packages in, in your base uh, or generic uh, Julia environment. Now, we're also going to import random distributions and data frames, so let's do that random because we're going to generate some random values, distributions because I'm going to take uh, random values from a normal distribution and then data frames as I said it is uh, one of the best data structures to use with Vega Lite. So let me just show you what a Vega plot looks like and there's a couple of, line of lines of code and uh, two things that you're going to note first of all that or a couple of things, the data set, it's the population data set that I'm using from uh, the Vega data sets and then you see this little operator there. So on my keyboard, standard uh, Mac 16 inch keyboard, uh, 16 inch MacBook Pro keyboard I should say, that's the shift and backslash. And then the greater than symbol. And that's the pipe operator because I'm piping the data into the following thing. And the following thing is this macro, at vlplot macro. And remember macros are used in Julia, fantastic uh, uh, thing to use in Julia, it just generates code so um, see it at the moment just as a function. So I'm piping the data as first argument into this function. That's what the pipe operator is going to do for me. And uh, then we're going to see some arguments. The first argument I'm going to use is background equals light gray. And then I'm doing a mark. And you can see these, the set of curly braces. Now it's going, to, it's going to look like, at first glance, like Julia Dictionaries, but it is not Julia Dictionaries. It's just part of the syntax of JSON and how the at VL plot macro converts the code that we're going to write here into, into uh, normal JSON. And in actual fact, there's also a VL string macro that you can write this plain common garden variety JSON to create these plots. But we're going to stick to the to the common use case here, which is the add VL plot macro. So there's a mark, and it seems to be a box plot, but I'm using symbol notation, so it's colon box plot. There's an extent equals 1.5, an opacity. There seems to be a title. There's an x-axis and a y-axis. The y-axis seems to have it seems to have an, a title, etc. We're going to go through all of these things. And of course, the first time you run a plot in Julia, it's going to take a second or two. Uh, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, and then we're going to see our first plot. Um, remember, I'm, I've stated here a little light back, gray background, and there we see it. A lovely box and whisker plot. And you see our population count here as our title that we, that we uh, stipulated there in the y-axis. We see age here, and we see these values 0, 5, 10, they're sort of on their side, minus 90 degree angle. And that is because age is seen here as an ordinal, as an ordinal uh, data type and not as continuous numerical. And it's ordinal because of that colon O there after the age. Anyway, we're going to learn all about that. You see these statistical outliers here um, for the population count here on the older ages. And you can, that is because of this extent equals 1.5. Great stuff. That is what these plots look like. They're very easy to create. It's, um, uh, it's uh, uh, quite a nice plotting package and I'm using it more and more. So let's start with the basics of a Vega Lite plot. So other than the data that we're going to have to use, I mean, we're plotting data, at a bare minimum, Vega Lite requires two things, an encoding and a mark. Those two things. 
There's also transform. That's an optional third thing that you can do on your own, and that's where we want to transform the data. That's the statistical manipulation of data. There's, for instance, there's an aggregate, aggregate transform, and one of the aggregates is a mean or median or standard deviation that you manipulate the data first before plotting it. That's a transform. Usually, though, when creating the plots, we're not interested in that transform, so what we really just need is the two, two things, a mark and an encoding. So let's uh, generate some of our own data, and then I'll tell you all about marks and encoding. So I'm using a pseudo random number generator seed. So I'm using random.seed and then seed bang. Remember, that's our function. And I'm just using 12. And if you use 12 as well, of course, we're going to generate the same uh, pseudo random numbers. I'm creating two computer variables, independent and dependent. My independent computer variable holds a unit range object. So I'm saying from 0 to 9.9 .9 and steps of 0.1. And then I'm just going to, for each of those, I'm just going to add a bit of uh, random noise, and that comes from a standard normal distribution. So independent dot plus. Remember the dot plus gives us element-wise operation. And as many values as there are in my independent, I'm creating in my uh, dependent here because I'm just using the length of independent. So that's all the same. So let's put this together. So the mark is what we are trying to plot, the type of plot. So that's at VL plot, and what we want to plot is the mark, and that is a point. Point colon point, so symbol notation that infers that we want a scatter, scatter pl uh, plot because we just have these points. And then the encoding is the actual data that we need to encode for the plotting. And the encoding is what goes on the x-axis and what goes on the y-axis. And we're just stipulating the two, uh, our two list objects there, independent and dependent. And if we plot that, we see a beautiful scatter plot, just like that. And we see the mark was point, which is scatter, and we see the x and y values, each pair of values for each of those dots. And there we have it, just a nice little scatter plot. Now, we, we need not only encode the x and the y axis, we can actually split the data, and we can split the data according to the sample space elements of some categorical variable. So let's create a categorical variable. I'm going to call it group. Again, just from the RAND function, I pass a list to it with um, two strings, a and b, and I want 100 values, please. And now I've got my third encoding. So I've got x, y, and now color, which has nothing to do with the actual color, color, pink, orange, red, and blue, it's just splitting my encoding up according to the sample space elements in that categorical variable. So if I do that, we see we have still our dependent and independent variables, but split up by uh, whether it's A or B, and we see the legend on the right-hand side, A and B. So the three parts or the three encodings that I can do, X, Y, and color, now, instead of the single plot, I can plot A and B, those two uh, sets of values, separately. And instead of using color, there's a sneaky little fourth uh, type of encoding that we can do, and that's the column encoding. So if we run this, I'm going to see two plots, one separately for A and one separately for B. So instead of color, we can use column as well. Now, that's very nice if my third variable was categorical, but what if it's continuous numerical? So let's create another computer variable, and I'm going to call it scale, and it's a random, uh, just take random values uh, between, on the interval of 10 to 20, and I want 100 of those. And now my color is going to be scale, but scale is now a numerical variable. It is no longer categorical. So what is going to happen here? Well, very nicely, because it's a numerical variable, we're going to get this scale here. So it just goes from light to dark, and that allows us to take a scatter plot and visualize three numerical variables in one go. The darker these little marks, the higher, of course, that value is for that third numerical variable. So that's brilliant. Now we're going to get into what is very common, and that is when we encode a categorical variable by numerical values. So we might have a questionnaire, and someone disagrees, they neither agree nor disagree, or they agree, 
whatever the case might be, and we just uh, encode that in the data captures one, two, and three. And that means that these are uh, categorical variables, even though they're numbers, but they are not numbers, and we've got to tell VegaLite that we want them interpreted, for instance, as ordinal data or nominal data. So let's create this new computer variable grade, and that's going to be a uniform, random uh, distribution of these three values. So just pick from one, two, and three, 100 values, and they each have an equal likelihood of being chosen. So there we go. And now what we're going to do is, because we've got so many computer variables now, let's just build them all into a data frame. So I'm going to call my data frame df. And remember, that's the notation for data frame. We don't use, when we create the data frame, uh, these are the column headers, independent, dependent, group, scale, and grade. Uh, and uh, uppercase, I use uppercase just to distinguish that these are column headers in my data frame. And then we can assign to them these one, two, three, four, five lists that we uh, created. And then I'm using the first uh, function there, and I'm passing the data frame comma three because I want the first three rows to be printed to the screen just to see that everything uh, came in properly. And then we see the first three, we see my column headers, independent, dependent, group, scale, and grade. Independent was correctly identified as a 64-bit float. Data type, 64-bit float for dependent, the string. Uh, I might want those as categorical, and remember the data frames package it does have a two-categorical function. Uh, scale is a 64-bit integer, but look at grade. It was interpreted as a 64-bit integer, but that's not what we wanted. We wanted it to be ordinal categorical. In other words, not numerical at all. So what can we do? Because if we do that, we're going to see a color scale. We should see a color scale uh, because it is seen as a numerical value. So here's my mark. It's plot, oh, but look at that. I'm piping data frame into. So my data is now piped into the advial plot macro. So df and then my pipe operator and then advial plot. So that I'm just piping that as the first argument into that macro. My mark is still point. My x-axis is independent. But now I'm referring to the column header, not to my uh, computer variable that I had before. So this is one of the columns inside of my new data frame. So I'm using symbol notation. So colon independent. You can also just do your column headers inside of a data frame when you reference them as a string. So I'm just showing you both X and Y there. That's symbol notation for X and string notation for Y. And then the color is going to be grade now I am using string notation. Grade and then colon O for ordinal. So it says to at VLplot macro, please see this grade not as a 64-bit int, but as an ordinal categorical variable. So if we do that and we print that, we see grade is now 1, 2, and 3. It is seen as a categorical variable. So it's not a color scale uh, as we would have expected. So there's a bit for you to learn about as far as Vega plots concerned there. Remember, you can use symbol notation and strings, and then we can interpret these as a data type uh, that we require. So I'm going to be a bit more verbose now just to show you how these things um, come together, because what we've been using up till now is just some syntactic sugar. In other words, uh, this is some shorthand notation there, but we can be much more verbose and try and start to express things uh, closer and closer to what uh, proper JSON would be. And there's just a couple of differences between JSON and how the Julia implementation of vegalite.dl is. So uh, let's go for it. So I'm piping df into my advial plot macro, and now I'm saying mark equals point. So I'm actually specifying that this is my mark. Remember, we have marks and encodings, and we might also have transforms, but we're, gonna, we're sticking now with marks and encodings. So I'm actually saying mark equals instead of just using the colon point. And then I'm saying encoding. And because I want to pass different things about my encoding, I put them in curly braces. Once again, this is not part of a dictionary. This is just part of the syntax of this macro. So I have X, a Y, and color, my three encodings. X is going to be, and because I want to specify different things about X, I put it inside of curly braces. And when you go to the Vega Light.gel uh, website, you are going to see that uh, these things form a hierarchy. So under encoding, what you want to encode, and say on the x-axis, for instance, what are all the things that can go into the x-axis? So there are all these, these uh, properties that you can set, and it all forms part of this 
a hierarchy. So with the x for the x-axis, I can say something like a field. So the field is going to be the independent column in my data frame. And the type, although it, was, it would be correctly interpreted anyway, but I'm forcing the issue here, I'm saying type is quantitative. So not ordinal, not nom nominal, but quantitative. Y is the field equals the dependent column, and the type is also quantitative, and color, the field is grade, and the type is ordinal. So I'm going to get exactly the same plot as before. No difference. I just used a lot of syntactic sugar up front with this one. Look how neat and short that is. But now you can start seeing where this, where this all comes from. So now that you have this basics of a mark and an encoding, and you know a little bit about the structure that the uh, Vegalite uh, at VL uh, plot macro, how it is manipulating or, or using at least that JSON, Let's add some common plot elements. For me, a plot must have a title, and it must have x and y axes, uh, uh, axis uh, titles, so let's go for that. So I'm piping df into add VL plot macro. I'm just saying point, not mark, equals point is point. A title, you can say title equals scatter plot. And if there's some other things you can do with a title, so if you wanted to do other things, because that's just the text of it, but you can do the font size, the font type, where it is, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you uh, in the next, you can see it peeping at the bottom of the screen there, but don't look there, look here now. On the x-axis, I'm just saying independent instead of field equals colon independent, so you can leave things out, the macro will know what to do, and uh, now I'm also passing a title, independent variable and dependent variable, and if we looked up here, it just said independent and dependent, as far as these were concerned, and I just took that from the column header name, but now I'm specifying something else. Independent variable, dependent variable, color, the grade is ordinal, and the legend equals, and there's a th things about the legend. For instance, the color, etc., but all I want is the title, but because I'm specifying down the hierarchy some of the parameters of this encoding, I put that in curly braces as well. So after a while, you'll, you'll start to, to, to know where these curly braces are supposed, to, are supposed to go. And there we go. I get scatter plot as my title there. I get my access titles, and I get grade variable there as my legend title. Beautiful. So let's be much more verbose. So you can see where all these things are coming from. So I'm saying mark is, is colon point. My title equals, now I'm not just using the title. I want to specify a lot of stuff. So that all goes inside of curly braces. And if it's something even deeper, say one of these parameters here has a set of arguments that I can use, that will all go inside of a set of curly braces, etc. So my text is scatter plot, my align is left, my anchor is start, my color is steel blue, and you can just go on the Mozilla website and you'll see all these named colors. Otherwise, you can just use hex code. My font size, see the uppercase S there, is 18. My subtitle is data visualization, and my subtitle color is also steel blue. My encoding is the following, X equals, and if certain things I want to set, so it goes inside of curly braces. Field equals independent. Type is quantitative. See, I'm using it as a string, as, a, as opposed to using colon notation, the symbol notation. Then axis equals, and down the hierarchy, because there are many things that you can set for the axis separately, they'll have to go in curly braces. The title is independent variable, the title color is steel blue, and the grid equals false. So along the x-axis, I'm not going to see a grid. For y, I've got a field, a type, again an axis, and a title color, but this time I've not said grid equals false. The default is true, by the way, so I'm going to see the y-axis grid. Color, you see what I've done there. Field is a grade. Type is nominal this time, and legend because there's a couple of things that, uh, that you can set with a legend, it goes inside curly braces. It just makes sense. It's just beautiful uh, how you can string all these things together. And you can see, you can see what's happened there. You can see the colors, the way that the title is off anchored to, uh, to the start and then left aligned. Uh, everything quite beautiful there. So I can become very verbose in how I want to, to create these Vega light plots. Very nice. The only thing I've really added here is just to show you we can specify the height and width as well. So I'm going to say height is 200, width is 600, so these are pixels. And then everything else is the same, but you'll see I've used a lot more 
of the syntactic sugar, just leaving out a lot more of the verbosity that I had before. And there you can see 600 by 200 plot very nicely. So let's look at some commonly used plots. Uh, histogram, very good just to show you the distribution. It's going to bin your continuous numerical variable and just do a frequency count, how many values fall in those little intervals. So I'm going to create a new column in my data frame. I'm going to call it height. So I'm going to use the normal distribution. So I'm saying distributions.normal, just so you see where that normal comes from. It comes from the distributions package. So rand distributions.normal, uh, mean of 160, a standard deviation of 10, and I want 100 values, please. And you're going to get a bit of a warning. Uh, we haven't had an update, a proper update for the data frames package yet, so uh, there's some things there that have been deprecated. Just a, uh, something you see commonly in Julia, as all the packages take their time uh, to be upgraded. Um, so let's just plot this. Now, here comes our first transform, but it's a hidden transform. And it is going to be a count, a frequency count is the transform. I'm going to show you here because you're actually going to, if you do histograms, you're going to do this commonly, but it's proper perhaps just to do it more verbose so you can see where the transform comes from. But because this is the way we're uh, going to use it most of the time, let me show you that first. So piping DF into the macro, setting a width, a title, it's a bar. So the histograms are also just a type of bar plot because we're just, we're just going to count a frequency, do a frequency count. So there's no colon histogram, it's colon bar. X is height, and I'm setting bin as true, and title is height. So it's going to bin, and it's going to, de it's going to decide on the bin size on its own. And on the y-axis, I'm using, I'm, I'm going to say I'm using a transform, and you see that it's account open and close parentheses, so it's almost like a function that I'm using here. So it says, for my y-axis, do a count of whatever is in the interval on the x-axis. And I'm giving it a little uh, title there. So when that runs, you can see what has happened. So the bin size is 10 there. And all we're seeing are these frequency counts. How many uh, are in the interval 150 to 160, 160, 170, etc. So we can control the bin size in the way that I usually just control the bins. Uh, the bin size is just sitting the max bins. So if I'm going to say max bins equals 5, it's going to still do uh, its proper uh, interval um, so that it, it's nicely rounded, f depending on the values for my variable. Um, but I'm just specifying bins as max bins equals 5. So it doesn't mean there will be 5, but within a nice interval, you can see it used 20 as an interval now. And I have 4 bins there, and that does not uh, exceed my max of 5 that I stipulated. Density plots, they are also quite nice. The mark for that is the area mark colon area as you can see there and I'm setting just a bit of opacity so we just have a bit of see-through and here comes my first transform so here you can see the encoding remember I've, I could have put everything the x and y in an, in an encoding and this transform is the th third thing other than the mark so it's a mark and encoding and here's a transform and this transform lives on its own typically not how uh, I use it but just notice that you can do all your transforms separately and with my transform, it's a, a list. And inside of curly braces, then the density of the height. So I'm doing a kernel density estimate of the height variable here. And I'm setting a bandwidth of 3. And then my x and y, that has to do with this a transform of mine. So value as quantitative. And then on the y-axis as the density. So on the x-axis, the, the height values, and on the y-axis, their density. Type is also quantitative, and I've set a title there. So this is how we would typically use it, but it might not make a lot of sense when you see it like this. And there we have uh, our density plot of height. Let's just add a little bit to this. And all I'm going to do is add a color and I'm setting that to, uh, to be nominal categorical. So you see color there. I'm still going to use my same transform and then use the value and the density as far as what goes on the x and y axis is concerned. And that comes from this density keyword or uh, at least the variable that I decided to name there. And then overall, I'm also setting opacity to 0.5. 
overall so that we can see the two for A and B. We can see the two uh, distributions there. So I'm going to show you a little bit more about transforms, um, but this is how it will typically be used, but it takes some getting used to because it's not absolutely clear what is happening there. But I think you get the idea now. Box and whisker plots, fantastic for distributions, of course. I've shown you a nice one in the introduction. But let's just create another one. I'm uh, piping DF into my VL plot macro. My mark is a box plot. Extent equals 1.5. What that does is it says, look for statistical outliers by adding 1.5 times the interquartile range to the third quartile value and subtracting it from the first quartile value. That will be the end of my whiskers and anything beyond that is statistical outliers. I'm choosing a color for my mark. So all the box plots are going to be orange with an opacity of 90%. I'm setting a width and height there. On my y-axis, I'm putting group as ordinal. And we know what the sample space elements there are. And on my x-axis, I'm putting the numerical variable. So these are going to be box plots that are horizontal. See, I swapped x and y there. And uh, this domain uh, argument, uh, setting to false, that's the zero lines on your plots. You can see if we go back up here, here on the left-hand side and at the bottom, those are thicker gray lines. You can set that to false and they won't show. And then the size, 50, that would be how many pixels wide my boxes are. So let's plot that. And we see indeed this horizontal box plot uh, height on the x-axis and then the two sample space elements on the, uh, on the y-axis. And you can see my suspected outlier there because my whiskers only go out to this extent is 1.5 times the interquartile range. Beautiful stuff. Sometimes, though, you don't want to plot uh, the box and whisker plots, but you only want to create the actual data points. And so instead of using box plot, I'm using my type as a point. Color still orange. Everything else still uh, basically the same. And that why now what we're going to get and see I've put the X and Y axis for vertical ones now. So instead of the two box and whisker plots, I'm just getting an idea of uh, all of the, the data point values as they are there. Notice again, though, uh, this the axes have these ticks lying on their side at minus 90 degrees. And that is the default for categorical variables on the, on the x-axis. And we can fix that very easily with the label angle argument. So I'm saying y, uh, 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 the x at least, it's group, and that's seen as ordinal categorical, the mb. And then the axis is going to be label angle equals zero. So if I do that, lo and behold, the AMB is upright. As simple as that. So we've already seen these tra the transforms. Uh, and one of the transforms is aggregate. And let me show you uh, an easier way to use it. And that is right inside of the encoding. So not as transform on its own, but do it inside of the encoding. So piping DF into VL plot, my mark is a point, so I'm going to get a scatter plot, my color is orange, my width is 100. On my x-axis, I'm going to have the group as ordinal data with a label angle of zero. And then on the y-axis, I want the height, please. Type is quantitative, and now I'm bringing one of the transforms in right here. And one of the most common ones are aggregate. You can look on the J, uh, Vegalite JL website, vegalite.jl website, you are going to see a couple of transforms. One of them is aggregate, and one of the aggregates is the mean. So uh, all we're going to do now is instead of all the values, all the values that we had up here, we're just doing the two means. And you can see that uh, both of them there would just be uh, over the 150 mark there. So that's a, a, a better way of understanding where to bring in the transform. So you could have brought the transform in separately, give it a name, etc., but just to use it right inside of the encoding, actually, for me, uh, is much more useful. So let's just do bar charts. Bar, just with histogram, we're using the mark bar, setting an overall opacity for my mark, uh, my x-axis, my y-axis. And what we're doing now, again, is that common use case where we actually do this type of transform um, in this fashion. So instead of aggregate equals, we're just actually stating count open close parentheses. So you'll see on the website that that really is the common way to do these uh, transforms. So I just want a count of those sample space elements and color is going to be by the group 
but now you see something new, scale. Remember, that has nothing to do with the variable we created before, our scale variable that went into our data frame. No, no, this is one of the keyword arguments there. And I'm just specifying two different colors. And if we plot that, we see A and B, and they color differently, but because there's an overall opacity to my bar, we're going to see this mix of colors. And of course, the orange and the blue is going to give me this uh, bit of green. So it's... Um, with opacity, with bar charts, remember, it always can create this bit of color, color issues. But you can see it's just the frequency count of the three sample space elements in the, in the, uh, uh, in the grade variable there. And for each of those, we see group A and B, group A and B, group A and B, and how many there are. So instead of doing it that way, remember I said we can do the transform as a keyword argument and the type of transform is aggregate. So I'm going to do exactly the same there as the count. And now you can see where that count really comes from because on my y-axis, I'm going to see field is also grayed. It was grayed on the x-axis. It is grayed here. And then type is quantitative and aggregate is count. And I'm saying stack equals nothing. Nothing is the null value as far as uh, Vega light is concerned. So there we go, and we see exactly the same plot. So stipulating aggregate discount there, or using it in this fashion as we did up there, exactly the same. It's going to do exactly the same thing. So to get rid of this color issue, of course, we can just use stack. And because stack is going to be default for us here, we can just say bar with the X and the Y and the color. And I'm specifying color in this format now. And what I've done here is I've just swapped group and grade around just so that we can see nicely see um, the stack bar chart. So all the, the three grades, one, two, and three for groups A and B um, is created here as a stacked uh, bar chart. And that's it. That's the introduction to Vega Light. I hope you enjoyed it. Vega Light produces these wonderful plots. Try them inside of Interact. Interact is a great uh, coding environment. And I use that with my individual Julia environments. I create environments. If you use to Python, of course, with Conda or virtual ENV, you can create uh, different environments so that when you do install packages, it's only for that environment and you don't just ask, keep on adding packages, packages, packages into your base uh, Julia installation, which, uh, which is not advisable. And then with Interact here, it is going to pick up in what environment I am at the moment and it only looks for uh, this packages that I've installed for that specific environment. So uh, when you uh, um, have a look at this Mozilla developer website there, you'll see all the nice colors. And if you run this code in the REPL, uh, if you installed everything uh, as I have uh, from GitHub, and you run this, uh, here it's only going to give me the codes for the versions, but you can see in this uh, environment that I have here, there's my project.toml file, and it lists inside of this... Uh, project of mine, Vega Light, uh, Learn Vega Light project environment. Um, these are the packages uh, that live inside of that environment. And that'll be very different from, all, from any of my other projects for, for which I have an environment each. And in my base Julia, there's nothing. I don't, uh, install, uh, I don't install packages there. So give this a thumbs up, follow, subscribe, leave a comment if there's anything else about Vega Light uh, you want to see. But go and try it out. Of course, you can use it inside of uh, Juno. Uh, uh, in my instance here, running on Mac OS Catalina, I can't use the plot pane. So I've disabled the plot pane, and that forces the plotting inside of uh, my browser, even though I'm, I'm running it in Atom or in Juno. And if you're using uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code, um, it is just going to open a new tab and you're going to see the plots in, in a new tab. But using it here in Interact uh, is very nice and uh, it really works uh, beautifully. If you've ever coded in Python before, you know we make extensive use of environments. So whether you use virtual environments or Conda or Miniconda, that's Anaconda or Miniconda, you create these environments and you install your packages specifically for that environment. 
and uh, you don't want to mix and match those because you might get package independencies or you're just installing a bunch of packages that you really don't need and i think that happens a lot in julia where we just install julia and then in our base environment we're just going to add uh, all our packages and one day when it comes to updating the packages which in the REPL is very easy uh, you just hit the right square bracket and you just say update you're going to find a lot of your packages upgrade but some of them are going to downgrade to earlier versions and that might be totally unusable. So don't put all your packages just in your base Julia installation. Rather create different environments or create a different environment for each of your projects. And it is very simple to do. Once you've done it, you can just add your packages specifically to that project in that environment and keep the versions uh, that you're interested in and is working for you in that project. So we're going to go to a terminal. I'm going to show you how to do it on a Mac, but it's the same for other operating systems. And we're going to create uh, an environment and to, into which we will install uh, just a single package. It's very simple to do. I've opened a terminal here on my Mac OS system and you see the term base there. This is indeed a bash shell. So I installed Miniconda for my Python uh, coding uh, and uh, development and uh, I selected this bash terminal uh, for Mac OS. So what we want to do is just change directory to where we want our environment, uh, our Julia environment to, to be. So I'm going to go to documents, uh, documents. I have a Julia folder there. Uh, so let's go there. So we see we are in the Julia folder. We're going to use the package, the PKG package in Julia to do, uh, to create our environment for us. So we're going to type Julia and then E and then we're going to have an opening and closing single quotation mark. So we're going to say using PKG and then a semicolon space because we want some other code as well. So PKG dot generate. And what we want to generate, we're going to pass as a string the name of this environment. So I'm going to call this my YouTube environment. So something uh, silly, which I will uh, delete later. And then we close that and we have to close that single quotation mark. So Julia dash E, that's going to open up Julia. It's going to load the uh, PKG package and it's going to use PKG dot generate and it's going to generate this uh, environment for us. What, is, what this is going to do is it's going to create a folder inside of where we are at the moment. And remember for me, I'm in documents forward slash Julia. So let's run that. And there we go. We see generating project YouTube and there's a YouTube forward slash project dot TOML file and then YouTube forward slash SRC for source and then YouTube dot JL. So it's created a default JL file for us. We can create many more dot JL files inside of that source, that SRC subfolder. And we can even change what is in that default at the moment. So let's go into this newly created subfolder, then this newly created folder inside of our documents forward slash Julia folder. So wherever you want to create this. So let's just change directory into that. And if we now do LS or if you in Windows, it's going to be DIR for uh, directory. Uh, and you see there's a project.toml file and a source file, SRC. Now, what you want to do when you're inside of this folder now, where you can see that project.toml file, is you want to say Julia dash dash project equals full stop. So Julia dash dash project equals full stop. That's going to activate this environment for us. And remember, you must change directory into your directory that we've created that holds this environment. So let's do that. And now we can see Julia has started. And if I now go to the package system, remember that's the right square bracket. Notice I'm in the YouTube environment now. That's no longer the 1.4 or whatever version of Julia you're running. We are not in that, in that environment anymore. We are now in an environment where we are only dealing with what is inside of this project. So let's hit the backspace. I'm going to say using PKG. There we go. And then PKG.add. And let's add a package. 
So let's make uh, just the data frames package. Data frames and close. But now I'm going to use a, another keyword argument, preserve. And I'm going to set that preserve direct. So if you look at the uh, website uh, for the package, PKG package, you'll notice that there are a couple of uh, these values for the preserve keyword. So what this is going to do for us, it is just going to uh, keep this version that we have now. So if we add other packages, we're not going to change this version of the data frames package. So let's do that. And it's now going to install this package for us. Now, if you've installed other packages inside of the base environment, um, just your standard Julia environment, you're going to see that if you run status on this environment now, let's do that. Just right click to get into the package to say ST. You see it's only data frames um, that we have there now. And that is written to your TOML file specific to this project. So let's escape from there. And now we can just say exit open close parentheses and we are out outside of our environment now. So make use of this. Remember those uh, uh, two lines of code. You're really just going to um, use the dash E setting, Julia dash E, and then inside of your sets of quotation marks, you're going to create that. And then remember just to activate with a dash dash project keyword or that we uh, that we use. I hope you found that helpful. Please uh, create different environments so that you don't have these problems of uh, there are dependencies upgrading or downgrading at least uh, other packages that you use. So create these environments. If you've used Python before, of course, you're used to creating these different environments, specifically if you use a virtual environments or you use Conda's uh, environments. There are certainly many environments available today that we can use to write our Julia code in. In this video, I want to talk to you about the Pluto Notebooks. We're all familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Pluto Notebooks are a bit different. Uh, there's the plot, uh, Pluto.jl package that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to install it, and we're going to use it to write some code. So I can show you uh, what, Pluto, uh, or what a Pluto Notebook is all about. So just uh, a word or two on Julia environments. Remember to keep separate and distinct environments for each of your Julia projects. Uh, it's, you should not install packages just inside of your base Julia installation. One or two, for instance, I do install Pluto in the base environment, but there's only a handful of packages that I install there. We create a folder or a directory, depending on uh, whether you're in the Mac world or in the Windows world. We create a folder and inside of that folder we will create our notebooks and we're going to install the packages uh, or at least the references to the packages specific to that project. So every time I start a new project I reinstall the packages specific uh, that are specific to that project that I'm working on. And what you do there, you don't have this, I'm going to use the word cross-contamination, but this pro problem of dependencies and versions, uh, they don't really talk to each other. So we're just going to maintain an environment and uh, packages only in that environment and it all happens in a single folder. So really keep your projects in its own folder and we're going to generate an environment just using Julia's package manager, PKG. So what does this folder structure, I'm just going to use the word folder instead of directory, what, are we, you know, what does your folder look like on your hard drive? Well, this is a Mac, so for, uh, uh, on my side I'm going to have users. Uh, uh, forward slash users and this is the directory on or the folder structure on my hard drive then j-u-a-n that's just my username and then in my documents folder i have a subfolder called julia and in that julia folder will be all my projects and every project has a, a name and as you can see there i just use some placeholder text environment underscore name so i'm going to have a bunch of those subfolders 
uh, in this folder structure. And in that environment underscore name, whatever it's called, we're going to use Pluto Demo for, for this video. You're going to find two files after you've generated this environment using Julius Package Manager. You're going to find the project.toml file and a source folder, src. And it's automatically going to generate a single file, a .jl file, in that src folder for you. After you've activated this environment, I'm going to show you how to do this, uh, and you install your first package, you're also going to have a manifest.toml file. And you can read up on the package manager on Julia's website about the project.toml file and the manifest.toml file, uh, what is kept in there to keep, keep the versions uh, or information about your project is kept in those files. And as you see at the bottom there, once you've generated this, uh, this environment, you're also going to have whatever you call that environment, it's also going to have an environment underscore name, so that specific name of your environment, .jl file for you, ready to use. So what, what does the code look like? Well, first of all, you just have to open a terminal or command prompt, and you've got to navigate to where you, uh, where you have all your projects. So in my instance, as you've seen before, it's users forward slash my name, forward slash documents, forward slash Julia. And then we're going to type in Julia. Now I'm presuming that Julia is in your a part of your path or your environment variable so that when you do type in Julia, uh, your computer knows where to go get the Julia uh, executable. So Julia and then dash E and then inside of single quotation marks using PKG, which is going to use the package manager and then semicolon and then package dot generate and then the name of of this environment, the project that you're working on. So in our instance, we're going to call it Pluto Demo. And when we're done, you'll see inside of my Julia folder there, there'll be a Pluto Demo folder. And <clears throat> then we're going to just change into that directory. So on terminal, uh, no matter what terminal you use, it's usually CD, you're going to CD into that change directory into this folder, into the Pluto Demo folder. And then we're going to type Julia dash dash project equals full stop. That's going to activate this environment. So you're no longer working in your base Julia installation. You're now working in this newly generated uh, environment, Julia environment. And then uh, once we start Julia and we go into the REPL, we're going to use using PKG and then PKG.add. And for instance, there's a package Vega Lite that we're going to use. And then comma, you see preserve equals preserve direct. Now there's a couple of those keyword uh, the the values at least for the keyword argue, for the keyword preserve, and preserve direct just means that this the version that you're going to install now is going it's going to stick to that version. So it becomes very important when you do package development, for instance, that you that you really take control over the versions of different dependencies that you do have. But for simple projects like this, I just use preserve direct, and it's always going to keep that version of the package. Uh, that we started with. Now, as I mentioned, I do install Pluto in my base Julia installation. So I'll start the REPL again, but just in my base Julia installation, and we're going to uh, install Pluto, but then uh, use the, the, the code import Pluto, and then Pluto.run. Remember, if we use import, we've got to reference that namespace. So it's Pluto.run. So you have to get to the run function, you have to use the, the Pluto, uh, the word itself there, Pluto.run. And then we're going to use a, a port address, and you can use um, available ports on your computer. One, two, three, four is fine. Um, that's the example, at least on uh, Pluto's website. Remember, uh, just a few things. I do not save my files, my working notebooks, in the SRC subfolder. I just uh, save it in uh, the first uh, structure, in other words, in the project names folder. And uh, where the project.toml file and manifest.toml files are. And then I'm going to show you how to activate the environment in the notebook. Because even though you try to activate it outside of, you've got to activate it in the notebook. And I'm just going to show you how to use Markdown in Pluto because that is different from a Jupyter notebook. And also just uh, showcase the interactive the interactivity of the Pluto notebook environment. So on my desktop here, we've opened uh, a terminal. And I'm just changing directory, as you can see there, changing directory into my documents forward slash Julia folder. So that's where I want to be because that is where I have my list of folders that contain all my projects. So as mentioned, I'm going to type Julia 
and then dash E, open a single quotation mark, we're going to say using PKG, so this would be the same as typing code in the REPL, semicolon, and then PKG dot generate, generate, and then parentheses and a quotation mark, and this is where we're going to to write the name of our project. So in my instance, I'm going to call it a Pluto Demo. Of course, you give the name that is appropriate to the type of project that you are working on. So I'm going to close my quotation marks, close the parentheses, and then close the single, single quotation mark there. So let's just go back all the way there and just correct that spelling error there. And then all the way to the end, let's run this. And there we can see generating project Pluto Demo. And we'll see inside of that folder, we now have a project.toml file. We'll also have an SRC folder. And inside of that SRC folder is a Pluto demo.jl. So it's the same name as our project name, and .jl. So that's just a normal Julia file that you can open up using uh, your uh, uh, an IDE. It will not uh, open in Pluto though, although Pluto is saved as, Pluto notebooks are saved as .jl files, but that is not a Pluto notebook, so that's not going to, uh, going to work for us. So now we're just going to change directory into this folder that was generated using the pkg.generate function. And now we can see we're there, and if I type ls, or if you're in the Windows, you're going to type dir, you see the project.toml file, and then an src that is going to be a folder inside of there. But there's our project.toml file. Now we want to activate this environment. So I'm going to say Julia once again, and then dash dash project equals full stop or period. And if I do that, we see Julia has started, and it is 1.5.1 at the time of this recording. But if I hit the right square bracket to go into my package manager, we see I'm not in Julia the at v1.5, I'm in the Pluto demo environment. So anything that I install here will only be for this environment. It will not be available to any of the other environments or to my base Julia installation. So here I'm going to say using, using pkg, and then we can just start adding uh, uh, one or two packages. So pkg.add. Now you can do this in the package manage itself by the right square bracket, but I prefer it here so that we can showcase this preserve keyword. So let's do Vega Light as we promised. So Vega Light, close my quotation marks, comma preserve equals, and then all in uppercase preserve underscore direct. As simple as that, preserve direct. And there we go. It's now going to install Vega Light for us. And there we go. Let's install something else as well. Let's just install data frames. The data frames package. There we go, done. So if I hit my right square bracket now to get into the package manager, I just type ST. We see that we have data frames and Vega Lite installed. And we can see the versions there. We're just going to install the newest versions. Uh, we didn't specify uh, the version that we wanted. But that is there now specifically to this environment. So let's just exit from Julia here now. And if I type ls, you'll see there's a manifest.toml file now as well. This contains the information about these packages that I have installed. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to quit the, the, the terminal and just restart it. We're back in the terminal and I'm just going to type Julia and that's just going to start in the base installation. If I hit the right square bracket now, you see I'm in version 1.5. So I haven't activated a specific environment, and this is where I would add Pluto. Now I've already done so, but I would just say add Pluto, and as I say, it's one of the handful of packages that I do put in my base Julia installation. I've done that already, so let's just say import Pluto, and it gives us a little bit of information there, and we're going to say pluto.run, the run function, and for my port address, I'm just going to say 1234. Now, it might give you a little bit of information that you have to copy and paste into your browser uh, URL so that it would navigate to uh, this generated notebook. In my instance, it's just going to happen uh, automatically. And we see we're in localhost1234, and we have a, a Pluto.jl notebook. And you can see there's some sample notebooks that you can work through, or we can generate a new notebook. So let's just generate a new notebook.
And there we have it, a brand new notebook, live docs that gives you some information. Uh, if you highlight some uh, functions in Julia and look at the live docs, it's going to give you information um, about those that function. There is a little bit of feedback that you can give and statistics about your notebook. But first of all, we're just going to save the notebook. So I'm going to go up here and to save notebook. And once you click on it, you're going to be in your home folder automatically. I want to go to documents and you see it finds documents there. And then I'm going to go into Julia and then I'm going to go into Pluto demo. And that is where I'm going to uh, save this file. So you can see I'm in the same folder as manifest.toml and the project.toml uh, file. I'm not going to go into SRC and save it there. So let's just call this one uh, demo as well. So it's demo and you see the auto completion there .jl. So I'm going to click that and I'm going to say choose. And it wants to overwrite um, this, the default that it created. And there we go. And it's automatically saved. Anything I type now is automatically saved. But we're interested in writing some code. So you see here we have one code cell. And if I hover over it, you see a plus above and a plus underneath. Let's increase the size of it so I can show you. So the plus on top and the plus underneath. And then also a little eyeball. And that's going to hide our code. Now, the cell the code that you write, the execution of that cell is above the cell. So unlike a Jupyter Notebook where it's below the cell, it's going to be above. So let's just start with some markdown. Now that's very simple. You can't see any drop down menus here to change something into a markdown cell, but you just type MD and you can uh, do a quotation mark. I'm going to do a single pound sign or hash symbol and I'm going to say interactive, interactive notebook. That's going to be the name of uh, this notebook, or at least uh, the markdown first level name of it. And I'm going to hold down Control and hit Return, or Control and Enter. When I do that, it's automatically going to create a new cell underneath. If I just hit Shift and Enter, it'll execute the cell, but it won't open a new one. You'll have to go onto that little plus signs above or below. So I'm going to hold down Control and hit Return, and it's going to do what we used to in a Jupyter Notebook at least, it's just going to print this interactive notebook as a header because I used a single hashtag that would be equivalent to an HTML H1 tag. Now, if I hit on this little eyeball, it hides the code. And now all I can see is obviously just the nice title of this page. So let's make another one. I'm going to say MD and we're just going to have two and we're going to say our libraries that we're going to use or our packages libraries. There we go. Let's execute that. I've got two uh, hashtags there or symbol uh, uh, pound signs. And so that's going to be slightly smaller. And once again, I can just hide the text there. So I didn't hit uh, control and enter. I hit shift and enter. And you can see it didn't uh, automatically create a new cell for me. So let's just hit the plus there. And you know, that's it. What we need to do now is just to use the package manager. So I'm going to hold down Control and return and that line is executed because what I want to do now is to activate the environment. So activate. Now, very importantly, with this activate function, parentheses and then our quotation mark, because we have to tell it where our where our project.toml file is. Now I've already saved this demo file here in the Pluto demo folder. And I know that that contains the project.toml file and the manifest.toml file. So this notebook and those two files are in the same folder. So I don't have to go and type the whole address on my hard drive, on my internal drive, uh, to get to, uh, to that um, project.toml file. I can, I can just type it in directly. So it's project.toml. Close my quotation mark, close my parentheses. Uh, but remember, please do the save first. If you don't do that, you have to type in the whole address to that file. So control and enter. There we go. And now this, uh, this environment is activated. And remember the two, uh, the two packages that we had installed because we say pkg.status. Now that's not going to print out in this notebook. I'm, I'm just going to hit down control, uh, hit, uh, control and return. But if I bring up my terminal window, you'll see um, the this st uh, the status function being executed. And there's my terminal, 
and you can see things happening as we execute it. But this um, last two lines, you see my data frames package and the Vega Lite package there because we are inside of this specific environment. We've activated this environment inside of Pluto uh, in, this, in this Pluto notebook. And you can see there, Project Pluto uh, version 0.1.0. Now, remember, we use the package manager actually to create packages. Um, but for in this instance, all we're going to use is, is just to showcase uh, this notebook environment. So as far as our libraries or packages are concerned, let's just do Vega Lite then using Vega Lite, uh, Control and uh, and Return, and you can see the little bar run up and down there. It's just executing that cell, so it's pre-compiling the package for us, and I can keep on typing in the meantime. We're also going to use the data frames uh, package. And then the last package we're going to use is one of the packages that are that is part of Julia. We're just going to use um, the random package as well. So let's create some data. So let's make it markdown, keep things night, and we say uh, two two quotation marks. Let's have that uh, two pound symbols, I should say, markdown, and we're going to say we're just going to create our data. And let's just hide that code so it looks nice. So let's just create some uh, random values. I'm going to use a computer variable called vels to, to hold this um, vector object and uh, this array object. And I'm going to say rand 1000. So just going to generate 1000 uh, values for us there. I'm going to put the semicolon because I don't want uh, that to be expressed to the screen. So there we have 1000 values. And let's create a data frame from these. So df equals data frame. And what we're going to have is, let's call it var1. It's going to be um, that columns, the column name. And I'm going to set that equal to vels. So we're going to have this single, uh, the single column in our data frame. And it's going to contain those uh, 1,000 rows uh, for each of those, uh, one, one cell, one row for each of those values. And there we can see the first five rows is going to be different from you because we did not seed the pseudorandom number generator. And now let's just investigate this data. So let's say, let's say explore the data. So this is going to be our section on exploring the data. And let's create a new cell for ourselves at the bottom. So let's just create a plot, just a histogram of um, these thousand values. Now, in a Jupyter, uh, in a unlike a Jupyter notebook, here in a Pluto notebook, it is one line of code. We can just execute one thing at a time. If you want multiple things to be executed in one cell, you've got to wrap it in a begin end statement. So I'm going to say begin, and we're going to use um, we're going to pipe the, our data frame into uh, a plot, and we're going to use the macro at vl vl plot. And what we want is we want a bar plot and we want the X to be and inside of curly braces X we're going to put a few things. We're going to plot of var1 is going to be on our X axis. We're going to say bins equals true to create bins for us. And then on the Y axis, we're just going to put counts. So I do have a video out on the use of Vega Lite. It's a fantastic a fantastic plotting environment. Um, so have a look at that. I'll put a link on uh, in, in the description down below. So we have a begin and end statements there that we wrap this, what is essentially multi-line. So um, a line of code there. It looks like a single line of code, but there's obviously quite a few things happening. So let's have a look at that. And there we go. We see our histogram very neatly there. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to um, make this a tad smaller. So I'm going to go up here to vels where I have that line of code and I'm going to re-execute it. So we're going to generate a thousand new values. And what I want you to have a look at is very small here, but I'm sure you'll see is that the values of my data frame are going to change and the plot is going to update all in one go. So let's hit shift and enter. And you see the code ran and we have different set of numbers and the histogram has changed. Now try that for yourself or just watch again. I'm going to do that and we see it runs and the plot changes immediately. So that's the thing about Pluto Notebooks. It's that it is interactive 
and there's a state that's created all the time and all the cells get updated to that state if something has changed and a cell references um, some values in another cell so if I updated that cell with a thousand values that it contains the a thousand values my data frame is going to reference that cell because I set my variable my var1 there equal to those values and the plot uh, has the data frame in it so those cells are somehow connected I mean that's just logical and things update so that's very different from a Jupyter notebook where you have to really keep track of making changes and then making sure that if you generated some results from those values or some um, plots and graphs from those, that you should rerun those cells uh, manually so that they would update as well. But here in the Pluto Notebook, those are done uh, at the same time. So let's just do it one more time. Um, shift and enter and the, uh, the data frame updated and then the plot updated itself as well. So that is very neat. So in short, this is a Pluto Notebook. It's a, a lovely uh, coding environment just for you to experiment or to just to, to explore your data. Uh, lovely for data exploration in as much as, as that you have uh, this interactivity and this live update. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, give Pluto a try. There's some wonderful environments. Of course, um, the Jupyter Notebook is a fantastic coding environment. You can also use Juno, which is... Um, uh, installation on top of Atom, the IDE, you can use Visual Studio Code to write your code, and now you can also use Pluto, a fantastic coding environment. Explore all of these and enjoy using Julia. So when it comes to making notes for studying mathematics, um, I love to do it in a notebook environment. And by that, I mean a computational workbook environment. So I'm either going to use Julia or Python or the Wolfram language, and I'm going to use the IDEs for any one of those, and I'm going to create a notebook because that allows me to make beautiful uh, type text uh, and also use some code to help me understand or, or do the problems, just understand what is going on with the mathematics. So it's really a wonderful for me to have those notebooks. Really, It's really neat to have them as opposed to my terrible handwriting. So as much as I like a, a thick pencil, like a 6B, and as much as I like a chalkboard, really when it comes to the notes, I love them to look nice. And so I'm going to create a computer-generated notebook. And in that we're going to have some LaTeX code, so we have this nice expression of mathematical notation. But more importantly, we're going to have some code as well because I, do, I really don't believe that you should study mathematics any, uh, any longer without having some code there as well. It really helps in the understanding of it, it really helps you to check your work, it just brings a, a new and a deeper level of understanding as far as the mathematics is concerned. So in this notebook I'm going to just introduce you to complex numbers if you've never seen them before and what we're going to use is a Pluto notebook and uh, we're going to write some Julia code as well. So have a look at this and see, uh, and see if you like it. At least you'll get a good introduction to complex numbers. Here we are in a Pluto notebook. Uh, as you can see, everything's already typed out, so you don't have to, uh, to watch me type. So we're talking about complex numbers. And you can see here in equation 1, the natural numbers are a subset of the integers, which are a subset of the rational numbers, which are a subset of the reals. And the real numbers, the real number line, that is really a subset of the complex numbers. So we're just expanding uh, this set of the real numbers to get to the complex numbers. Now this notebook is uh, within a Julia environment and that Julia environment is in uh, was described at least in this project.toml file and so I'm saving the address to this toml file as a string and I'm just saving that in a computer variable called file. And then we're going to type using pkg, so we're going to use the Julia package manager, and then the pkg.activate function, and we activate this file, or this project.toml file. So all the packages that I've installed within this environment will now be available inside of this notebook, and we're running that specific environment, Julia environment. So if you want to know how to do this, how to set up that environment and use it inside of Pluto, the link to my video on that is in the description down below. So we're also going to use three other libraries, packages. 
and the first one is plots so using plots as well and then plotly is going to be our back end that is the back end i use most often because it produces lovely uh, interactive plots we also can use pluto ui just so that i can show you a bit of this user interface pluto user interface and then one of the inbuilt packages when you install julia for the first time would be linear algebra and we're going to certainly use uh, that as well so in case you're not familiar with pluto notebooks remember all of these things are cells if i hover over the cell you can see that i can uh, create a cell above that by clicking the plus symbol up there or the plus symbol down here it's going to add a symbol and you see the little eyeball there with a line through it which means it's showing or hiding the code at the moment it's hidden so let's show the code and then you can see there so with pluto remember of course always the code is underneath the execution of that cell is on top so i'm just writing md and then in quotation marks so this denotes the cell as a markdown cell and i'm using a single hash tag symbol there or pound symbol and that means it's going to be rendered as an h1 a level tag html tag that is the largest text just as far as uh, normal text is concerned so i'm using that as my title as my title and i can just hide that so it'll make this nice a line underneath as well so just for normal text cell again it's all markdown md and everything goes into a single pair of uh, quotation marks and you'll see how to express latex there you'll see a bit of latex code within dollar symbols that's backslash math bb and then the c within curly braces and that's going to give us this double struck c denoting the set of all complex numbers you see this bold here that's just two underscores before and under uh, before and after um, some text and that's going to give you bold remember single ones would be italic and then this would all just be LaTeX. So again, it's just denoting as markdown, opening, closing quotation marks, and then my whole set of uh, the LaTeX code there to have uh, this rendered to the screen. And as I would always say, that's why I love making my notes inside of some uh, computer language IDE so that we can have these nice, lovely, neat notes. And I just, uh, I, uh, my, my mind at least responds to that. Now, the imaginary number i, it's mostly how it's denoted in mathematics, although the engineers uh, use the j symbol for that. But here we see an equation to the imaginary number, which is a horrible, horrible name, because there's nothing imaginary about it. So one of the first things you must do in complex analysis is just put out of your head that this, this is somehow imaginary. It's not imaginary at all. It's just a poor choice of name, but, but it is stuck. There's been various other suggestions, but uh, this term just, just stuck. But anyway, we see the imaginary number i there and its property. It is a number such that if you square it, you get negative 1. That's what it is. Now, we were taught at school that if you square anything, it's going to be either 0 if the thing that you're squaring is 0, or positive everything else, even a negative number. But that refers to the set of real numbers. We're expanding on them now. We're now in the world of complex numbers of which the real numbers are just a part. So indeed, there would be numbers that we can square to get a negative value. And that number is indeed i. And if you square it, you get negative 1. In Julia, to use the, the this value, this element inside of the set of complex numbers, the keyword for that is im short for imaginary number and if you type im you'll see im is expressed in the code as you see above there so we haven't looked at what a complex number is but uh, the expression here the, the expression of the code here im squared remember to get a square it's the caret symbol or shift six on most keyboards so i'm writing im and then caret symbol two that would be i squared and i get this negative one plus zero times the imaginary number so zero times anything even a complex number is still going to be zero so what we left here with actually it's just negative one so i squared is indeed negative one according to the code at least so let's look at this idea of a complex number we see a complex number there in equation three z or z everywhere else, well most places outside of america the us i should say 
is z equals a plus bi. And a common alternative, which we will probably use most often in this notebook, is x plus i y. You know, you just see b i and then i y. It's just the other way around. There, there's if there's a commutative property there, so it doesn't matter which way around you write it. But it's common if you use uh, x and y is that you write i y, and if you use anything else, it's b uh, anything else i. So b i. Now, what is this a and b and x and y? They're just two uh, x and y. They're just two real numbers. They're both elements of the real numbers. The x or the a that is called the real part of this imaginary of this complex number z, and y or b those are the imaginary parts. So the real part x and a, and the imaginary part this b or y, and we usually denote that as you can see here r e of z, and and the i m of z r e of z i m of z. So that is a complex number. In some text, you'll also see this notation. Just wanted to show you that z equals an a comma b. That's still the real and imaginary part of this complex number. Now I promise I'm going to show you just a little bit of why I, one of the reasons why I think people like Pluto is, is the Pluto UI. Now you can do this with uh, without the macro code, but since we've imported that package uh, Pluto UI, we can just use the macro at bind. And then we're going to have a variable called a and what we want that variable to be is the value of a slider object so slider and i'm using unit ranger negative five to five and because we're not using a step size there the default step size will be one so it'll be negative five negative four negative three all the way to three four five and that gets expressed as a slider there and we see we do the same thing for b and i can drag the slider and it's going to give me different values because let me move it up see what's happening down here it's the thing about a pluto notebook uh, everything is live so wherever i change some code if it's if a variable is involved in another cell that's going to update at the same time so i've created this imaginary number here or this uh, complex number z1 and i said it's a plus bi and that a is a computer variable and we've created it up there so at the moment, both a and b, according to the sliders, are negative five. So our complex number at the moment is negative five minus five i. And as I drag, say the a, you see that updates immediately. That updates immediately in three and four and five. There we go. Now it's five minus five i m, or five plus four i m. So it's as simple as that. And you can well imagine, I suppose, a couple of uses of uh, just these sliders, and they're more than just the slider objects in Pluto UI. So give it a give it a look. Now there are three functions inside of uh, Julia that are useful when it comes to these complex numbers. The first one is real. So if I pass in a, a complex number as an argument to the real functions, it's going to give me the real part back. And again, as I drag the slider. You'll see my number updates it's now one plus four i m so the real part is one and then i m a g for imaginary pass the complex number as an argument and we can see that or you can return it as a tuple using the r e i m function r e i m function and it's going to give you a tuple back of the real and in imaginary parts so that's very simple now one thing we wanted to do in this section is just uh, a bit of simple uh, simple arithmetic so let's create two complex numbers we can have z1 and z2 and if we see in the equation three so they've each got their own real part and their own imaginary part if i add them well we just you know we've added the z1 z plus z sub 1 z sub 2 on the left hand side so we're just going to add these two things on the right hand side so that'll be x sub 1 uh, plus i y sub 1 plus x sub 2 plus i y sub 2 and all we're going to do now is we're just going to group the real and imaginary parts so we see if we add two complex numbers we're just going to add the real parts and we add the imaginary parts and the imaginary parts just get multiplied by i as simple as that so let's just have a look at this we're going to create a second complex number z2 remember z1 is still going to be bound to those two sliders at the moment for me it's 1 plus 4 i m going to create z2 that's 3 minus 3 i m and then i'm going to say z1 plus z2 so at the moment my real parts are 1 and 3 3 plus 1 is 4 and 4 and minus 3 that's 1 so indeed the solution would be 4 plus 1 i so very very simple indeed 
more uh, of more interest let's look at multiplication and we're going to do it the same as we did with algebra if we have x uh, a plus b times um, m, uh, m plus n whatever we're just going to multiply it out by those rules that you learned at school so here we have um, let's look at the top here z1 times z2 so that's x sub 1 plus y uh, i y sub 1 times x sub 2 uh, plus i y sub 2 so x sub 1 times the x sub 2 it goes in the second line then x sub 1 times i y sub 2 so there'll be i x sub 1 y sub 2 plus then the i y sub 1 times the x sub 2 I'm just rearranging things so it looks neat so there'll be i x sub 2 y sub 1 and in the end we'll have a plus i squared y1 y2 and all we're going to do now we're going to group the real and imaginary parts and we're also going to remember that this very last expression i squared y1 y2 is actually a real number because i squared is minus 1 so we're going to have x sub 1 y sub uh, x sub 1 x sub 2 minus y sub 1 y sub 2 plus then i uh, multiplied by the expression as you can see there so very very easy no problems whatsoever let's just look at an example i have z sub 3 and z sub 4 there z sub 3 being 2 plus 3i and z sub 4 being negative 2 minus i so if I multiply these out, the real part is going to be 2 times negative 2, that's negative 4. And then at the end, it's going to be 3 times negative 1, that's negative 3. And i squared, which is negative 1. So that gives us a positive 3. So it's minus 4, positive 3, which leaves us with a negative 1. And then the i's are going to be a 2i and a, a negative 2i and a negative 6i. That gives us negative 8i. So there we created in code. And if we multiply that out, indeed we get negative 1 minus 8i. No problems whatsoever. So write yourself out some and just test, test it by writing, uh, writing some code. Now we're supposed to get to division, but of course division is not going to work for us. We'll have to define um, or make a, or create a definition for, for division of complex numbers. And to do that, we first have to introduce this notion of a complex conjugate. So if a, a complex conjugate, as you can see here, z bar, a bar over the top, sometimes there's a superscript asterisk, but let's use the common uh, notation, which is just the bar over the z of a complex number z, that's defined in equation 6. So if z equals x plus i y, then z bar is x minus i y. So all we're going to do, we're going to flip the sign on the imaginary part or at least multiply it by the real number negative 1. So remember what z4 was? z4 was negative 2 minus i. And if I take the conjugate of that complex conjugate, of which the function is just conj of z4, I get negative 2 plus 1 i there. Because negative 1, if we flip the sign or multiply it by negative 1, it becomes a positive. So it's the complex conjugate. So for interest sake, let's just see what happens if we multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate. And you can see there very quickly that we're going to end up because these i's on their own, they're going to cancel out. Minus i x y plus i x y, they cancel out. The i squared is a negative 1. And that becomes times this negative is a positive. So we get x squared plus y squared. So we have the fact that a complex number times its complex conjugate gives us a real number. So there's a little example for you. We take z4 and um, we're just going to uh, multiply it uh, by its complex conjugate z4. So that leaves us with 5 and you can check on the result there. That would be z4 times the conjugate of z4 and that gives us 5 because it's, uh, it's a real number because we have 0 im. So now we can find define division and this is what, we, what we're going to do. If we have two complex numbers z1 and z sub 2 such that z sub 2 is not 0, it's not 0 plus 0i, zero we can then we can do division. And what we do is we multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator over the complex conjugate of the denominator. And still in complex uh, analysis, uh, dividing a complex number by itself, that just gives you 1. Anything divided by itself is 1, except of course for 0. Dividing by 0 is not defined. So uh, if I have x plus x sub 1 plus i y sub 1, that's my z sub 1, divided by x sub 2 plus i y sub 2, I'm going to multiply it just by the denominator's complex conjugate over itself. 
and that's what you're going to get right the, the bottom expression here in equation 9 that the at least the denominator is a real number and then the numerator is still going to be a complex number And now, as you can see in the last expression, last equation here, in, or last line in equation one, the denominator is a real number and the numerator is still going to be a, a complex number. So let's have this little example of z5 and z6. And you can see 3 minus 3i is z sub 6. So we're going to multiply by 3 plus 3i divided by 3 plus 3i. And then the denominator becomes a real number and the numerator is a complex number. And we can again just check that out with code, creating z5, creating z6, and saying z5 divided by z6. And um, gives us this negative 0 0.166 all the way, plus 1 plus 66 all the way, i. And just to show you, if I take the solution here, negative 3 plus 21i divided by 18, I get exactly the same result. So that is indeed the numerical representation or an approximation of the... Um, of the fraction there that we see as far as this is concerned. So you could also write it negative 3 over 18 plus 21 over 18i. So that brings us neatly into this idea of, you know, we have this real number line. So we, how do we visualize this extension to the complex numbers, seeing that the real numbers is a subset of the complex numbers? Well, the real line we still have, and in the this diagram, which is called the Argand diagram, we see here in orange. That's the real axis with all the real numbers. But perpendicular to that, we create another axis, and we call that the imaginary axis. Just as we had an X and a Y axis. But in Cartesian coordinates, remember, both the X axis and the Y axis, they're independent. They're just independent real, real number lines. Here we, and, and if we have any, if we have any, uh, point on the Cartesian plane that refers to two real numbers. Um, and usually remember I type in parentheses and there's one number, the number, the x comma y value of that point. But this is not what we have here. We have the real part and the imaginary part. So if we have a, a, real, a complex number now, we can plot it on this R again diagram based on its real value and its, imaginary, its real part and its imaginary part because both of those are real numbers. And that's exactly what happens here. So we can see the value 1 comma 1 here. So on the real number that we 1, on the imaginary axis that we 1. So that's our, that's our complex number there, 1 plus i. And here's another complex number. That's 2, um, negative 1. So it's 2 minus i. But you can also see something else. We can also view these things, of course, as vectors if we have the origin of the vector or here at the origin and then the vector extends to the complex number because if you think about that this allows us you know rich understanding of complex numbers through a bit of geometry and we have this idea of right triangles because um, if this is the number one comma one that means this length on the x-axis is one the length on this imaginary axis is one we have a right angle triangle, so we can have this notion of the length of this complex number or the length of this vector. And we do indeed talk about the length of a complex number. It's called the modulus, and we'll get to that. And there's also this angle that the vector makes with the positive x-axis or the positive real axis, we should say. So there's a lovely geometry and trigonometry involved here with these complex numbers if we view them as these points on the Argand diagram or the complex plane. And anyway, there's the bit of code. And as I said, that's why I like the plotly backend for plots because we can now, we, we have this interactive idea of this interaction at least, and we can zoom in. And now we really zoomed in, and then we can just go back home, etc., or just save this image as a PNG file. So let's look at this idea of the magnitude of a complex number. But you've seen here now, it's, not, it's going to be nothing other than, than just Pythagorean theorem, basically, because that complex number would just be the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. Nothing, nothing other than that. 
So this magnitude of a complex number, we call it a modulus, as you can see here. We define it here in, in equation 10, and we, we write it with these straight lines around the complex number, and that would be positive the square root of x squared plus y squared. And remember how we got x squared plus y squared? Yeah, that was just the complex number divided by uh, multiplied by its complex conjugate. And we take the square root of that, and what you can see there, x squared plus y squared, the square root of that, again, that just hops back to the Pythagorean theorem, doesn't it? So it all binds lovely, nicely together. And of course, we're only interested in the positive part because we're interested in the length of this thing. So if we have z sub 5, remember, that was 3 plus 4i. So that's going to be 3 squared plus 4 squared. That's 25. And the square root is 25 is 5. And that's what we'd expect from a right triangle with a base of 3 and a height of 4. No problem there. And there we do it. We say the square root of the real part of z5 squared plus the imaginary part of z5 squared. If you take the square root of all of that, we get 5. Or we take the square root of z multiplied by its complex conjugate. Same story. And then there's also the ABS function for absolute. And that's going to give us the modulus if we pass as argument the complex number. So there'll be three ways for you there to calculate the modulus of a complex number. So now that we know what the length is, we can suppose also look at that angle that it makes with the, comp with the uh, uh, positive real axis. And we call that angle theta most of the time. And remember, if we go around in this 2 pi radians, or 360 degrees, uh, from the positive real axis counterclockwise all the way around. There's nothing stopping us. There's no barrier there. We can just go around and around and around. And every time we add 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. So that first time we go, before we go around twice, that angle, that first time round, anywhere would be what we call the principal argument. And if you study a bit of complex analysis, you know, we'll go beyond the principal argument. And through just right angle triangle trigonometry, it's very easy to see that this angle is going to be the arctangent of the complex part divided by the real part. It's just a simple right angle triangle taking the tangent of that angle. Tangent remembers opposite divided by adjacent. You already know the opposite and adjacent side because that's the real and imaginary parts. So opposite being y, that's the imaginary part divided by x, and that is going to be the real part. And there, just for interest's sake, I'll show you the arctangent function. There's the code to do the arctangent function. And uh, so there we go. So let's take this z sub 7. It's 1 plus square root of 3. And I want, for this example, I want this to be expressed, this angle, uh, to be expressed in degrees. So... In radians, at least, that's going to be the arctangent of square root of 3 over 1, the imaginary part divided by the real part. And the arctangent of square root of 3, well, that's just going to leave us, as far as degrees are concerned, at a 60 degree angle. Remember, that's counterclockwise. We're dealing with the first quadrant here with the number 1 plus 1 is positive, square root of 3 is positive. So that's going to be in the first quadrant of the Argan diagram or complex plane. And that's going to be 60 degrees. So if we do this z1 as 1 plus the square root of 3 times i, and we take the arctangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part, which you can see there, a tan is the arctangent function or the inverse tangent function, and I wrap that all in the red 2 degree function, which is going to take radians as input and output degrees. And bar the, um, the round off error, we see that indeed the solution is 60 degrees. I can also wrap all of that in the round function, and that's just going to round it to that integer, which is or, 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 which is 60 degrees. And imagine then we just have um, what I what we should go through at least is just just considering all four of the quadrants in the Argan diagram. So we're going to keep things very simple. We start with our first one: z equals one plus i. So it's one down the real axis, one up the imaginary axis, makes a nice pi over 4 a principal argument going counterclockwise from the positive, imaginary, a positive real axis. And if we do that, we can use the angle function. 
So instead of here, we had the arc tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. There's also, I should have said there, the angle function that's going to do exactly the same thing for us. So we're going to take the angle of 1 plus im, and we wrap that in radians to degrees, and we see we get the solution of up here, 45, just as we would expect. Now if we go to the second quadrant, so that is going to be negative on the real axis, but still positive on the imaginary axis. So minus 1 plus i. You can really visualize in your head where this is going to be. Otherwise, just create a little graph. As we did up there, just copy and paste that and change it a bit. And that gives us, as we would expect, 135 degrees because it's counting the angles from the positive real axis counterclockwise till we get to this complex number vector representation. And if we then go to the third quadrant, so there'll be both negative on the real part and the imaginary part, so minus 1, minus i, we see we get an angle of negative 135, and this is by design. So in the third and fourth quadrants, we're going to go from the positive real axis clockwise, so going down and then to the left. And that's how we get to 135, but it's now minus 135. And then the fourth quadrant, which will be something like 1 minus im, or any representative number in that complex number in that quadrant, I'm just choosing easy ones, we see an angle of negative 45 degrees. So in those two quadrants, it's going to go clockwise downwards from the positive real axis and we get these negative values. But as I said, we can keep going. So a number like 1 plus i, although it has a principal argument of pi over 4 radians of 45 degrees, we can add go around another 2 pi radians or 360 degrees so we'll be pi over 4 plus another 2 pi that's 9 over 4 pi if you add those two and if we pass that to the tangent function and round it uh, we see we still get this value of 1 so if we take the arc tangent of 1 radians 2 degrees we get 45 de we get 45 degrees so even though we've gone around more than once, it still ends up, you're going to end up with the same angle, the same angle, it's going to repeat and repeat and repeat if you think about the way that the tangent function works. So that's the geometry and trigonometry, just an introduction to that as far as complex numbers concerned, and it's really intuitive. So let's get to Euler's equation, and that's very nice, because now we're going to use still more trigonometry, and we're going to gain an even deeper insight into this idea of a complex number, and the argon diagram. Because if you look at the cosine, let's just imagine the first quadrant, so there's this nice little vector that goes out into the first quadrant, so a complex number in the first quadrant, and you take the cosine of that angle that it makes the positive real positive real axis, and the cosine, it's just adjacent divided by hypotenuse. And if we make this hypotenuse r, or the length, the modulus of our complex number, if then we make that r, so the cosine of the angle is just going to be x, that is the real part, the length of the real part, divided by this hypotenuse. That means we get another expression for this real part. It is the modulus times the cosine of the principal argument. That's a mouthful, but it's easy to see there. And the sine of that angle, of that complex number, is just going to be the modulus times the sine of that angle. That would be y y is going to be, or, or at least the imaginary part, you should be clear, just look at that equation 12. So the imaginary part is the modulus times the sine of the argument, and the real part is the modulus times the cosine of that angle, the principal angle. Now, let's just check, we just said, well, the Pythagorean theorem works for us, but we can also just sort of derive it here. If we use the trigonomet trigonometric identity that the cosine squared of an angle plus the sine squared of an angle, or the sine squared of that angle plus the cosine squared of that angle, that's just 1. Because if I now use this new way of writing the real and imaginary parts, being r cosine theta and r sine theta, if I have x squared plus y squared, that is going to be r squared cosine squared of theta plus r squared sine squared of theta, I take the r squared out as a common factor, and I have this cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which according to the most well-known, I suppose, the one you learn first, the trigonometric identity you learn about first, that's just 1. So x squared plus y squared is r squared, or r equals positive the square root of x squared plus y squared. 
So it's a no-brainer there. So let's take this equation 14. And I'm rewriting x plus i, y. My x is now r cosine theta. My y is r sine theta. And I have this i. I see that I can take out r as a common factor. So I have this brand new way of writing any complex number. It's the modulus times the sum of the cosine of the principal argument plus i times the sine of the principal argument. That's great. So from there, we're going to make this little big jump here in equation 15. Because what we're going to start off with is just a series expansion, this approximation of the cosine of an angle and the sine of an angle. And you'll remember that from first year calculus, this series expansion of the cosine of an angle and the sine of an angle. And you see them written out there, except for the sine of the angle on the left hand side with multiplied by i, which means every little expression component on the right hand side has to be multiplied by i as well. And then you also see we take the exponent theta or Euler's number to the power theta and you see the series expansion there. And now instead of just theta, I'm going to say e to the power i theta. So everywhere where I see theta, I replace that with i theta. So all I'm doing on the left hand side. So we're doing it on the right hand side, replacing theta with i theta. And now it's very neat because all these numerators have i squared in them, then i cubed i to the power 4, and of course we can work all that out. i squared is negative 1, so we see this e to the power i theta, that becomes 1 plus i theta, and then minus theta squared over 2 factorial, so those uh, exclamation marks, there's factorials. And so I have this series expansion of e to the power i theta, and what I noticed that, you know, every second one is just a real number, and every other second one contains a complex number, so let me just take out this, uh, separate these two out, so that I only have these real number expansion, and then the expansion that has i in it. And what you'd notice there, in these two final sections, is that I have the series expansion of cosine theta there, and I have the series expansion of i sine theta on, the, on that side. So I can just substitute that back in, so e to the i pi, it's cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. That's wonderful. And if cosine of theta plus i sine of theta equals e to the i theta, I can replace that in this z equals r cosine of theta plus i sine of theta equation of ours. That means I get this equation 16. Well, is equation z equals r times e to the power i theta. So I can write a complex number as... The modulus times Euler's number to the power i times the principal argument. That is wonderful. And now, let's just do be very bold. Let's just pick a complex number that's on the unit circle. So the modulus of, is 1. And we're going to, on that, on that circle, we're going to choose pi radians. Now think a little bit in your head. Or draw down paper if I have the complex plane and I have a principal argument of theta radians that flops me counterclockwise all the way over to the negative real axis and I have a modulus of 1 well that's just going to be the complex number negative 1 plus 0 i or the real number minus 1 that's all I have there and I have this fact then that e to the i pi if I then write it out instead of thinking about the just the image in our head of, of this argon diagram. If we write this out, r is now 1, so that disappears. Cosine of, 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 of uh, pi plus i times the sine of pi. Well, we know from before that that is negative 1. So e to the i pi equals negative 1, or e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. And that's just phenomenal. This idea, this connection, this deep connection between the Euler's number e and pi. There's this beautiful connection with the two. Such as, if you write it in this configuration, e to the power i theta, I should say, e to the power i pi, this is negative 1. Lovely stuff.
So this brings us then with a new way that we can multiply and divide two complex numbers. You see equation 18 and 19 there. So equation 18, we're multiplying z sub 1 and z sub 2, and we're writing it using this Euler's, using a, an Euler's form there, r sub 1 e to the power i theta sub 1 times r sub 2 e to the power i theta sub 2. So we see that's all just four terms multiplied by each other, so we can just rearrange a little bit. The commutative property, so r sub 1 times r sub 2 times e, and then with the law of exponents, Remember, if we multiply these two, we can just add them. And I've added them there in the second line, and I've taken i out as a common factor. So with multiplication, we multiply the two moduli, and we add the two principal arguments, and we raise multiply that by i and uh, use that in the in exponentiation. And then, of course, it becomes very easy if, we have, if we're multiplying more than two complex numbers. We'll just keep on multiplying the moduli and we'll keep on adding the principal arguments. No problem there. And we see the division there as long as z2 is not all zeros, not 0 plus 0i. Real and imaginary parts can't be 0. We have this idea of dividing the two moduli and we subtract the second from the first as far as the principal argument is concerned. Which brings us by this lovely theorem. And I won't uh, try and butcher that name. Look it up on YouTube. Or it's actually quite funny to see how many pronunciations there are. But if you go to Google and just try and look for the official pronunciation, it'll do a much better job than me. And it, this theorem is written there in equation 20. It says if I take a complex number to any power, that is going to be the same as taking the real the modulus to that power and this idea of the angle angle form, so cosine of theta plus i sine of theta, and I and I take that to the power n. And what we're suggesting that's the very same thing than the modulus to the power n times cosine of n times theta plus i times n sine theta. But somehow, as if by magic, I can bring that the power into the angles as well. Now the proof of that is very simple. We're going to prove it through and um, prove it by mathematical induction, simple induction. So we're going to use the fact that the uh, cosine of the addition of two angles can be written as the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. And um, we also have this idea of if we add two angles and we take the sine of that, that that's going to be the cosine of the first angle, sine of the second angle, plus sine of the first angle, cosine of the second angle. No problem. So let's look at the base case. n equals 1. So if I just put n equals 1 there, we have r cosine theta plus i sine of theta. As far as z is concerned, so we are OK there. For at least for one works. If we if we say z to the power 1 and everything is to the power 1 and it's 1 times theta and for cosine and 1 times theta for the sine, I mean it just all works out for base case 1. Now we do this induction hypothesis. We say we assume that the theorem is true for n equals k and show that it's true for k plus or n equals k plus 1. So I have things there, z to the power k, we don't know what k is, that's going to be r to the power k, as we've mentioned. And then the cosine of k theta plus the sine of k theta times r cosine theta plus i sine of theta. Because if we have z to the power k there, and we say z to the power k plus 1, that's all we do is we have z to the power k times z. Because if we have it, you can see it right here, z to the power k, it's not going to highlight for me, but z to the power k times z, well, we just add the, the exponent, so that'll be k plus 1. And on the right-hand side, you can see what it is. It's to the power r, r to the power k. We have this notion of the multiplication of the angle as far as cosine and sine is concerned, and all of that we're just going to multiply by the modulus times 
r sine r cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. And you see there how we how we expand that, and eventually we get to this idea of r to the power k plus one equals indeed r to the power z to the power k plus one equals r to the power k plus one times the cosine of k plus one theta plus i times k plus one theta. So if we assume that z to the power k is true, we see that z to the power k plus one works out for us as well, and all the dominoes fall. Because if we assume one is true, and we show that the next one is true, if we then start with the base case, which we've shown to be true, that means the next one has to be true. And if that one's true, the next one has to be, and all the dominoes fall. And that's mathematical induction. So let's have a look at this idea then of taking the fourth roots of a number one. Well, no, you didn't know there, you didn't know before at least that there are actually four roots. There's four numbers that you can multiply by itself four times that is going to give you one. So the fourth roots of one, or we can just write it as one to the power quarter, which mean, means n is a quarter. It also means that r equals one. Theta is zero. This is just one. So it's this dot on the real, real part of the uh, complex plane, the real axis. And then we have this fact that, remember that if you take one and you raise it to any power, except of course zero, um, uh, well, one to the power zero is actually also just uh, one, isn't it? And so that's just going to be one. So we can simplify that first line a little bit as well. Because if we write it out now, it's going to be the cosine of that angle plus i sine of that angle. And because one to the power quarter is just one, that becomes a one in line two there. And I have this idea of theta plus 2k chi, two theta divided by 4. And theta plus 2k pi uh, divided by 4. And you can see there the sequence of values for k. This means, you know, the fact that, that theta equals 0. So we can leave that out. We are left with this k pi over 2 and k pi over 2 as far as cosine and sine is concerned. And if you start with k equals 0, that's going to be cosine of pi over 2 plus sine of pi over 2. And that just leaves us with 1. And if k equals 1, uh, 2 I should say, or it starts with 0, then 1, then 2, then 3, you see the four numbers that you get there. 1, i, negative 1, negative i. And if you take any of those values and you uh, raise it to the power 4, you're going to get the value 1. Check it out for yourself. Now, the last part of this notebook is just revisiting the sine and cosine functions. And what I do here in this last section that you can read on your own, that's very neatly uh, typed out for you there, is that we can rewrite complex numbers, or the cosine at least, of an angle. We can rewrite it, as you can see in equation 2, cosine of an angle is e to the power i, that angle, plus e to the power negative i times that angle divided by 2. And then the sine of an angle, we can write like that. Uh, and we just divide it by 2i. Remember, to get rid of this complex part in the denominator, we can multiply it by negative 2i over negative 2i. Okay, which brings us here by uh, just Euler's notation, z to the power n, remember that, z to the power n, that's cosine uh, n theta plus i n theta, and if it's z to the power negative n, remember the cosine function here, if you take the negative of a negative angle, it's still just going to be the cosine of a positive angle and then minus i times uh, sine of n times theta. And if we add them there, and uh, we remember from equation 25 here, when n equals 1, we get 2 cosine theta from equation 23, and in the second form, 2i sine of theta. And we can use this fact to find some other expression, say for instance, here in example 7 cosine, to the power 4 of theta and we would just just this fact that we've just looked at now these equations up here 23 24 25 we just use them so that we get this idea of cosine to the power 4 can be written as 1 over 8 times cosine of 4 times that angle and it goes the other way around as well when we want to write something as this power the power of these angles it's very easy to do as well, and you can follow the steps here in example 8 and look at the code to verify that for yourself. 
The last thing I want you to read here as well is about the dot and the cross product and how to calculate them and what they mean to us. And you can see all the code there and then how to work out how to do this. What you are going to need as well is this idea of the determinant of taking this matrix and uh, as far as the cross product is concerned, so you can suddenly read through that. And that's it. That's your introduction to complex numbers. And we make very neat notes using a Pluto notebook and we make life very easy for ourselves. Look at here, we write this cross and we take the cross product of these two complex numbers, three plus four I and two plus four I, and lo and behold, we get this solution um, right there. 0, 0, 4. And you can read why that is so. Why with a cross product do we have the solution that is perpendicular to the Argan diagram? That just brings us with two very important uh, things to note when it comes to the dot and the cross product. If you take the dot product of two vec two complex numbers and they are 0, the dot product 0, then it means either, it, it just really means that the two uh, vectors that make up the complex numbers are perpendicular to each other and if we take the magnitude of the cross product if that is zero it means these two values are perpendicular to each other so read this last part it's quite fascinating the dot and the cross product of complex numbers so learn how to write this uh, bit of code how to do a bit of LaTeX just write normal English sentences in some of these code cells give it a go your work will be so much neater, you'll understand it better, it looks good, the solutions are very well written, and as far as it's very neat to do it, in, to do your mathematics uh, homework, or at least your notes inside of a notebook environment such as this. I hope you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, uh, subscribe to this channel, that is the most important thing. I bring out a variety of educational resources, it's just something that I love to do, uh, when I'm not in the hospital uh, doing my day and sometimes night job as a surgeon. I love to make these. Please appreciate it by, uh, by joining uh, this, uh, this channel and this community and leave, leave a comment down below as well. So I've got some videos on Julia. I've even got a course on Coursera that you can get official certificate from the University of Cape Town if you uh, want to learn some Julia. So have a look on Coursera.org, the biggest massive open online course platform in the world, and look up Julia for Scientific Computing, and you'll see the course there by myself and one of my colleagues in the mathematics department, Andre Laurie, and that's a fantastic course as well. Otherwise, check out all my videos here on YouTube and learn about using Julia and do your mathematics, uh, at least the numerical part, uh, with Julia. So the noise that you're in the background, that's just the, the uh, tractor playing the field. So what we're going to talk about in this, in this uh, video is just about uh, vectors in Euclidean space. So an introduction to, to linear algebra. But what I want to motivate for is to make your notes inside of a computer coding environment. And to use that computer language to help you understand uh, the topic and also to prepare you for the future. If you're going to learn linear algebra, linear algebra is used in many fields from data science to engineering, physics, it's just used everywhere. You might as well learn uh, to use linear algebra with a coding language. So I think there, there, there are many positives and it's easy to motivate for the fact that you should do your work with, uh, with a computer language. So we're going to use uh, Julia. Julia is a language for scientific computing. And we're going to use uh, one of its coding environments called Pluto, which is a notebook which runs inside of your browser. And I've got other videos here on YouTube which just shows you how to use and install it. This video, though, is about uh, vectors and about uh, Euclidean space. And uh, so our notes are going to be nice and neat. And uh, we're also going to use just a bit of easy, very simple code just to, to check our results using vectors in, in, in Euclidean space. So uh, I'm not going to do a bunch of proofs. If you want a video on the proofs, you'll hear me mention in the video, then uh, certainly make one and I'll try to make some notes uh, available that, that is very clear and precise about how to construct the proofs and 
when you are dealing with vectors in Euclidean space. And um, so let me show you what it looks like to do and uh, to do your work, to do your linear algebra, and to study really using a computer language inside of a coding environment. I've opened the Pluto notebook, and as you can see there, there we go, the whole lot. So everything is typed, all the notes are available in the link down below, so you can uh, in, uh, load this uh, notebook for yourself. So vectors in Euclidean space. Yes, you can do your mathematics work right here inside of a Pluto notebook. It looks very neat. As you can see, you can draw figures there. You can write very beautiful code. And I'll just along the way show you. So it's, it's a lot to learn. And we're going to learn about vectors in Euclidean space. We're going to learn how to uh, do calculations in the Julia language. And then also how to, how to generate a notebook such as this. So these are the cells uh, right at the top. So you'll see there's a little eyeball sign there with a line through it that's shown hide the code. So if I open that, we can see the code. So in a Pluto notebook, of course, the code is below the cell, it's at the bottom of the cell, and you see the execution up above. The MD stands for markdown, and then a set of quotation marks, open and qu uh, close quotation marks, and inside of there would go some normal English. So there's my name, but there's also that little greater than sign, and that indicates to Pluto that it should make this, uh, this background here and uh, make the code or, or make the execution at least of that cell look good and I can just hide the code there and you see the pluses on top of the bottom so if I wanted to insert a new cell to write some code that'd be fine so here's my title and that will also be a markdown cell so MD with an open and closed uh, set of quotation marks there and then we're going to use these hashtag symbols in a space so a single hashtag that will be the largest text that would be an H1 tag in HTML. And if I open the setup, you'll see the setup is slightly smaller the text uh, that, than the title. So this will be um, uh, one smaller, so two hashtags there. And that's just how you do it. You can go up to six hashtags. That'll be the smallest. But you put the MD and the opening closing quotation marks there to indicate that a cell is just a, a markdown cell as opposed to a cell with some code in. And here we see the code. And if you're familiar with Julia, um, you'll have to be a little bit familiar with Julia before we start start with this. But what I've done here with the setup, I've created a computer variable called file, and I'm using the assignment operator. And in quotation marks, I've got this um, address to this project.toml file inside of this folder structure on my hard drive. And that project.toml file, that is a specific environment for which we have this linear algebra with Julia, this project that I do have. And uh, you can watch my video, uh, the, description, uh, the link in the description down below, how to set up a notebook and a Julia environment. So we're going to use the package, pkg package. We're going to then activate, use pkg.activate to activate this project.toml file by just passing file as an argument to the activate function there. We're also going to use the linear algebra package that's built into Julia. We can use the plots package with the plotly backend. So you'll have to install those uh, in this environment. And again, uh, the link will show you in the description, it'll show you how to do that. And we can also use the random, the random uh, module or random package that's built in. And then also uh, Pluto UI. So you'll have to install Pluto UI as well. So that's the setup. So that is how you bring extra functionality into Julia and how you activate this environment. So, a little bit then about what this video is all about. Just um, vectors in Euclidean space. So, you know, we use vectors quite a lot. They're important uh, uh, as uh, mathematical objects, as physical objects. Um, they find the uses uh, uh, in data structures, uh, in engineering, physics, many other fields. Um, throughout this notebook, we're going to just be concerned with these vectors in Euclidean space. So that's the fundamental space in classical geometry, um, where we have the, the real number line. As you can see here, if we get to points, let's get to those points. So remember, we have the real number line, and then we have the Cartesian plane. That's our two real number lines, orthogonal to each other, with an intersection at x equals 0 and y equals 0. All those x's are real numbers, all the y's are real numbers, and that gives us these uh, the ability to plot these points in the Cartesian plane. If we add another orthogonal um, 
access to that, another real number line, the Z line, according to the right hand rule, we now have Euclidean space, um, three dimensional space, etc. So I just have this point. Now point requires two real numbers in in these in these axes that you see in x axis and y axis. Remember they're both real numbers. So we create this two tuple. A tuple is just a set of values, and there are two of them in this instance. So if we want to plot a point in the Cartesian plane, we need a two tuple. And so there we see a point there, p3, uh, so a point will we'll use uppercase letters and then no space, open close parentheses, 3,2. So that means on the first real number would be 3, so a 3 along this, and you can see the 3 there at the bottom, and then 2 along the second real, real line. So I'm just taking two elements, one from uh, each <coughs> set of real numbers, and that gives me this idea of R2. Um, by the way, back and forth between code and the notebook and the actual uh, topic under discussion, vectors in Euclidean space. So let's let just look at this. So if I open that to show the code, again, that'd be a markdown cell. There we go. So it's got to have the open and close set of quotation marks. And how would I do that two as a as a, as a number, well, we use LaTeX, and all LaTeX code goes inside of a set of dollar symbols. And um, there we go here at the end, this double struck R, or blackboard R, to indicate a set of real numbers. That'll be backslash math BB for math blackboard, and then R, and then shift 6 on my keyboard for the caret symbol. 2, that means the uppercase or... or uh, uh, superscript 2, and again all of that is in, in a set of dollar symbols to indicate to the notebook that this is LaTeX code, and that's just how you construct these. So I'm showing you here so that I can pique your interest so that you can go look up and explore for yourself how to do this. So there's our figure, we're going to use the plots package for that, and in Pluto remember if I have more than one line of code I've got to wrap that into a begin and end statement. And so I'm going to make x this array with a single value in it, 3, y, I'm going to assign the computer variable y to this array with a single value 2, then I'm going to say plot x, y, and the series type is a symbol, and symbol in Julia is always a colon, then a word, so this will be colon scatter, that's the scatter symbol, telling the plot function here that we want a single uh, or scatter plot at least and I'm giving it a title there's one of the arguments figure one so that's where the figure one comes show axis is false and the label is uh, point so 3,2 is going to be this point up here so I can uh, just click on that point to to uh, isolate it well and anyway here at the top you can see I can download this as a PNG we can uh, zoom in a little bit and then we can go back home, etc. And that's why I love I love Plotly because we have this uh, great interactivity. Now we've got this point on a real number line. Now we've got this point in a plane, but we needn't stop there. Of course, we can go to the Cartesian plane and rectangular coordinates. There will be three elements, and we can go up from there. And uh, we just denote hyperspace there as this double struck double struck R or blackboard R with a, super, with a superscript N. So that just means, you know, we can go beyond three space. So let's look at vectors as geometric objects. So what I can do um, with this point is let's connect the origin to the point, such as that I have this little arrow. So this would be the tail of the arrow at 0, 0, and that will be the head of this arrow at the point. And now this makes it a, a vector. So instead of just a point, I now have a vector. And the idea behind this vector would be that it has a magnitude, we'll see. It is of a certain length. And it makes a certain angle with a positive x-axis. So there will be an angle. So this vector idea is a physical object. A geometric object at least is just going to be this something that has a length and a direction. But you can see clearly it comes from a point. And I needn't have the tail yet, the origin. Later on we'll see that the tail can be anywhere. 
but if we bring it down so that the tail is at the, at the origin here, it becomes a, a what we call position vector. So it's easy to understand or intuitively understand a vector as, a, as this geometric object, um, but we're more interested in, uh, in vectors as mathematical objects. So there are various ways that we can denote this, how we can write this. Usually we'll name a vector in your textbook, it'll usually be an, a bold face, a lowercase symbol, so that's a bold face there, U. So let's just open this up back to the notebook, just to uh, pique your interest. So this is how it's done, it's a markdown cell, we see it's in the opening and closing dollar symbols, so that's going to be a uh, LaTeX code, and to get the, uh, the, the bold face U would be math BF. So that's backslash math bf, so that's a, a keyword in LaTeX, uh, u, that goes inside of the set of curly braces. And then this large angled brackets, we do that with a left, backslash left um, less than symbol, and then close it with a backslash right greater than symbol. And that changes it to these big angle brackets, and then just a 3,2 inside of there. So it's very easy to pick up um, at least this type or the subset of LaTeX that's used in notebooks. Anyway, so we can use these angle brackets to denote this vector 3, 2. So it'll go from the origin to the point 3, 2 in the Cartesian plane. We can also use this column vector notation. And in linear algebra, you'll see a lot of this column vector. And column vectors, we can write them with those angle brackets or with the large parentheses. doesn't really matter. And then we have the fact that we have the different axes here. So the first one will be at the top, and then the second one, if we had a third one, as we can see here, here u, our vector is an element of R3. So we'll have x, y, and z. But I told you we needn't stop there, so just in, uh, some generic vector uh, as an element of Rn will have components. These are all called components, and we write them down here as a single column vector. Column meaning there's a single column, multiple rows. So we spoke about this length idea of a vector, so let's look at that magnitude of a vector. Now it's very easy to work out the magnitude of a vector, even if I didn't tell you, tell you, you would know. Because if I have a vector like that, I can just close it off as this right angle triangle, and if I have a right angle triangle, that becomes the hypotenuse, the vector is now the hypotenuse, and we all know how to do how to calculate the length of the hypotenuse. We just use the Pythagorean theorem, so that'll be just the square root of this component, the x component, plus the square, well, the square root of the square of these two added to each other. So it's the square of the x component, the square of the plus the square of the y component, and we just take the square root of that, and that gives us the hypotenuse. So you can see again how I just constructed. Uh, uh, use some Julia code in the plots library to construct that little figure 3 there. So what we have here, and uh, I'm going to use both of the terminologies that we have. Um, this, this almost looks like an, an, an absolute, uh, uh, absolute symbol there, so the absolute value of minus 3 is 3. Um, so you can have the double lines there, or the single lines. I'm going to, show, I'm going to use both. For you, I've just used the, the single lines. But clearly that's a, a bold face U, so that's a vector. And it's just the square of all the components. And with the Pythagorean theorem, we need not just stop at uh, the Cartesian plane. We can go up into uh, hyperspace. And uh, that means I just square all the components, add all of that, those squares, and I take the square root of that. So let's say in Julia, we have, uh, we have this idea of creating a vector in Julia. So I'm going to call my vector u, so that's a computer variable, and I assign something to that. So how computer language works, remember, or, or Julia at least, is this single equal sign is an assignment operator. It assigns what is to the right to what is to its left. So look, let's have a look at what is to its right. To its right is this two values separated by a semicolon, and it's enclosed in these square brackets. That denotes a certain type, and that type is, a, is an array. And uh, this array has two elements, and they're separated by a semicolon, and that really uh, means that they are, it's going to be like a column vector. And we're going to use an array, and we're going to express it or, or use it as a column vector. So this thing on the right is an array. This is one instance of an array. So I am assigning an instance of an array to a computer variable, u, 
that U just denotes there's some physical space in memory and we're going to store this instance of this array into that computer variable, into that um, space. And you can see the return there is a 64-bit integer array, 3,2. And if I twirl that down, you'll see the first value is 3, the second value is 2, denoting this idea of this being a column vector. Um, if we use the type of function u there, we see indeed that that'll tell you if you pass anything to it, um, to the type of function, it'll tell you what kind of Julia data type this is. And it says, well, it's an array of 64-bit integers along axis 1. Oh, now, axis 1 is the column axis. As soon as you have rows uh, or different columns, more than one column, that, that becomes axis 2. And that'll change to a 2. And that's how you'll uh, get a matrix or a row vector. We'll see that later. So just, just to, to show you that we've created this vector, this column vector, but it is in actual fact an array. So we can also just use the vector function, uppercase V. Again, I'm now just going to use this, this array notation, and I'm just going to separate things by a comma. And that's just an alias for what we've done right up there. Just note the difference, but what we have is exactly the same thing. And if we see the type of vector and then this list of elements 3,2, that's still going to be an array of 64-bit integers along one axis 1. So let's look at our first problem then. And so you might get to this, that you have this vector in R4 with components 3, 3, negative 1, and 2. And we want to know what is the magnitude of that vector. Now, first of all, you can't really visualize that vector because where are you going to put the fourth dimension? But there's no problem in, in, in mathematics. And we're just going to use the Pythagorean theorem. Or we weigh up again here with this equation we had, equation 5. Remember, that's how to do it. So all we're going to do, we're just going to square all those components. And we're going to add that and take the square root of that. And that's uh, approximately 4.796. That's, of course, tedious to do. Maybe you'll have to do it in, in pencil and paper, pen and paper. But, of course, in Julia here, I can use the norm function. And the norm function because the norm of a vector is the same as the magnitude of a vector. We use it in a slightly different context, but anyway, I'm just passing this column vector to it. And now remember, I'm using this notation, the square bracket notation, where I put semicolons in between each of these values. So the 3, the 3, the negative 1, and the 2, the, all the components, I pass that as an argument to the norm function. And when I execute that, I get the result there, 4.79... Um, 6, round it off, and that's exactly what we get there if you did it by hand and used a calculator or whatever. Of course, this is Julia. Let me, let me just show you. So let's just add a new little line right there. Going to go to that plus symbol there. And what is the square root of 23? So SQRT is the function for square root. I'm going to say 23. I'm going to hold down Shift and hit Return or Shift Enter. And there we go. We see the result there. So I really wasn't lying. So that norm function is no matter what vector you give it or array, then a column with with column values, you're gonna get you're gonna get the solution. So we also talked about the, the idea of the direction a vector takes. Now, once again, if we scroll all the way back up, very easy to do with trigonometry because we still have a right angle triangle, and we have this length, we the y length, we have the x length, and in, in, in trigonometry that's just the opposite and adjacent angles. And the tangent of this angle here would be opposite divided by adjacent. So that's a simple, really as simple as that. So the tangent of that angle is y over x, the y component over the x component. And if we take the inverse tangent function or the arctangent function of that, we just get the angle. So here we have another little problem. Um, calculate the direction of the vector in the first quadrant with components x equals 3 and y equals 2. Well, very easy. I'm going to use the atan function a tan for inverse tangent or arc tangent, and I'm going to say 2 over 3. And remember, you don't have a symbol on your keyboard, a divide symbol. Uh, so we just use the forward slash 2 divided by 3, and that gives me this solution in radians. And if you want it in, that, in degrees, there's also the rad 2 deg radians 2 degrees function. And then I pass this, again, this calculation, a tan of 2 over 3 to it, and I see it's about 33.69 degrees. 
very simple to do. Let's do another problem. Calculate the direction of the ve vector in the second quadrant of the plane. So components x equals negative 3 and y equals 2. So now what happens is we're interested in the angle between the positive x-axis and this vector pointing towards the point uh, from the origin to the point negative 3 comma 2. So we're going to have this obtuse angle. We're always going to go from the positive x-axis counterclockwise. That's what we're interested in in quadrants 1 and 2. But we see we get this result, negative 0.58. So what that is telling us, what the, that result is showing us, if we just think about the, arc, uh, the inverse um, tangent function, mm -hmm. is that's going to give us the angle going in a clockwise direction from the negative x-axis up to our vector. And to get the, the expression that we really want, that we really want, we've just got to add pi radians to that, and that's going to give us the other side, in other words, from the positive x-axis all the way around counterclockwise to uh, the vector. So we get the real solution there, 2.55 radians. Now we're going to get to quadrants 3 and 4. Now there we express things differently. So in quadrants 1 and 2, we want this idea of going counterclockwise from the positive uh, x-axis. So we're going to get this acute angle in quadrant 1 and this obtuse angle in quadrant 2. But if we get to quadrant 3 and 4, what we actually want to do there is still go from the positive x-axis, but go, go downwards clockwise to the vector. And then, because it's clockwise, we want that expressed as negative angles. So in the fourth quadrant, it'll be this negative acute angle. And in the third quadrant, it's in this negative obtuse angle. So let's just see. So we've got this idea of, uh, where were we? We've got this calculate the direction of the vector in the third quadrant of the plane with components x equals negative 3 and y equals negative 2. So if we do that, we get this solution, 0.58. But what that is going to do, that's again, that is from the negative x-axis going counterclockwise. And that's not what we want. We want from the positive x-axis going downwards clockwise to that. So what do we have to do? We've got to add that to negative pi radians. And I've shown you pi there all along. Let me just show you how nice it is to get a pi symbol in code. That's something you can't do in many other languages. I'm going to just hit in a code cell my backslash and then pi and then the tab symbol and that should give me pi and there we go pi and if I just do that it's going to give me uh, an approximation for the value of pi so that's as simple as that to get pi and if I go just there I can just delete that cell so it's negative pi plus that arc tangent and then we're going to get the, the real solution negative 2.55 radians so it's going from the positive x-axis counterclockwise, so uh, clockwise I should say, downwards this obtuse angle. And then when we get to the fourth quadrant, um, say x equals 3, y equals negative 2, we get this value that we're interested in, this negative acute angle, positive x-axis downwards clockwise to that. So the only place that we need to make changes is in the second and third quadrants. So uh, using the arctangent function. So in the second quadrant we're going to add pi to the solution, and in the third quadrant, we're going to add negative pi to it. So if you remember that, you're never going to make a mistake in calculating, in calculating uh, the correct angles or expressing them correctly. So when are vectors, vectors equal? So we see these two vectors there. Now, I think you would agree just looking at it, and that is how I designed them. They're pointing in the same direction, and they have the same magnitude. In... Vectors for, for us, for looking uh, from a linear algebra, linear algebra point of view, those are exactly the same thing. So I can have this translation on, on, in space or on the plane, but it remains the same vector. I can move that so the tail of the bottom one, the purple one, the vector 2 is also at the origin, and then those two points, the two heads will coincide, and we have exactly the same vector. So vectors, no matter where I draw them on the plane, if they have the same magnitude and same direction, they're exactly the same thing. Nothing changes, and you see my little argument there. So if that P, uh, I've got the two, the, the, the vector P, uh, the point P and the point Q. So P would be at 0, 0, and Q would be at 3, 2. So that would be this 0, 0 there, and 3, 2. 
Okay, if I look at the vector PQ, that'll be just Q1 minus Q2 and um, Q1 minus P1 and Q2 minus P2. And that gives us this 3 comma 2 because it's 3 minus 0 and 2 minus 0. And if I have this P point P prime and P and Q prime, uh, uh, P prime sub 1 being negative 1, P prime sub 2 being negative 1, and you see the values there for Q prime, the two points. But if I do the subtraction once again, I also end up at 3 comma 2. So really PQ equals P prime Q prime. But you can, you can see that so intuitively there. Same direction, same magnitude, it's exactly the same vector. That brings us just to this idea of row vectors. So we express them as a column. In mathematical, in, 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 if we do some calculations in, in future notebooks, uh, if we get the row vectors become quite important as well. And uh, we can take a column vector and we have this, uh, this operation called the transpose. So you just make the column into a row. So every column component becomes an element in the row component. So remember u, there was u, and it was 3, 2. I can twirl it down, it's 3, 2, and now you use the transpose on that. And now it becomes the 64-bit integers uh, in an array. So it's an array of 64-bit integers um, expressed in this way, 3, 2. And so instead of it being a column there, you see it's now a row. And this is how you do it. There's equation 8 make, should make it all clear. I have this vector u and r in space, u1, u2, all the way to un. And I take the transpose of that, so that'd be u and then this uh, superscript uppercase t. And ev every element there in the column becomes an element in the row. So as simple as that, u transpose. And um, that becomes a, a useful thing to do. Now let's look at a bit of vector arithmetic, very important. So we're going to start by looking at vector addition and we see how we have, how we define vector addition. This is how we define it and it's very intuitive as well from, from fig figure number five. So I've got my two vectors here, this one at the bottom, this red one, and then this purple one here. And all I'm doing, this purple one was also expressed as a position vector. So its tail was also down here and its head was, uh, was somewhere here, but we just move it so that its tail is at the head of the first vector. And then if we add them, it's just adding the x components of the two and adding the y components of the two to get this top one, this resultant vector. So if you look at equation nine there, we just add the two components, u1 and v1, u2 and v2, all the way down. So for all, so this upside down a, that means for all, let me just show you the LaTeX for that, that's all the LaTeX there. If you get your hands on the notebook, you can study that. So we're just adding these components as you can see. So for all U and V elements of Rn, it follows that U plus V is that. We're just adding the components in, and from this figure it should make intuitive sense. So we are tasked in problem six with creating two random vectors in R4 and we're gonna add them. So in the random package, there's this idea of uh, this function random dot seed exclamation mark. That exclamation mark is called a bang. And you can pass to that any integer. I'm passing 12 to it. So if I execute that and then I use the random package to generate random values, well, they pseudo, pseudo random values, it's going to generate the same values every time because I've seeded the pseudo random number generator. So what are we going to do? Rand function there from the rand package. We use a unit range, 1 colon 5. And because we don't have a step size, the default step size of this unit range is 1. So from 1 to 5, it'll have elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'm saying, take from the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and, and give me 4 back at random, please. So what happens is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 is in a bucket, piece of paper, you know, 5 pieces of paper. And I draw a piece of paper, and the first one was a 5. So I jot it down, throw the 5 back, mix them up again draw at random again. So every time each of those five values has an equal uh, likelihood of being chosen. So what it came up with was 5424, four, and if you seeded the pseudo random number generator with 12 as well, you're going to get exactly the same random values. I've created another vector, vector underscore 2, and again just from the random um, rand, rand function, again with the same unit range, four values, and, and it gave me vector 1543. And I just say vector 1 plus vector 2. And indeed, 5, there's the 5, the first component. Um, 
there we go, for the 5 plus the 1, that's the 6, that's how I'll get with this, the 6, the 4, the 5 is 9, etc. Very simple, but if you do that in code, it's even simpler. Vector underscore 1 plus vector underscore 2 is going to give you that column vector. Very, sim very simple. Scalar vector multiplication is just as simple. So we're going to take this scalar, C, element of, of a real number, and U, that's an element of any arbitrary vector then in space. It follows that CU equals just multiplying every component by that scalar. And that scalar vector multiplication is simple as that. So problem 7, multiply vector 1 by 3. It'll just be 3 times vector 1. As simple as that. And each element in vector 1 is now just multiplied by, by 3. What does that do though? So one reason to like this, these Pluto notebooks is that you have the Pluto UI package that we imported and that allows us to create this variable c here and we're going to use the macro at bind and we're going to bind to c this slider and the slider uses a unit range from negative 2 to 2 as I said we don't have a step size so the step size by default is 1 so negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1 and 2 so this slider is going to be linked to that to those values so what I've done here at the bottom is I've created this vector 2 comma 2 but I'm multiplying each one of them by C so what I'm doing here is this this vector 2 comma 2 and all we're doing to this vector we're scaling it so that'll be negative 2 times the vector 2 comma 2 and that will be negative 1 now it gets a bit shorter 0 there's no vector because if I 0 times 2 is 0 0 times 2 is 0 1 there's my original vector and it scales. So what does scalar vector multiplication do? Well, it just scales a vector, makes it shorter and longer, doesn't change the direction, and in, in as much as the line that runs through that, it can go in the 180 degrees or pi radians opposite direction by making the scalar negative for sure, but it stays in that same stays in that same line. So we can also then think of what it does to the magnitude. So the magnitude of this scalar vector multiplication is just take that vector and just multiply it by the scalar. The magnitude of that vector multiplied by the scalar, as simple as that. And that gives us this idea of how to subtract vectors from each other. Because what I can do is I can just multiply the second vector by negative 1, the scalar negative 1. Now it points in the opposite direction, so instead of a plus, v, I have a plus negative v, and that's the same as, or u plus negative v, that'll be the same as u minus v, exactly the same thing. u minus v is just u plus scalar vector multiplication at the end, negative 1 times v. And that also gives us this sort of scalar uh, vector division, in as much as, as long as that scalar is not 0, I can have this idea of dividing a vector by a scalar and it's just this uh, reciprocal 1 over the scalar times u so every element will just be multiplied by 1 over that scalar so that's very simple v vector addition it's basically all we have because vector subtraction is still vector addition by adding a bit of scalar vector multiplication and just making that scalar negative 1. So when you have these two operations basically, vector addition and scalar vector multiplication. Now we get to something a bit different and that's the dot product between two vectors and you'll have to do a lot of examples I think in your exams etc of, of dot product and, and the other one is a cross product. So let's start with a dot product and we see the definition here in equation 14. So for all vectors u and v, element in R n, so you can take any two vectors in that space, it follows that u dot v, we write that as the u transpose dot v. And what that really is, and when we get to matrices we'll see what that really means, is that we just multiply the components, pair by pair, and we just add all of those. So u1 times v1, plus u2 times v2, plus. So you can see the answer is going to be a scalar. So let's look at problem 8. Um, so we asked to generate two vectors in R4 and calculate their dot product. So again, I'm going to see the pseudo-random number generator. I'm going to use the rand function 
tw twice and just generate these four. Now I've just said one to five, but you can choose any unit range you want so that you don't just get elements between one and five. You can make negative five to five, whatever you want. But four elements, that's important. So I've got my two vectors again, and because the seeded random, random num number generator was, was seeded with a value 12, we get exactly the same two vectors as before. And then to do the dot product is uh, very simple in as much as we use the dot function, dot function, and then we just put in these two vectors separated by a comma, and we get the answer 45. And here we go, I'm just going to show you, there's my two column vectors that we generated up there. So it's 5 times 1 plus 4 times 5 plus 2 times 4 plus 4 times 3, that's 5 plus 20 plus 8 plus 12, and that gives us 45, and there's the dot product's 45. No problem. So what about the dot product of a vector with itself? So we read here, the dot product has some interesting prop properties. First, the dot product of a vector with itself is always positive, or it can be zero. So I'm talking u dot u. Now, it's always positive because we, what we're doing is component times component. In other words, that's component square if the vector is dotted with itself. And square is always positive. So we're just going to get a positive, And the only way that we can get zero is if it's the zero vector. And lo and behold, the zero vector, of course, does exist. All the elements are just zero. So if we look at u dot u there, and the, if the vector is 3, 4, negative 3, and problem 8, it's 3 squared plus 4 squared plus negative 3 squared, and that gives us 34. And again, if I do that with a dot product, I'm going to get the same answer, 34, as simple as that. So in actual fact, what we're doing here is just taking the dot product as nothing other than just taking the magnitude of the vector and squaring it. As simple as that. Another interesting fact that we'll see here is if the two vectors are orthogonal, which is a fancy word for perpendicular to each other, the dot product will always be zero. Or then if you do the dot product between two non-zero vectors, and it turns out to be zero, you know that those two vectors are orthogonal to each other. And you can see the code there. So let's take these two, they're clearly orthogonal, 3 and 5, and negative 5 and 3, and if you take the dot product between those, it's 0. Now there's three more properties that you'll see in your textbook, is that there's this commutative property in vector, uh, the dot product between two vectors. We have this distribu uh, distribution over addition, so u um, dot v plus w, that should be u dot v plus u dot w, and this distribution of the scalar as well, as you can see there. So let's look at, at the dot product a bit differently, because what is it? I mean, we're just multiplying the component-wise and adding all the products, but what is it? And the first way we're going to look at it is just this, the dot product as a function of the angle between two vectors. I and mean, what we're going to do is we're going to use this uh, the, um, the law of cosines. So if I have two sides of a triangle, A and B, and the angle between them being theta, and then opposite theta we'll get the other side of the triangle, we'll call that C, and then we get this idea of the law of cosine that C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2BC cosine theta. Now think about a triangle. Let's make A the length of A. Let's make A a vector and B a vector and C a vector. And if A is a vector, its length is going to be the magnitude of A, and the length of the side B is going to be the magnitude of the vector B, and then C, and I want you to play with that, C would be A minus B. So draw yourself on paper some vectors and look at A minus B. So that's A plus negative B. And translate that vector, and you'll see it neatly forms that third side of the triangle. So to write this out, c would then be, c squared would be a minus b, that magnitude of that different squared. a squared would be the magnitude of a squared. b would be the magnitude of b squared minus 2bc. Uh, so, so there should be bc there. So let's fix that. So that's minus 2. Oh, ab is right. Um, up there should be ab. There we go, minus 2 AB. There we go, fixed. C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine theta. And that's what we have there. 
But let's look at what in equation 9, what a minus b is. Remember, that will be component-wise subtraction, a1 minus b1 and a2 minus b2 as a vector. And if we take the magnitude of this a minus b, which is c, there'll be a1 minus b1 squared plus a2 minus b2 squared, and add that and take the square root of all of that. And if we square both sides, that's what we have. And if on the right-hand side we just expand these two squares, that's what we get and we just group these terms together, then we get a1 squared plus a2 squared. Well, that's the magnitude of a squared. b sub 1 squared plus b sub 2 squared. Well, that's the magnitude of b squared. And minus 2 times a1 b1 plus a2 b2. Well, what is that? Well, that's a dot b. So this is what we have left. So now, a minus b magnitude squared, we have two equations for it. There's 1 in 18, and there's 2 in number 2 and 19, so we just uh, equate these two to each other, so that these magnitude squares, they all cancel out, the negative 2's cancel out, and I have this new way to look at the dot product. The dot product is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them, or we can just take the arc cosine, uh, well, take the magnitudes towards the other side and take the arc cosine or inverse cosine function, and that gives me theta. So let's just do that, calculate the angle between these two vectors. So that's very simple, and you can see the code for it there using the arc to a cos for arc cosine or inverse co cosine function. I'm taking the, two do the dot product of those two vectors and then dividing it by the product of the two magnitudes using the norm function. And again, I can express this as radians 2 degrees with that function, and that gives us 38 degrees. As simple as that. The Cauchy-Schwarz Cauchy inequality, you see that there. You might be asked to do that, and there's a little problem for you there using the dot product. And we also get this Minkowski triangle inequality, which you see there. Now, I don't do any proofs in this video set, but let me know if you want a video on how to do the proofs of these. They're actually um, quite fun, uh, fun to do. But you can see um, that we have this little problem 11 then, the solution just taking the norm of the addition and then the addition of the norms there. And you'll see, of course, that one is smaller than the other. Uh, I skip over those quite quickly because what I want to get to really is this idea of orthogonal projections because that's really what a dot product is. Remember, we're getting a, a scalar out. So let's look at these two. I have vector w in this image here and vector a there. And I can take this idea of the orthogonal component of, of, of w along a. So from w, I draw this line down to a and it's orthogonal to a so that I can decompose w into two components so that the one component is along a and the other component is, of course, orthogonal to a. So what the dot product really is and what we're going to see is, is really the multiplication of the component of w along a called the projection of w along a and multiplied by a. And um, let me let the cat out the bag, if you think of physics, work equals force times distance, but it's only the component of the force along the displacement, force times displacement, but only the component of the force along the displacement contributes to the work. And now you can think why if I have two orthogonal vectors that their dot product is zero, because if my force is totally orthogonal to the displacement, that force is doing no work whatsoever because there's no component of that force along the displacement vector. Anyway, if you have a PNG file saved on your hard drive, you can use this local resource function. And that local resource function is, of course, a function in the plot uh, Pluto UI package. And you can just reference it where it is on your hard drive and it'll draw the figure for you, the, 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 the PNG file for you there. So that is the derivation of this idea of the projection of W along A. So W, if you think of W, I can deconstruct it into U plus V. In other words, use W minus V. Just a bit of simple algebra. So U, remember, we're gonna, that is the projection of W along A, and that's how we write it, P-R-O-J of W along A. So the little subscript A there. 
that is u, so the different notation for u, so that's w minus v. But if you think of what u is, it's now along a, so it's just a scalar multiple of a, so we can write it as k times a, and that k times a there, remember that k is just a scalar. So now that we have another way to write uh, w, uh, another way to write u, I should say, we started with, with, with w equals u plus k, so we can rewrite w equals k a plus v. So what are we going to do if we have w dot a, that's what we're interested in here. Well, I have w written differently here, k a, k times a plus v, dot a. So it's just rewriting w because we've got another way to write w there. And if I do this, we've looked at those properties, that will be k times a dot a plus v dot a. Look back at those properties. And a dot a, remember that's the square of the magnitude, so I have k times the square of that magnitude of a plus v a. But v and a they're orthogonal to each other, if you look at the image, so that's zero. So just solving for k, I have k equals w dot a divided by the magnitude square of a. So we have what k is. Now we can just put k back into what we have here, u equals k times a. So u being the projection of w along a, that is the dot product of w and a, divided by the magnitude of a squared times a. So w dot a, that is going to give us a dot product, and that is a scalar, divided by the magnitude, that's a scalar. So we have this big scalar um, times a. And that's exactly what u is. It's this scalar ver scaled version of a. Now we can also work out this idea of the magnitude of the projections. So we just take the projection here of u, and so that will be, we can also put double lines there, um, which means we can take this a out as, on the right hand side here, as a, as a magnitude. And we have a magnitude over magnitude squared, so that's going to cancel. So this length of this component this length of this component of w long a, or the length of u, we see there as the absolute value of that dot product divided by a's magnitude. And that's exactly where we get this idea of work equals force times difference, uh, times the displacement, those vectors. So it's this idea of w, if w is the force and a is the displacement, it's this idea here. I'm just bringing the A over to the other side of the proje projection. So you get this idea of what the dot product is used for. So instead of the dot product, we also get the cross product, but first we just have to look at the unit vectors, and that's just taking a vector and scaling it down so that its magnitude is 1. And the way that we do that is we just take a vector and we divide it by, and we've already seen this, 1 over c times a vector, so it's a type of scalar vector multiplication. But at the bottom we have the magnitude of u. So each component is just going to be divided by the magnitude. And then we put this little hat symbol on top of it, and it's no longer boldface, and that's the unit vector of u. So it's still in the same direction as u, it just has now has a magnitude of 1. So there's problem 12. I have u, and that is 3, 4, and 0. And I just want the magnitude of that, so I'll take the norm of that. So I've created the vector underscore u there, take the norm of that, the norm is 5. And so I'm going to take vector u and divide it by 5. So each component is going to be divided by 5. And then I get 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 0. So that's still in the same direction, it is just now has um, a unit length. So its magnitude is 1. Of course, if we think of the three axes of the Cart of Cartesian space, um, or the Cartesian plane then, with this two component, we have this unit vectors along each of the axes, and we call those the unit basis vectors, and we write those as i hat, j hat, and k hat, and you can see the components there making absolute sense. Because we have now this idea of the cross product. So what, you ha what happens is with, with a cross product is, a cross product is um, 
orthogonal to the plane created by the two vectors that you're taking the cross product on. So if the two cross products are in the plane, the result will be perpendicular to the plane. So I need that to have that third uh, dimension. And it's also the right hand rule and your thumb points in the, in the direction. We write it as u cross v, as you can see there. And we do that by taking the determinant of this matrix here. But we haven't studied matrices, so I can't really explain to you what's going on there. Just trust me then that if you take the determinant of this matrix and you write on the first row the three unit basis vectors, and as, as, a, as row vectors you write the two others, now you have a little three by three matrix. You take the determinant of that, and that is just going to give you the cross product. We can also be easy in Julia, just use the cross function, create my two vectors, and the cross function cross with that would be now look at this. My vectors were along 2, 0, 2, 2, 1, 0. So I've got to express, even though those vectors are on the plane, I've got to express them as, as vectors in three space, in R3. Um, because my result is going to be in R3. So I have these two vectors on the, in the plane, but look at the cross product. It'll have 0, 0 in the xy plane, their components, but negative 5 in the z component. So it is going to be orthogonal to the plane. So what's the physical interpretation, even though we can't yet explain exactly what's going on here before we've looked at matrices, is that if I have these two vectors, now look at this vector down the bottom here, and this red vector going there, and all I've done is I've completed them by translation so that I can form this parallelogram. So this parallelogram has an area, and the base of it is, well, there's the point 3, so it has a base of 3 and a height of 2, so it's base times perpendicular height, 3 times 2 is 6. The area of this parallelogram formed by these two vectors, these two position vectors, the red one here and the brown one down here, they form a parallelogram if we extend it and, and translate the two of them. And the area of that, well, that's the cross product. We said it was 6, and lo and behold, if you take the cross product of those two vectors, 3 and 0 and 5 and 2, you get the, um, um, the norm of that uh, magnitude, or the norm of that vector, that would just be 6. Its length is 6. And that magnitude, at least, is the area of this parallelogram, the magnitude of the cross product. Then we get this thing called the scalar triple product. So I'm going to take first the cross product between the two vectors and that resultant orthogonal vector to those two vectors. I dot that with u and um, then I get the scalar triple product. And this is how we do it, the determinant of the three vectors written here as row vectors. And if I get that determinant, that's going to give me the scalar triple product. And what that really is, is those three vectors, if they're all position vectors, they form a parallelepiped. And this, this uh, scalar triple product, which is a scalar, gives me the volume of that parallelepiped. Which brings us to this last idea of spanning. Now, if I think of the vectors, the unit vectors, basis unit vectors, I had and J hat. A linear combination of them, and this is a linear combination, is that I just take a vector and I multiply it by a scalar and another vector multiplied by a scalar and I add that. That I can get to any vector or any point in the plane. So a scalar, multi a, scalar um, a linear combination of vectors. So I take 1, 0, that's the unit vector along the x-axis, and I multiply it by some value, say 3, that ends me up at 3, 0, and I add to that three times the unit vector on the on the y-axis, which is 0, 1, that gives me, say, I multiply that by 5, so that becomes 0, 5, and 0, 5 and 3, 0 leaves me at 3, 5, so I can get to the vector 3, 5. So I can get to anywhere with these two basis vectors, and what we say about them is they span the whole of R2. Those two vectors span because a linear combination of them can get to any vector in the plane. So if I use i, j, and k, so 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 as my three uh, standard basis vectors in R3, 
A linear combination of them can get to a vector anywhere in space, in three space, anywhere. Those three vectors span the space. Alternatively, we say they are a basis for that space. And it's because they are linearly independent. And when are vectors linearly independent? Well, we can test for that, and that's in a future notebook is that one cannot be written as a linear combination of the other. There's no way with a, with a vector i hat to get a linear combination of it. In other words, multiplying it by a scalar, adding another multiple of it to it, and another multiple of it. I can never get to one zero. There's just no way. I can never get away from the x-axis if I just have one zero. In other words, these two vectors are linearly independent of each other. And if they're linearly independent of each other, then they form this basis of, they are a basis of that space. And we'll review all of that because it becomes very important. This notebook is all about the intuition, though, that somehow that they that you can develop this idea in your head that they span a space because a linear combination of them can reach anywhere in that space. So three things you've learned here. First of all is the idea behind this uh, is, is vectors in Euclidean space. Then how to use a notebook to generate your notes so that they look very nice. And then how to just use Julia code to do all your, your work for you. So you might have to do it in pen and paper but you can just always just verify your work with a single line of code and having your notes as neat as this being able to visualize it and check your results with some code I think that's a very neat way of understanding your mathematics and doing your mathematics <laughs>